Chapter 13 Ethan The last day of October had arrived in a bluster of leaves and wind. The weather had cleared up enough that it was a warm day, perfect for Heimskanon. The smell of spice cookies and baked apple pies wafted through the air as me and my little group wandered the streets for the fall festival. Dolinska was full of the usual festivities. Children bobbed for apples and carved pumpkins against the noise of the joust and the polka music. Actors on stage performed a play depicting the seven gods, and acrobats ate fire while they balanced on high wires suspended between buildings. I didn't feel much like celebrating, and yet I knew I had to. This would probably be my last holiday. I wouldn't make it until Christmas. Emma held onto my arm, though I was more or less leaning against her as we wandered between the dancers and the ale booths. Multiple people glanced my way and whispered as we walked amongst the autumn festival, though they averted their eyes once I turned to glare. The papers were full of speculation that I had some kind of disease I was hiding from the world. No one had yet guessed demon possession. Every step I took felt like dragging iron bricks behind me. I could barely focus on Heimskinen with the pain radiating throughout my body, particularly at the part where the Lachane had bit off my leg. I wasn't even sure if I'd have the strength to stand vigil at my father's grave tomorrow for the Day of the Dead. I was nearly dead myself. But Emma kept holding on tight. Our friendship had improved slightly since the figure skating competition, and I was so proud of her. She was the most brilliant skater I knew. Her long program to our song had nearly brought me to tears. She was that moving when she performed. Her skating stirred emotion in me that I hadn't been sure was still there. I was certain she'd achieve gold when she skated at the European Championship next spring. I only wished I'd be around to see it. Instead, I'd be six feet under, as cold in the grave as the ice she danced upon. Everyone, save for me, was dressed for Heimskinen. I'd been too tired to slip on more than my day clothes and a jacket. Kiara and Delmare wore peasant dresses in yellow and black, with long sleeves that billowed outward. Alexei and Stefan had vests in similar colors, with the typical white shirts and black pants. Theo and Odette wore matching outfits for the second year in a row. Odette had sewn them herself. The orange and brown flowers embroidered on her white dress matched the ones on Theo's black vest, and he took her hand to twirl her in the streets as they walked. It seemed like they had made up, though I wasn't quite sure that was the case. I supposed they were getting along merely out of politeness, rather than actually solving what was between them. Emma wore the same white dress with red embroidered flowers that I'd bought her last year, her hair woven into a headband of white roses. She looked so beautiful. I kept her as close as was proper for friends, though not near anywhere as close as I desired. The festival doesn't seem as big this year, Emma commented as she looked around. Some of the stuff is missing. It was. The puppet shows and a few other competitions were gone. In their place were small cardboard shanty towns and people holding makeshift signs asking for help. We'd passed so many homeless people on our way into the festival, and it only seemed to get worse the farther in we went to the city. It was a big sign of how quickly my cousin's policies had changed things in Malovia. An old woman, probably in her nineties, sat near the corner in ragged clothes. She had a thin shawl around her shoulders that would do little to shield her from the cold. She drew off the shawl to wrap it around a little girl at her side, who couldn't be more than six. The girl held a cardboard sign that said, Please help us. My anger burned as I observed the old sorceress and her grandchild. This woman should be living in comfort at the end of her life, not struggling to survive. She was probably one of the old pensioners that lived off the elderly social programs Malovia had, until my cousin had cruelly taken them away. As far as I could tell, she was the young girl's only guardian. What would happen to the child once the old woman was gone? It didn't seem like Malovia cared. People ignored the old woman and the child as they stretched out their hands for any offering they could beg for. A few passerbys muttered curses or gave looks of disgust, like seeing their misery ruined their day. Emma let go of my arm. 
She reached into her pocket to place a few gold coins of Malovian currency into the outstretched fingers of the old woman, but a police officer from the Arcania Alliance stepped in front of her and slapped Emma's hand away. No handouts, he barked. Panhandling is illegal. How could you be so cruel, Emma asked. They need our help. These derelicts have been warned to stay out of the city, the officer spat, and he pulled a baton out of his belt. Now they must pay the price. The officer raised his baton to strike the old woman, who cringed away. Emma shouted, No! and stepped in front of her, throwing out her hand. A blast of magic erupted from her fingertips and spun outward. The officer ran head-on into one of Emma's shields. He was thrown backward, and his body slammed against a brick wall. He moaned in pain, snarling as he got to his feet. You little bitch, I'm gonna... I stepped in front of Emma. Excuse me, but you have dared to touch the hand of my mate. The officer looked me up and down, unimpressed. And why should I care? I am still the Prince Regent, and you will show her the proper respect. I could feel the wolf inside of me raise its hackles as I faced the officer. Alexei, Theo, and Stefan stepped beside me. Together, we provided an intimidating front. He must have figured it wasn't worth trying to take on all of us at once, so the policeman sneered. For now. He turned on the old woman and the little girl. Get out of here. If I see you around again, you'll really get it next time. The old woman and the child shuffled off. The girl cried as the old woman tugged at her hand to move along. Emma's expression burned. She went to say something, but I knew whatever was coming out of her mouth wouldn't be good, so I cut her off before we could get into more trouble. I'd like to see your badge. I will be speaking to your superior, I threatened. The officer's lip curled. Do what you wish. You have no power anymore. The policeman strode off. By now, the old woman and the little girl were gone. Emma was shaking, tears in her eyes. We should go after that bastard and teach him a real lesson. It's not going to help, I told her. This time, I was the one who laced my arm in hers. Come on, let's go. We moved on to try and find happier things, yet happiness did not appear to be found because we happened to run into Igor. He was prancing around in the parade in his alicorn form, a long wreath of autumn leaves around his neck. He was trying to show off to a group of women in the corner who were pointedly ignoring him. A child tried to climb on his back, but Igor bucked him off, and the child went tottering to the ground. He cried as he ran off. Gods, we all hated the guy. It was deplorable. Igor saw Odette coming and clearly panicked. He transformed back into a man and removed the wreath, tossing it to the ground and stepping out of the parade. I detest children, Igor said as we came near. His eyes roved on Odette before he glared at us. I thought you were going to spend the festival with me. Odette didn't take the bait. Why are you showing off for those girls? Odette asked, crossing her arms. The only shifters that participate in the parade are the single ones who want to find meats. And the last time I checked, you weren't single. You make me feel single, Igor accused. He wrinkled his nose at Odette's dress and Theo's vest. So now you're matching with him? That's cute. Theo's cheeks reddened. Alexei didn't use his empathy magic to calm him or anyone else. Kiara grabbed his arm, but he shook his head no. We match every year, Odette protested. It's tradition. This is ridiculous. You've replaced me with them. Igor pointed at the lot of us. I didn't miss that his finger was directed right at Theo. Odette made an angry sound. I'm so tired of you being jealous of my friends. It really needs to stop. You know what I'm tired of? Igor accused. You lying there like a fish whenever we have sex. If you acted like you enjoyed it, I wouldn't have to get attention somewhere else. Odette stomped her foot. Well, maybe the sex would be better if you actually did something to get me going instead of just putting it in and having your way. Guys, I said, embarrassed. They were being really loud, and people were starting to stare. Theo had clenched teeth, and his entire form bristled. He was going to transform any second. I went to interfere, but Emma held me back. She shook her head, mouthing, Theo needs to get angry. Is that why Alexei was holding back? To push these three past the breaking point? That seemed dangerous. But I'd trust Alexei. As a griffin, 
He knew what emotions were the right ones to have at any given moment, and maybe things needed to blow up before they'd get better. Igor rolled his eyes. You know what? You're too clingy, Odette. I can't be with a girl who has all these needs. Screw you, Odette cried. I'm tired of you. We're breaking up for good. Igor pushed Odette. It wasn't hard, but it was enough that she tripped and fell backward. She landed right in a mud puddle, splashing dirt all over her beautiful dress. Everyone gasped. Everyone but Theo, that is, because he had lost his mind. Theo erupted into his alicorn form and put his horn down. He pounded his hoof against the stone before he charged. Igor saw him coming. He changed into an alicorn, and his horn hit Theo's as the two collided. People scattered out of the way as squeals and brays erupted from the two stallions. Theo reared on his back legs, and Igor copied him. Their hooves lashed out violently as their heads sparred, horns clashing like two swords on the battlefield. Theo took his hoof and smashed it against Igor's nose. Igor fell back, surprised, and squealed as Theo dug his horn into Igor's shoulder, drawing blood. Theo didn't hold back with the first blow. He turned around and kicked Igor with his back legs, knocking him down and digging his horn into the alicorn's sides again and again. Igor scrambled to get back up and gave a cry of pain as Theo's teeth dug into his withers. His hooves slipped on the cobblestone and blood dripped down his flank as Igor tried to get away. Theo didn't let him up, only struck out with his horn violently. Odette sat in the mud puddle with an open mouth, watching the two alicorns duel in disbelief. He's gonna kill him, Emma gasped, grabbing me as Theo continued his relentless assault. I knew Theo would. If one thing was for certain, you didn't threaten a shifter's mate. It was the easiest way to get yourself killed, and Igor had majorly crossed that line. I felt a soothing, calm emotion lull over me, and I knew Alexei was working his magic. The empathy magic washed over Theo, and he held back, if just for a moment, though I could see him actively fighting against Alexei's powers. Igor took his chance and ran. People cheered and clapped as Igor darted off, thrilled to see such a good fight between shifters. There were always a few during Heimskinen. Theo stood, sides shuddering as he watched Igor gallop down the street. Once Igor had vanished into the crowd, Theo changed back into a man and turned to Odette immediately. My dress! Odette was sobbing buckets. She was so unhappy the pretty dress she'd worked on for weeks was ruined. Theo reached out to lift her out of the mud puddle and cradled her in his arms, dirt staining his vest. We'll get you a new one. Come on. Theo carried Odette off. They were gone in half the time it'd taken Igor to turn tail. Delmare looked amused, if not slightly worried. Should we follow them? Kiara shook her head. I think we should give those two a little private time. That was pretty intense. She just broke up with the guy she thought was the love of her life, Emma pointed out. Eh, she's with Theo. She'll be back to herself in a jiffy. I say we drink to the fact that the bastard is gone for good, Stefan suggested. Who wants ale? Alcohol sounded like a pretty damn good idea, so we made our way to one of the ale booths. As Stefan bought us around, I noticed Arthur, Vera, Ozzy, and Jasper at a table nearby, along with that rogue Finley. Ugh. Why did he have to be here? He wasted no time in sauntering up to our table. Emma unlooped herself from my arm as he came near, and he bent down. About time I saw you, lass. I was just about to start looking for you, Emma said, and Finley kissed her. The demon cackled in glee. My mouth soured, and my wolf went nuts. I suppressed the instinctual urge to pounce on Finley and rip his throat out, and decided to excuse myself from the situation before I started a fight of my own, and lost, on account of how weak I was. I'm going to take a walk, I grumbled as I got up from the table. Emma frowned, but at least she didn't say anything. That kiss had gotten me fired up enough I could get around the festival on my own. I shuffled around on pure testosterone as I did whatever I could to get myself as far away from Finley as possible. Curly-haired Scottish bastard. The Lachane was having a great old time, poking at old wounds. 
He brought up the sight of Emma kissing Finley again and again within my thoughts, and the rage that welled nearly choked me. I took a seat on a bench near a wine tasting and tried to breathe so I didn't go right back to the ale booth and punch Finley in the nose. Did you hear about Emmeline Sozna? What is it? Is there another rumor in the papers again? Even worse. I turned my head to see who was speaking behind me. There were a couple of girls from school that I'd seen around, but didn't know the names of. They had wine glasses in their hands and were sitting at a table a few feet back. I set my eyes forward so they wouldn't notice me, though I was keen to listen in. The one girl gushed as she said, you know she's been hanging around Finley Dunbar. It's all over the news. Yes? What of it? The other asked. The girl whispered. It hasn't hit the papers yet, but I heard that she's pregnant, and it's not the prince's baby. I felt the color drain from my face as my throat closed up. The world dropped out underneath me, paralyzing each muscle. I was so shocked I couldn't speak, but a whoosh of breath left my lips regardless. Inside, the Lachaine danced in joy, reveling in my shock. The other girl gasped dramatically. No! Yes, it's the only thing that makes sense, the girl insisted. She's always with Finley, and she skips a lot of class. She must be. Her and the prince have broken up, so it can't be his. You know, I did hear her throwing up in the bathroom the other day when I went to touch up my lipstick, the other amused. Maybe it was morning sickness and she acts so tired all the time. Exactly. She's totally pregnant. The other girl confirmed smugly, mind set on it. Explanations raced in my head. Emma had been sick on and off all semester, but that wasn't unusual for her disease. Her skipping class and having nausea could be side effects of her condition. Or a baby. Come to think of it, Emma's stomach did have a strange bump this morning. I leapt off the bench and nearly fell over. If I could have ran, I would have, but all I could do was hobble. I'm sure I was a comical sight, as I half limped back to the ale booth, but I wasn't laughing. For the love of Luca, it couldn't be true. Emma? Pregnant? With a child that wasn't mine? No god could be that cruel. But this was a cruel world, and as I was learning, it loved to play tricks on me. The ale booth came into sight, but Emma wasn't there. I nearly gagged as I saw she was missing amongst our friends. Shit. If she wasn't here to talk to, I'd have to find someone who'd fess up. I found Finley leaning against the wall of a building, talking to Arthur. He'd have to do. If I'd truly lost Emma for good, I was making sure the shifter who was taking care of her would do a damn good job of it. I wasted no time ignoring the burning in my muscles as I bunched my hands in Finley's shirt. Do you plan to make an honest woman out of Emma, or do I have to make you do the honorable thing, because I have no trouble doing this the hard way? Excuse me? Finley's eyes widened. Arthur looked between us, as if waiting for the moment he'd have to split us up. I've heard that she's pregnant with your child. I nearly puked on the words. I'm making sure you don't run off on her. Finley's expression was utterly clueless. Beside him, Arthur's face was also bewildered. That would be impossible, as I've never slept with Emma, Finley said slowly. So, if she's having a baby, I'm pretty sure it's yours. My cheeks burned as I admitted. I've never slept with her either. Looks like we both missed out, Finley laughed. She's playing the two of us. Shut up. I pushed Finley away and marched off. He made a motion to Arthur that indicated I was crazy. Finley could tell me they hadn't slept together, but that didn't mean he was telling the truth. The panic was still churning in my head. I stumbled back to my friends and knocked over Alexei's tankard on the way. He scowled and said, You're not drunk, but you're sure acting like it. Where's Emma? I growled. My hands tightened on the table as I clenched the edge to keep upright. Emma went home early, Dalmere said. She wasn't feeling well. Oh, gods, no. Was she vomiting again? Did the baby make her sick? We, we have to prepare, I began nonsensically rambling. There's more than enough money in the royal treasury to provide for them both, but I have to set up the funds, and you all must help me find a place to keep the baby safe. Who's having the baby? You? Stefan joked as he poked my stomach. This isn't funny, I snapped. It's an emergency. 
Emma needs our help. Kiara gave a frown. If Emma's pregnant, she didn't tell us. Why would she? That dog must have convinced her to keep quiet, I growled. Are you kidding me? Delmare slapped her forehead. She's not pregnant, you big moron. How do you know? I asked accusingly. You said she went home because she wasn't feeling well. Because she's on her period, Delmare hissed. She went home because her cramps are really bad. I stopped in place. Oh. Then irrationality overcame me. Worry. Impatience. Are you sure? Oh, gods, ask her yourself. Delmare rolled her eyes and drank deeper from her tankard. But her stomach is bigger, I nearly whimpered. I noticed this morning. She just did her infusion yesterday, Kiara said. The needle sites always swell up. Wow. I really was a big moron. I couldn't believe I hadn't put that together, or that I'd believed the nasty rumors that were circulating. I knew people made up shit about the royal family, and the people that were involved with them. Finley's relationship with Emma bothered me more than I wanted to admit. I heard a snicker, and a light beside me flashed. Stefan had been filming me freaking out the entire time. I went to snatch the phone away, but he sent off the video before I could delete it. And sent to Emma, <laughs> he sang. Your mate's gonna get a kick out of this. I hate you. My mood had soured worse than before. I'd never live this one down, I was sure. Why don't you go and talk to her? Kiara offered. I'm sure she'll find your concern charming. Right, now that I've made a jackass out of myself. But Kiara's idea was a good one. And I figured I might as well try to explain things before everyone got back to school tonight, and I humiliated myself even further. I went to the pharmacy to grab a few things, then took a carriage to the university. I knocked on Emma's dorm room door. She opened it, and I nearly considered turning back around once I met her glaring expression. By the gods, she was pissed. Really, Ethan? Really? I held up the bag, sheepish. Can I come in? She rolled her eyes and moved aside. I stepped into the dorm and set the bag down on her desk. Tigris was resting on a leaf, but he purred and flew to me. He sat on my shoulder, and I busied myself by petting him with one finger as Emma plopped down on her bed. She changed out of her dress and taken off her flower crown, slipping into sweatpants and a baggy sweater. I take it you've heard the new rumors? I asked weakly. Emma turned her phone around to me as an answer. I suppressed a groan. Stefan had indeed sent the embarrassing video of me. I continued to rant about her fake pregnancy on screen until she shut the video off. For your information, I've never slept with Finley nor anyone else, Emma snapped. He said something of a similar nature, I said regrettably. You asked him? Emma rubbed her face. Gods, Ethan, can't you mind your own business? Excuse me for being concerned, I shot back. Emma fumed. By the way, I'm on birth control, so if I just so happen to get pregnant, it's by some immaculate conception, not because I've been sleeping around. I didn't say you were sleeping around, I grumbled. I was panicking. It was nothing against you. She gave a moan. Well, you were being kind of cute. I'm glad you think my worry is adorable. She smirked. It was entertaining, to say the least. What's in the bag? I began placing things on the desk. I brought you pads, tampons, a heating pad, some pain reliever, chocolate, and a few snacks in case you needed anything. Emma's eyes widened as she observed the hoard, and Tigris purred in approval. Ethan, that's so sweet. But weren't you embarrassed to buy that stuff? Other guys would be. I'm not like other guys. Why would I be embarrassed? I'm taking care of my mate. Emma got up. She took two pills grabbed some chocolate and the heating pad before she plugged it in and laid on the bed. She set the heating pad on her lower stomach and started in on the chocolate. Tigris fluttered upward and landed on the corner of the four-poster bed. I went to sit down in the office chair, but Emma shook her head and patted the bed beside her. Our status as exes popped into my mind. This is hardly appropriate, I complained, but I laid down next to her anyway because I wanted to. I so wanted to, 
and nothing could stop me from doing it. I don't know what we are anymore, Emma said tiredly. Not like it matters. I couldn't agree more. Things were complicated between us. They always had been. How could you think I would sleep with Finlay without telling you? That's bullshit. She took a bite of the chocolate and handed it to me. I bit off a piece, chewed and swallowed. I thought we were done, I said honestly. We're not together. We are done, but we aren't, Emma sighed. We're still connected. I wouldn't have sex with someone else until... If... When I break our bond. And are you going to? I have to. There's no other choice. I felt sick. Then what are you waiting for? Emma didn't answer, and I knew why she lingered. Hope. Emma balled up the chocolate wrapper and threw it. It landed in her trash bin. Score, I said, and she smiled. I turned on my side to face her, and she did the same. These pregnancy rumors are proof that people are starting to notice my illness. I can't hide it forever. I need to come out with the truth. You don't have to do anything you're not comfortable with. Fuck everyone else. It's not like I'm ashamed of it. Emma breathed a sigh. But the Arcania world can be so cruel. The Fae are ruthless. If people found out I was sick, they'd use it against me. Then turn it into a weapon, I said. Use your disease against others instead of using it against yourself. There's no need to hide anymore. There shouldn't be a reason to hide in the first place, she growled as Tigris flew above us. He scattered pixie dust everywhere by the beating of his wings. I'm not ashamed of who or what I am. The pixie dust fell like glitter, coating Emma's eyelashes and hair with gold. The fey world can be cruel. It doesn't like people who are different. But change doesn't happen unless people like us start demanding it, I said. I brushed her leg lightly with my prosthetic. Emma softened. I don't care much if I'm not accepted, but I at least want to accept myself. What do you mean by that? It's clear to see my body is changing because of the medicine. It's making me gain weight. My body doesn't look like my own anymore, Emma said in frustration. And not just the medicine, but the disease as a whole. It's more difficult to breathe, and some days it's hard just to walk down the hall without getting winded. It's like I'm losing pieces of myself, bit by bit, and it's hard, because I'm not even old. I'm young. I'm not supposed to feel like this. It's killing me to be a grandma in a twenty-year-old's body. You shouldn't worry. All that matters is that you're alive. It was the most important piece of her to me, her survival. I wouldn't compromise it for anything, not even my own life. I am worried about it, Ethan. I've been an athlete my whole life, and now my body is doing things I can't understand or control. I used to have so much energy, I never used to get sick. Now a day doesn't pass by where I'm not tired or ill. She bit her lip nervously. I don't want the judges to notice. They expect a certain body type on the ice, and those that don't fit the perception get lower points. Don't go down the same path Odette did. Skating's not worth it. Emma couldn't get an eating disorder. With how sick she was already, something like that would surely kill her. I won't end up like Odette, but win or lose the podium, I still want to keep skating. I want to keep those experiences in my life, she said firmly. But this disease I have, it changes everything. It changes how much I sleep, how much I eat, how I feel, how tired I am. Hell, even what kind of mood I'm in. I hate that how much I can do alters on a day-to-day -day basis. It never stays consistent, and I'm left scrambling to try and keep up. Have you asked Stefan's mom for help? She was Emma's immunologist. Maybe she could fix this. I've talked to my doctor, and she says I'm doing everything I can. It doesn't matter what I do to stop it. I can't help it. My disease is turning my body into a vessel I don't know. I stare into the mirror some days, and I don't know who's looking back, because this body is one that I don't recognize. Emma's voice was so torn it nearly broke me. I don't care what you look like or what your body can or can't do. No matter what, you'll always be my Emma. I reached up and brushed her hair back. Emma blinked. I just wish something in my life remained consistent, even if it was just you and me. Everything changes, Ona Vilke. You're doing your best. That's all that counts. Emma nestled closer. 
Her head lay on my shoulder, and I wrapped my arms around her. We shouldn't be doing this. We weren't a couple, but we did anyway, because who knew what tomorrow would bring. Emma drifted off, and I let her sleep. She needed it, and I needed this moment, to hold her while I still had the chance. Today might be the last opportunity I got. A few hours passed, but they felt like mere moments to me. The daytime turned to sunset, and Emma finally stirred as a ray of orange crossed her face. She looked to me as if we were the only two people in the world. Then she pulled out of my arms, and my soul cried. Emma got up and began stretching. She didn't talk about the moment we'd had, just ignored it, as if it had never happened at all. I think I need to exercise. It might make the cramps a little better, she said. I smiled. I have the perfect plan, if you don't mind putting on a mask. What do you mean? I took what you said to heart, I told Emma as I got to my feet. If the phantom is sticking around, I might as well use him as a force for good. Emma tilted her head. Ethan Nowak, what are you planning? We'll wait until midnight. We're going to need the others. Emma let everyone know to meet up in her dorm after the clock struck twelve. I was worried Odette and Theo wouldn't show up, but they appeared right on time. Theo had a big smile on his face, and so did Odette, though her grin was far warier. She was wearing a brand new pink dress, one with a fluffy skirt that looked like a cloud. "'How are you doing, Odette?' Emma asked in concern. Emma's dorm was quite cramped with eight people standing inside, but we stepped apart to make more room as Odette and Theo entered. "'I'm fine,' Odette said. "'You were right, Em. Igor was nothing but a big jerk. I'm done with him for good this time.' Emma sighed in relief. Then Odette said, "'Anyway, what are we here for?' Everyone looked at me, and I said, "'I've been thinking. Vigilante work is great for beating up bad guys, but it doesn't really serve the people. I've been fighting the Black Claw for over a year, and all my work hasn't done anything to stop them. I've thought of a plan that will help the people of Malovia, but I need everyone's help to pull this off.' "'Ooh, yes!' Odette peeped. "'I've been waiting for this moment. Follow me!' Before I could finish, Odette ran out of the room. She scurried to her own dorm, and the rest of us crept after her. We squeezed into Odette's room, which was even more tight, with all the sewing and crafting supplies she had packed inside. "'Since I quit ballet, I've had a lot of time to work on these,' Odette gushed. "'Here we are.' Odette threw open her closet doors. My mouth dropped. Inside were six vigilante costumes. "'Whoa,' Delmare said as she withdrew a black cloak from the closet with a red hood and scarlet mask. These are really cool. Stefan fit a black dragon's mask on his face and slid a dark cloak that looked like scales over his shoulders. Alexei had a golden griffin's mask, which matched Kiara's glittering yellow cloak. Odette yanked two costumes out of her closet, which were various shades of purple. She handed Theo an alicorn mask before she fit a similar one over her eyes. What are these for? I asked Odette, eyes traveling between all the different masks. Odette put her hands on her hips. Well, if we're all going to be doing vigilante work, shouldn't we all have disguises? It would help to avoid the police. I guess you're right. Yay! Odette cheered. Team Phantom is a go! Team Phantom? I raised my eyebrow. If we're going to have a superhero crew, we need a superhero group name. Stefan said, I think Team Phantom sounds just right. Kiara shuffled through her purse before she handed me a vial of red liquid that I'd asked her to make a few days prior. I chugged it before tossing the empty glass. What's that? Emma asked curiously. It's a rejuvenation potion, I said. I'll be at my former strength for a few hours. Emma narrowed her eyes. Is there a catch? Yeah, I'll feel worse than death in the morning, I thought but didn't tell her that. Here's the plan. Lord Radcliffe likes his ale. I took him out for a few drinks the other night, and he nearly drank the whole keg by himself before he let it slip that my cousin has a secret treasury storage in the woods outside Dolinska. It's where he's been storing the taxes for his new army. I went looking and happened to find it. 
A place like that has to be crawling with guards, Stefan said. It is, but we can handle them, I said. I figure we break into that treasury and give the people back what Eli stole. What about Lord Radcliffe? Won't he know it's us? Emma asked. He won't remember, I said. I slipped a forgetfulness potion into his last drink before he went home. As long as we aren't spotted by the guards, the plan is foolproof. Gabby and Eli won't know we're the thieves. But they'll suspect. They know you're the Phantom, Emma said. Let them. They can't do anything about it. Not when we have the video of Gabby performing dark magic, I said. Emma hesitated, but Kiara said, This is a good plan. I know it can work. It has to. The people of Malovia deserve our help. I straightened up. All right, Team Phantom. Masks up. Everyone split into pairs and meet me at the tree line to the south of the university. We parted. Emma and I changed into our vigilante gear and ran across the rooftops of the university on our way to the woods. Most of the city was still at the festival, or at the sacred gathering, participating in Heimsken and ceremonies. Nobody was out walking the woods this late at night on a holiday. We rejoined the others at the tree line. My nose caught on to several strange smells, and I knew the sorceresses of our group had cast spells to disguise our scents and conceal our features. I could only tell who my friends were, because I knew they were them. Looking at them now, the illusions the sorceresses had cast were convincing enough I couldn't place features, not even those of my closest companions. I gestured for them to follow, and we walked silently amongst the trees toward the treasury. Odette kept a shield around us, just in case we ran into any monsters in the dark. Eventually, we saw lights and heard voices. A dozen or so guards stood around a newly constructed building at all entrances. All the shifter guards were in their animal forms, making a circle around the area. The sorceresses held torches for light, their sharp eyes peering outward for intruders. Damn, there were a lot of them. How do we get past the guards? Emma asked. Alexei and I will handle it, Kiara whispered. We'll use our empathy magic to start a fight amongst the guards. While they're bickering, you guys slip in and get as much coin as you can. Will that work? Stefan asked. Look at the guards. Tell me what's missing, Alexei said. We surveyed the area. I didn't realize it, not at first, until Theo hushed. They don't have any griffins. I double-checked before I realized Theo was right. The guards were all alicorns, wolves, or dragons. Not a griffin in sight. It must be Eli's policy, I said. He was always prejudiced against the griffin faction. Thought they were weak for having strong feelings. That poor judgment was going to bite him in the ass tonight. They have no other griffins to combat my powers, and my emotion magic is strong, Alexei said. I'll piss them off, all right. But don't take too long. Eventually they'll catch on. We can be quick, I said. You two stir up a ruckus by the front. We'll slip in the back door. Alexei nodded, and he and Kiara wandered off. We waited for a few minutes. A few curses rang out through the air, along with a couple of insults. Eventually, I heard the snarling of shifters as they began to battle, and the screams of sorceresses as they tried to break the fights up. Their torches lit the night, as all the guards went running to the front of the building, leaving the back door exposed. We took cover against the back wall. Delmare kept her battle magic ready, appearing as a lookout as I went for the window. This is very Robin Hood. Robbing the rich to feed the poor, Stefan commented. Yeah, well, someone's got to do it, because we know Eli doesn't give a shit. I peeked inside. All clear. Let's go. The door was locked, but Emma put her hand against the lock. With her illusion magic, she commanded it to melt away at her touch. The door dissolved into liquid goo, and we stepped over the puddle and into the treasury. Emma threw a few blue balls of her illusion magic into the air. They lit the room, giving us light. Wow! Delmere gasped. The treasury was packed. Boxes of Malovian currency, along with bags of gold coins, stuffed the room to the brim. There was hardly any room to walk. It was certainly more than we could take with us during one trip, but we'd have to make do. Take as much as you can carry, I said. We get what we can and leave. Let's just change. I can carry a million of these bags on my back if I've got saddlebags, Stefan hissed. 
We can't shift. If we do, it'll blow our cover. We're more identifiable as animals, I said. Stefan grumbled, but the rest nodded and began grabbing bags. I took three each in my hands. They were heavy, nearly twenty pounds, but that didn't stop me. The rejuvenation potion did what it was supposed to and bolstered what strength the demon had taken away. The Lachane lashed against my insides like a whip. He didn't like that I was using the phantom persona for good instead of revenge, but I ignored the pain, taking an extra bag just to piss him off. It wasn't a few minutes before there were cries of panic. An alarm went off in the treasury, and the lights came on. Shit, they knew we were here. We gotta go. I ran out the door. The rest followed me. By the sound of it, the shifters were still fighting, but the sorceresses had caught on that something wasn't right. We slipped into the woods before they caught us, vanishing into the darkness. The guards immediately entered the treasury, giving us time to get into the woods and make our escape. Branches cracked behind us. I bristled, thinking it was the guards, but as I turned back, I saw it was only Alexi and Kiara. They were breathless as they ran for their lives. Where do we go now? Stefan asked, his arms dragging as he tried to carry ten bags at once. Even with his shifter strength, the bags slowed him down. My lair. It's underneath the university. I took a sharp turn and the others followed. My heart pounded as we left the woods and entered the grounds of the university again. I took the familiar path back to my lair, though I hadn't used it in ages. We entered into the murky dungeon, and I used a match to light a torch on the wall for light. The only sound that could be heard was our ragged breathing as we all struggled to recover air, chests tight with the anticipation that we'd been followed. Minutes passed, and there was no pounding against the door. If we'd been followed, the guards would have caught up to us by now, which meant we escaped. Thank the gods. Do you think we got away? Theo asked nervously. I think so, I said. They would have found us. What about their shifter sight? Won't they be able to follow the trail? Odette asked. Alexei and I cast deception spells before we left, to throw them off. If they're powerful enough, they should hold. Kiara gasped. She wiped her brow of sweat and stood up slowly. Emma strolled around the room, eyes puzzled beneath the mask of the white rose. So this is where the phantom hides. It's exactly what I expected. I was slightly offended. What was that supposed to mean? You know, Ethan, you really need an interior decorator, Odette squeaked as she observed the room. The Batman look isn't doing it for me. Thanks for clarifying, Odette. It wasn't like I'd ever planned to bring people down here. The sound of coins clinking against each other rang off the walls. By the gods, there has to be thousands here, Stefan said as he shuffled through the bags. Yeah, and we need to get rid of it, Delmere said. That's evidence. It'll be gone by tonight, I said. Now we wait. Once the festival is over, we can distribute what we have. Everyone should be going home by now, Kiara offered. They'll want to be up early to sit vigil at the graves tomorrow. We waited a while longer, just to be safe, before we left campus. We kept to the dark parts of Dolinska and remained in the shadows on our way to our destination. The Arcania Alliance had obviously been alerted about the burglary. The police scanned the streets with spotlights, patrolling in droves. We avoided them by sticking to the city's outer limits. Shouldn't we just donate the money to a charity? Emma asked as we walked. All the Molovian charities are being funneled into the royalty treasury currently, I said. The corruption runs deep. There were no such things as homeless shelters or poorhouses anymore. Elijah had eradicated them all. As such, it didn't take long to find exactly what we were looking for. Underneath a bridge that went out of the city was a large shanty town, made of construction boxes and broken pieces of wood. Dozens of people were down here, taking shelter against the cold night by barrels that were burning newspapers and trash. They were covered in rags, the few possessions they had scattered amongst sleeping bags and tents that were far too frail against the upcoming Malovian winter. Eyes flashed against the night as we stepped into the firelight. I heard whispers. The Phantom! The Phantom! We split up two by two and began distributing coin where we could. Emma dropped a bag of coin at the feet of a sorceress, 
who was leaning against an alicorn with a hurt leg. She took the money with wonder and whispered thanks while the shifter bowed his head. I handed out a bag to an old man wearing an army uniform, a dragon veteran long forgotten by his faction. There were two wovens by the edge of the bridge. One was in his shifter form, the other in his human form. The man lay underneath the woven's wings for shelter, while the woven shook with cold. Both of them weren't much older than I. The woven's paws looked nearly frostbitten. They wouldn't survive another night out here, I was sure. I knelt by the man and gave him a bag of coin. Here, a hotel for the night and much more. Get out of this cold. Th th thank you, Phantom. The man tucked the coin back into his holy coat with blue fingers. No one's helped us in a long time. Why are you here? It wasn't my place to ask, but at the same time I wanted to know. We were kicked out of our home for being together, the woven replied. We are all that each other has left in the world. That was pitiful. Some aspects of fey culture I hated, and this was one of them. You have a little bit more now. Take that money and start over. We will. The man bowed his head in reverence, and I retreated from them. The eight of us distributed the coin as evenly as we could, but even with all the coin we had, it wasn't as much as we wanted to offer. There were just too many poor and desperate people. I felt disheartened as I reached the end of what I carried. This wasn't enough to save the thousands that were suffering under Eli's policies. The evidence was right here in front of my face. Eli didn't care how many he sacrificed, how many suffered, as long as he got his way. In my cousin's eyes, these people deserved to die. Emma read my mind. She reached out and placed a hand on my shoulder. At least we helped those we could, she whispered. Some of these people would have died out here if we hadn't come tonight. Her words rang true. Though I couldn't help but think of all those that would perish, because we couldn't save them all. I spotted the old woman and little girl that we'd seen earlier in the day. They were shivering against the cold, curled up against a barrel in an attempt to stay warm. I knelt beside them and offered the last of the bags. The old woman looked up, while the little girl shrank closer to her grandmother in fear. Take this money. Use it to get out of Malovia, I told her. It'll be safer somewhere else in Europe. We don't accept charity, sir, the old woman said, jutting her chin out. Even in poverty, the Fay were proud. This isn't charity. It's a gift, I said firmly as I pressed it into her hands. You are an elder of the Arcania. You have earned this. The old woman's chin quivered. God's bless you, Phantom, the old woman said, laying a hand on my arm. I only wish we had a king like you. I said nothing, only gave a grimace and rose up. As the rest of the homeless left the shanty towns, mostly to get hotel rooms or a warm meal, Emma came by my side. We did a good thing today, she said. It was worth the risk. I wanted to do some good before I died, I said. I hope what I've done has made a difference. Emma turned away then, probably because she didn't want me to see her cry. I knew I was at the close. I could feel my soul withering as the demon took over my body and knew I could fight no longer. This had been a final act by the Phantom, a way to show mercy, though I was certain the Lashane would give me none in the end. I'd made my peace. After tonight, I was finally ready to join the gods. Chapter 14 Emma Arcania University was quiet on the Day of the Dead. I woke up expecting the Arcania Alliance to be outside my door, just waiting to put me in handcuffs and haul me off to jail for stealing from the royal treasury. But that morning was like any other. I turned on the news, and the burglary hadn't even been announced, probably because the authorities wanted to keep it under wraps. It'd be no good for the king and queen's image if a couple of vigilantes stole coin right under the guards' noses. Gabby and Elijah knew it had to be us, or at least they had to suspect. But Ethan was right. It didn't matter if they knew, because with that video we had of Gabby performing dark magic, they couldn't touch us. I felt victory at the thought of having leverage over Gabby. What we've done wasn't enough to knock them off the throne, but at the very least, it was an insult. 
I could taunt her with the thoughts that we had dirt on her and she could do nothing about it. We'd hardly made a dent in the giant treasury. A few thousand dollars stolen out of what had to be millions. But it was enough to get those poor people off the streets. I planned to visit my father's grave and drop off some flowers. Some fae choose to make the favorite dishes of their lost loved ones on the day of the dead in order to draw their spirit near. Bakya had told me one of my father's favorite things was to eat kielbasa with mashed potatoes. I planned to make a small dish and take it to his grave, so his spirit could enjoy the energy emitted by the food. At least, that was the Malovian tradition, anyway. Whether it was true or not, I really just wanted to make a meal for my dad. Though it was hard. My brain was buzzing with brain fog as I got a box of instant potatoes down from the cupboard in the student kitchen off the rec room. It was here for people who wanted to cook something instead of going to the cafeteria and was stocked with a couple of groceries. I wanted to cook actual potatoes, but my fingers ached so badly I didn't think I could hold a vegetable peeler, so these would have to do. I stirred the potato flakes into a pot of boiling water with a plastic utensil. I knew I had to turn the burner off, but my eyes lulled and I wavered on the spot. My brain went blank. I didn't think of anything at all except how tired I felt. I was so exhausted. Emma? Dalmere's voice brought me out of it. It must have been minutes since I stirred the potatoes in, but it felt like mere seconds. My eyelids fluttered, and I yelped as I realized that I'd left the plastic utensil inside the pot and the burner on. The spoon had melted into the pot, mingling with the potatoes and the flame on the burner was so large now it was at risk of starting a fire. I was staring right at it, watching it melt and yet not making the connection with my brain. Delmer pushed me out of the way and rushed to shut the burner off. The whole room smelled like burning plastic and smoke. I coughed while Delmer hurried to open the window. What the hell, girl? Delmer asked. She looked at the pot in disbelief. Are you trying to burn down the school? I'm really out of it, I said. I hated how mystified my voice was. What were you doing? She asked. I wanted to make a meal for my dad's grave, I moaned. Instead, I made Barbie potatoes. Don't ask me for help. You know I can't cook, Delmer said with a laugh. Fuck no, she couldn't. I'd rather eat my melted plastic than any food Delmer put her hands on. She tried to make Stefan a romantic dinner a couple weeks ago. I told her it was a bad idea, seeing as how she'd messed up a grilled cheese sandwich for me last semester, but she was determined to make it work. Stefan really loved Elmer because he ate it. Poor guy had food poisoning for two days. I didn't trust Elmer to help make a meal even for the dead. It'd kill them twice over. I think I'll just stick with the flowers, I muttered. Thanks for putting out the fire. Dragons are used to fires getting out of hand. It's no big deal. Delmer waved her hand before her face turned to concern. Em, are you sure you're all right? I know you have trouble remembering things sometimes, but this is a lot, even for you. I just have a lot on my mind. I rubbed my eyes, trying to wake up. If you need help with stuff, you can just ask me, Delmer suggested. We're all here for you. I know. I bit my lip. All this stress makes it hard to focus. I was supposed to visit my grandmother's grave today, but I can stay with you if you need me, Delmer suggested. No, you should go, I told her. I'll be fine, really. My brother will be by in a bit. Delmer gave me a doubtful look, but I pushed her out of the kitchen and she left me alone. She knew there was no point in trying to convince my stubborn ass. After my failed attempt to cook a simple meal, I tried to wash the plastic out of the pot. It didn't do any good. It was really stuck in there. I abandoned the effort, tossed the pot away, and returned to the main part of the rec room, near the couches by the big TV. Arthur met me there. He was carrying a few candles, a wreath hanging on his arm. Babka and Bapa are waiting, Arthur said. We should hurry. I nodded, but my next words were cut off by a ragged bout of coughing. My heart sank. Ethan was leaning against the wall, a singular candle in his hands. He shuffled slowly toward the stairs, a longing misery on his face. 
The rejuvenation potion from the night before had taken everything out of him. He could barely walk. Arthur caught the look on my face. Go help him, he said. I'll pay a visit to our father. But I want to go with you. I hadn't sat vigil at my father's grave before, and I really wanted to do so with my brother this year. He needs you, Emma. Arthur gave a sad look to Ethan, and I knew I had no choice. I left my brother and hurried to catch Ethan before he slumped to the floor. Gods, he looked awful. Ethan, you need to be in bed, I insisted. I began dragging him back to his dorm, though he resisted weakly. I must sit vigil today, Ethan gasped. He has been gone a year. Tomorrow they will move my father's body to the crypt below the cathedral with the other kings. It is vitally important. I will sit vigil at your father's grave, I said. As your mate, the gods will accept me in your place. But Emma, you need to rest, Ethan. I will do what you cannot. Ethan's shoulders slumped. He knew he couldn't get to the cathedral. He wouldn't make it downstairs if he tried. He was asleep by the time I laid him down. A sickness welled up in me as I watched him slumber. We were counting the days now. This time next year, I'd be sitting vigil at Ethan's grave. I'd given up hope we'd find a way to save him, and now was just waiting for him to die. I wiped the tears from my eyes and took the candle he still held in one hand. Alone, I made my way to Dolinska and into the Cathedra da Dobojina. I covered my hair with a blue scarf before I entered the cathedral. It was packed today with people lighting candles in memory of their lost loved ones. Many people huddled in the pews, praying to the gods with their heads bent. The stone casket that held King Lycus was at the head of the room, colors from the stained glass windows dancing around the floor. The statue of him had already been moved, probably down to the crypts below the cathedral. I was praying Queen Antonia wouldn't be there. Thank the gods I didn't see her around. I ignited an incense stick, then lit the wick on the candle. I placed the candle on top of the stone casket and took a seat on the nearest bench. Every movement echoed in the massive building. I took out my leather journal from my purse. It was the same one I'd begun last year on the Day of the Dead. I'd been writing my emotions in it off and on since I bought it. I'd also been using it as a grimoire of sorts to try and make up my own unseelie spells, but mostly, the pages were full of my ruminations. I was still trying to work out my feelings about Ethan. I grabbed a pen and began to write. Hours passed and the pages filled. It was like I couldn't write fast enough. So many emotions poured out of me onto that page. The morning passed into the afternoon, and still, I hadn't gotten everything out. When evening came and twilight rippled across the cathedral, I stared at the casket of King Lycus. Help me, I whispered. Help me save your son. I didn't hear words. Instead, I felt a calm weight press on my shoulder, as if Lycus was saying he was there. He's in a really bad place. A tear fell down my cheek. I don't know what else I can do. I don't even know if it's my responsibility to rescue him anymore. It's out of my hands. The weight on my shoulder became firmer, then it drew away. I didn't know if Lycus had heard me, but I prayed he'd do something from the great hunting grounds to stop Ethan from succumbing to his terrible fate. This was Milana's cathedral. Her presence was all around me. I was her champion. The gods worked in mysterious ways. Wouldn't she help me? I don't think even the gods can do anything now, a soft voice in my heart whispered, and I nearly wept. Most people had left the cathedral by now, but I heard heavy footsteps behind me. I barely looked up as Finlay sat beside me. Hey, Emma. We stared at the casket instead of each other. He moved closer, but I felt the urge to pull away. Something had changed between Finlay and I. I still had feelings for him, but they were overshadowed by everything in my life. I thought that once Ethan was gone, I'd be free to love Finlay and move on. Now that Ethan's time was so near, I knew. My grief for him would ruin everything else. There'd be no moving on afterward. Finlay cleared his throat. Arthur told me I'd find you here. I think we need to talk about things. About what? My voice was hoarse. Finlay frowned. You're a beautiful girl. 
And I want you more than anything else in this world, lass. Almost as much as I wanted my mate. But... I had to look at him now. He almost winced. But... Finley sighed. I think your heart is still set on Ethan, and I don't want to get in the way of that. I think it's best for now if we cut things off until you make up your mind. Such a declaration should have devastated me, but it barely caused me to blink. Finlay was more or less breaking up with me, but I just didn't care. I nearly felt relieved. I never wanted to hurt you, Finn, I said honestly. I really do like you. You're a great guy. But I'm not the guy, he insisted, and I know that now. I swallowed. I don't know if Ethan's the right guy either. He's... he's very sick, I've noticed. Finley looked away. And yet something tells me that you still want to fight for him until the very end. I don't want you to think less of me, I hurried to say. I never wanted to use you. I don't think you did. There are no hard feelings between us. If I still had my mate, I knew what I'd choose, Finley said. You helped me move on from my loss, and I thank you for that. I'm glad I could do something for you, even if it wasn't what you wanted. You taught me that I could love again, he said, and though that's wonderful, I think you should give Ethan another chance. I'll be waiting if he's not the right man for you. Finlay stood. He grasped my hand and gave it a squeeze. I just want you to be happy, lass. I won't fight for what's not mine any longer. I want you to be happy too, Finn, I said. Someday you'll find a sorceress who really loves you. She'll be able to give you more than I ever could. Finlay gave a wistful smile. Well, we all wish for happy endings. Doesn't mean we'll get them. We will, I said desperately. We have to. Finlay let my hand drop. He walked away, and although I was sad when he left, I couldn't bring myself to feel anything more than solace that I'd made the right choice. Ethan was the only one for me. Alive or fallen, he'd still have my heart. It'd be just as dead as he was when he was gone. On Monday, I was having one of the worst flare-ups of my life. It was mostly due to stress. I didn't get any sleep and woke up with joint pain all over my body. My muscles were so twisted, tears beaded at the corner of my eyes and there was a tightness in my chest that made it difficult to breathe. It hurt to even move. My period was over, so I thought my cramps would go away, but they'd only seemed to move to other parts of my body. And yet, for as much pain as I was in, I couldn't sit here and allow myself to think of all the terrible things that were happening. Class would be a distraction. I needed to get up and start my day. I struggled through enchanting, then began the walk to Lord Lucian's classroom for Fay history after lunch. I'd forced down some chicken broth and a couple pieces of gluten-free toast. My stomach ached, but I did what I could to prevent myself from tossing it back up. Before I entered Lord Lucian's class, someone blocked my way. It was chastity. She towered over me as she swept back her long blonde hair, laying a hand on her hip. Oh, great. What did she want? Can you excuse me? I asked, trying to move past. I need to get to class. Chastity gave me a look that burned at the edges of my patience. I thought we should have a quick chat. Well, time's ticking. I was way less rude than I wanted to be. I just want to be clear. I've heard you're having a baby with someone else. I assume you're done with Ethan? She pursed her lips. Those stupid pregnancy rumors. They were really doing their damage. You heard wrong. I'm actually single right now. I'm not having a baby, and I haven't broken my mating bond with Ethan either. Chastity's gaze was abhorrent. Well, why not? You've been broken up for months, and to be honest, hanging on to him like this is cruel. You need to consider what's best for him and let someone else make him happy. Strangling her would be a good way to relieve all this stress, but I held back. After breaking up with Finlay and losing Ethan, I was not in the mood to deal with this bitch. Ethan's happiness isn't your concern. I went to move around her, but she put a hand on the wall, blocking my exit. Ethan has certain talents. Talents that you have no idea how to harness for power, Chastity snapped. He needs a girl that can steer him in the right direction. 
And what does that mean? I'm from a high-born family. I can navigate the tricks of the royal world. Look at you. You're a commoner. Worse, an immigrant. You have no idea how to fit into our society, let alone conspire in the intricacies of court. The press has made a mockery of you from the beginning. The nerve of her. Chastity was exactly like Queen Antonia, a controlling, abusive snake. No wonder the two got along so well. Chastity didn't love Ethan. All she wanted was to use him to bolster her status and income. She only cared about herself. You shouldn't bother yourself with my reputation. It's none of your business, I growled. I couldn't give two shits about a pathetic fay like you, Chastity replied. I only care that you're getting in the way of what I deserve. Ethan's not a prize to win, I seethed. And if you think I'm going to break the mating bond so you can move in... Chastity gave a laugh. You have no mating bond with Ethan. He chose you because he thought he could use you for the king's contest. The only reason he didn't pick me for the contest was he wanted to keep me safe. He thought you were going to die in the competition and that he could choose me for his queen once he won. She sniffed. Bad choice, because you obviously stayed alive and lost him the crown. This girl was delusional. Anyone could see that Ethan and I were bonded. It was clear as day. But still, her words got to me. I knew they weren't true, and yet my heart felt like they were. Maybe if Ethan was with chastity, she'd have found a way to save him from the demon by now. I wasn't polite this time. I shoved past her. Before I could get away, Chastity grabbed my arm. Her nails dug into my skin as she held on tight. If I can't have Ethan, no one's going to, Chastity hissed. Certainly not a scrappy little runt like you. My magic burst out of me. A shimmering blue shield expanded outward and blew Chastity backward. She hit to the wall and slid down it, her expression going wide with shock. I'd let Ethan die before I allowed you to sink your claws into him, I growled. Then I ran off, because if I stayed with Chastity a moment longer, I was certain my magic would have killed her. Death was better than being in the hands of that manipulative bitch. If I had to choose between the Lashane and Chastity, the Lashane would be it. At least the demon would end Ethan's suffering eventually. Chastity would never let him go. Lord Lucian stood at the entryway to his classroom, surrounded by a large group of students. Everyone, we will be taking a little field trip for today's class, he boomed. Follow me. Lucian walked ahead, and my class followed. I stayed at the back of the class because I didn't want to talk to anyone. I was feeling so down a simple greeting was too much to muster. Lucian led us off campus and into the woods that surrounded the university. I drew my winter cloak tightly around me to keep out the chill as the snow trailed down from the skies. A couple of people looked nervous, but Lucian said, Don't worry, the path was cleared of monsters this morning. We should have a peaceful walk on our way to our destination. Our path ended at a circular clearing in the woods. A group of wooden benches were there, placed in a circle around a roaring fire. I sat closest to Lucian and enjoyed the bonfire's heat as he began the lecture. You cannot learn fey history without understanding feykin, Lucian said. Some of you may have covered feykin in other classes. Today, we'll be meeting some of the more powerful feykin in our world, otherwise known as Los Piete, or Women of the Wood. Excited murmurs broke out, but Lucian said, Calm down. These Vakin are to be treated with the utmost respect. They are beautiful but dangerous, which is why I'm going to instruct you on what to do before we meet them. Lucien leaned closer to the fire. Vakin can be summoned with offerings. They love bread, milk, butter, and honey especially. Precious stones may be used to call upon them. Helena raised her hand. My mother used to leave offerings for Vakin on our windowsill, but the bread was always there the next morning. Did the Fakin never come? That is a very common misconception, Lucian said. When you leave offerings, you offer up the magical energy of the item to the Fakin. For example, if you were to leave bread out, 
the vacant would come and take the energetic sustenance of the bread. The bread would still be there, but any nutritional qualities would be gone, as well as any magical benefits. You could eat the whole loaf and still be hungry after. I'm certain the Fei came by and took your mother's offering, even if it didn't appear that the bread was touched. What other things are there to know about working with Fei Helena asked. There are a few things. Don't ever run from them. They will make you regret it. Fei love nature, and because of this, you must always respect the earth in their presence. Again, because if you don't, they will make you pay for it. How? Nikolai asked curiously. What kind of things will the Fakin do? Lucian gave him a grim look. They're quite mischievous. In groups, their magic is strong. One of their favorite ways to kill people is to bring them back to a Fakin party and make the poor victim dance themselves to death. Ugh, sounded gruesome. A couple of people paled, and Nikolai said, I thought they'd just rip you apart like a monster would. No. Fakin toy with their prey as entertainment. They will not kill you quickly. They will find creative ways to bring about your end, which is why it is very important you don't offend them. Lucian threw another log on the fire. Avoid the use of bells. Fakin can't stand them, and the sound will scare them off. Although Arcania can tolerate their ringing, our patience only goes so far. I'd always thought the ringing of bells was unbearably annoying. Around me, people nodded in agreement. You have to be very wary that the Feykin will not trick you, Lucian said. Fey can't really trick other Fey, but Feykin can trick us, because although they share our blood, they are not quite Arcania. They are wild beings, capable of using their magic for various purposes. They expect you to give something in return for a gift they offer. It is best. If they offer you something, to destroy the object, or politely refuse. I highly recommend you never take a gift from a Fakin, as they always come with strings or magical contracts attached. However, if you do accept the gift, don't thank them. They will believe you owe them something. Ethan had told me something similar last year. The fire danced within Lucian's eyes as he dropped his voice and said, But above all, you must never ever give a fake in your true name. What's a true name? Helena asked. All supernaturals have a true name, the name that is their soul, Lucian instructed. For centuries, Fae would attempt to find out the true name of other magical races. If we were given them or found out, we could use these true names to enslave the souls they were attached to, or even enslave their families for centuries under a Fae curse. Is there a way to discover what your true name is? Nikolai asked. To find out your true name, every supernatural must go through a very personal process of self-discovery, Lucian said. It is different for every race. They can achieve their true name by ascending through meditation to their chosen god or goddess, who will bestow upon you the name your soul is called by. Be very careful who you tell your true name to, as it can be used against you. When working with Fakin, it is best to use a fake name. Lucian stood. We will now summon the lost Vietti by leaving offerings. Everyone keep silent until they have made their appearance. Lucian rummaged through his bag. He placed bread, honey, and butter at the edge of the tree line. Nothing happened at first. Minutes passed, and whispers broke out amongst the class as we waited for the Fakin to appear. Then spectral figures began to float out of the woodland. They were beautiful creatures. Gossamer women made of the elements, autumn leaves, rocks, branches, wind, and water. They hovered around the area and did a twirling dance, making crooning noises that sounded like the songs of sirens. Students observed them in interest as the Fakin spun around us, stunning everyone with their gorgeous appearance. An airy woman made of ice and snow floated to me, her dress coated with icicles, her hair rippling in the wind like frost across a windowpane. Her pitch-black eyes glittered as she set her gaze on mine. She extended her cold fingers out to me. Her voice chilled me like the winter wind as she asked, And what is your name? I knew better than that. 
By opening her palm, she was literally asking me to hand over my name. I didn't know my true name yet, but I didn't think my earthly one would be good to give out either, so I said, You can call me Jane. Jane, she purred. I believe this is yours, Jane. She placed a small, smooth stone on the bench beside me. She was still trying to trick me. It was a simple stone, but putting it in my pocket would mean giving her authority over me. I appreciate your kindness, I said, taking care not to use the words thank you. The fakin stared, then floated away. Once she was gone, I knelt to the ground and did my best to bury the rock in the frozen ground. No way was I taking that shit back to my dorm. I didn't want me and my descendants trapped by some century-long bargain. A fakin rose out of the flames, floating to Lucian with her head held high. She was composed completely of flame, her dress made of embers and ash. Lucian bowed to her, and the fakin inclined her head. One of the fakin, a woman made of autumn leaves, took a flute out of her dress and began playing a cheerful tune. The Los Pietti gathered together and began dancing in a circle, their hovering feet stomping in time with the beat. Nikolai moved forward, transfixed by the water fakin and her allure, but Lucian grabbed his arm. Don't join them, Lucian said harshly. They'll never let you out of their circle. Only observe. Nikolai stepped back. As the fakin danced, the snow around the area began to dance with them, whipping up the area in a glamorous snowstorm. I watched their dance, appreciating how similar to ice dancing the snow's fakin movements were. A few of them sang louder, and chills ran up and down my arms at their otherworldly voices. Creatures like this didn't belong on Earth. They belonged in Edenmire. It became even more important to me to open up the portal again, so these souls could go back to a land where they would flourish. They weren't like Tigris. They were different, and needed to live away from Earth. We studied the Fakin for an hour more, until the Fakin decided it was time for them to go and they floated back into the forest. Chatter broke out amongst the group at how exciting it had all been. There will be a paper due on your experience with the Fae King next week, Lucian announced as the students dispersed. Full points will be given if you do your best. Lucian noticed me sitting on a bench near the now smoldering fire. I'd cut myself off and remained isolated from the rest of the class throughout most of our visit. Though the Fae Kin had been wonderful, I didn't feel much like appreciating their charm. Lucian sat beside me. Something's on your mind, Emma. You've been very quiet in my classes as of late. It's not like you. I've got a lot to think about. I appreciated Lucian's concern, but I didn't feel like talking right now. I didn't feel like doing much of anything but sitting here and allowing myself to freeze. I suppose it's about the prince, Lucian began. The demon has nearly taken him over. My head whipped to the side. How did you? I am an experienced sorcerer. I saw the signs, though I'm sorry to say I didn't notice them soon enough to do anything about it, Lucian sighed. It is out of the realm of power now. I curled my legs up on the bench and sat my chin on my knees. I don't know what to do. I'm so scared. The fame magic doesn't manifest when there's fear, Lucian reminded me. You must let go of your fear, Emma. It doesn't serve you. No fate, no matter how dire, is worse than being a victim of terror. But I can't save him. I've tried. I believe that is a common misconception with demons. Our mates are thought to be the ones who save us. In reality, you can do nothing, Emma. Aeson is the only one who can save himself. So you think there's still a chance? I lifted my gaze in hope. I'm not concerned about the prince. My worries are for you. Lucian said. You have a very important destiny, and not even love can get in the way of that. There it was. He was talking about me being the world weaver. He had to be. In a roundabout way, he was telling me he knew. I didn't even care that he knew my secret. What did it matter anyway? I don't care about my destiny. I just want to be happy. I breathed a sigh and a small cloud of condensation rose from my lips into the clouds. Being happy is an illusion. 
Our emotions are determined by the choices we make, which influence our magic, Lucian said. Ethan can survive this demon, but he has to do it on his own, of his own free will. And you have to be willing to separate yourself from him if he chooses the wrong path. But how can I live without him? He's my mate. I lost my mate long ago. It is not a fate I wish on anyone, though my life is far from purposeless. I have gathered some semblance of happiness over the years. You are strong enough to do the same. I'm afraid I need him. I didn't know if the words were true or not. They didn't seem true, but they felt like it. Don't choose someone because you need them, Emma. Choose them because you want them, Luthien said. The only thing we need is the will to keep moving forward. Whatever happens to Ethan, you will survive. Love is a choice, and it does you no good to choose love if it destroys you inside. Mates can come and go, but our belief in ourselves, in our decisions, will follow us forever. You have to live with what you've done for the rest of your life, and therefore must be able to endure any mistakes you may make. Before you choose a mate, choose yourself. Lucian's words made everything click. I didn't need to choose between Finlay or Ethan. Choose whether I wanted Ethan in my life or not. I had to choose myself. Because in the end, I was the only person I had to live with forever. I stood. Thanks, Lord Lucian. That was just what I needed to hear. I am always here if you need to talk, Lucian said kindly. My door remains open for you. Lucian's words followed me all the way back to the dormitories. My shoulders felt lighter. Nothing seemed as dark as it had a few moments ago. The door to Odette's dorm was slightly open. I heard her crying. Odette? I put a hand on the door and pushed. Odette was sprawled out on her bed, bawling her eyes out. Odette looked up. Her mascara was running down her face in streaks as she said, Oh, Emma, it's simply awful. What? I couldn't imagine what had happened now. It's Theo and I, Odette blubbered. After he got in that fight with Igor, we made out in the alleyway. The alleyway? Yes, for five whole minutes. I resisted rolling my eyes and sat on the bed to rub her back. It's not all bad. Yes, it is, Odette wailed. I'm going to lose Theo forever. She sank her face into a pillow. Why would you think that? I forced her to sit up. Odette grabbed a tissue from her desk and blew into it, her nose sounding like a trumpet. You don't get it. My family totally abandoned me. My mom doesn't talk to me anymore, and my dad's not around to notice the difference. Theo and his family are the only people who care about me. Her lip wavered. And, and now things are complicated. Theo likes me, and I don't really know if I like him, and if we get together, everything will be ruined. She slapped a hand to her forehead and fell backward onto her cushions. I'm sure it's not that way. I didn't want to laugh, but at the same time, Odette was being a bit over the top. I didn't know who was the bigger drama queen, her or Ethan. Ethan. It was always Ethan. Odette shook her head furiously. Theo and I are besties. We've been close since we were toddlers, basically. He's the one person who's always been there, no matter what. Let's say we start dating, and then we break up. We won't be able to be friends, then I'll lose him and his family forever, and I'll be all alone. I can't lose him, Emma. Odette broke into a fresh bout of tears. Theo had said something similar during the King's Ball, but in my opinion... The two of them were being ridiculous. You're acting out of a place of fear instead of a place of love, I said kindly. I wiped a few of her tears away. You two are so afraid you're going to lose each other that you're not even willing to try. Odette stared up at the canopy of her bed, clearly confused. I don't know if love is worth putting what we have at risk. Theo never treated me differently because I'm autistic, and I don't want to lose that. You won't, I said. And if you do, there will be other people there who will accept you as you are. Do you think so? She fiddled with her glasses. I just want to be myself, without having to worry about what others will think. And why couldn't you? I mirror people a lot, Odette confessed. 
It's really hard for me to read social cues, so instead of being myself, I just try to copy what everyone else is doing so I can fit in. It got really bad when I was in high school. For the longest time, I just pretended to be other people so I could be accepted, instead of trying to be me. Theo pulled me out of that. He wants to pull out something else, too, I joked. Odette blinked. Do you really mean that? I facepalmed. Sarcasm, Odette. Oh, yeah, I don't get that. I take everything at face value, she giggled. Something I'd clearly realized within the first 24 hours of knowing her. It's just so hard for me to talk to people, Odette went on. I know I can be myself with you and with our friends, but anywhere else it is so difficult to speak up. I can mimic what other people can do, but it's hard to convey what's really on my mind. Being autistic, I can't decipher body language or nonverbal cues. Facial expressions are strange to me. I have to guess what everyone's thinking. It's like everyone else is speaking a language I don't know, and I have to make the rules up as I go because I can't pick up on the clues everyone else can. She sighed. Being a kid was really hard. People thought I was too blunt, just blurting out whatever came to my head most of the time. That's not always a bad thing, I said. I appreciated that quality in Odette. Too many people in this world wanted to pussyfoot around and it drove me mad. Because we think in the same way. I didn't really have any friends that were girls until you, Odette said. Women are always really hard for me to read, harder than men. Theo was my only friend until I came to Arcania University. I was bullied really badly in the Russian company. I just couldn't figure out what the other dancers wanted out of me. You got attached to me fairly quickly. It's because you're so straightforward, Odette said. Others say you're too brash and blunt, but I like that because it lays out for me what's expected. I don't have to guess with you. To be honest, I can't stand people who beat around the bush. I beamed. Odette, you are seriously the sweetest. Well, thank you. She batted her eyelashes before she frowned. My perfectionism is probably the hardest part. I know it gets out of hand. I just had to be the perfect dancer for Romeo and Juliet. I was starving, and I didn't care. Nothing mattered to me more than being the best. But it was killing you, I insisted. I couldn't see that, or didn't want to. Ballet was so amazing because I could control everything. The music was never too loud. The classes were small, so stimulation was just right. I could dim the lights, block out the rest of the world. It felt like a break from being me. Her lips quivered. Now all that's gone away, and in the end, all I really have left from that is Theo. I've told you before you don't have to give up ballet. Just alter your perception of it, I offered. Odette wasn't listening. She continued to rant. Theo and I can't be together. What if it's awkward? What if- Oh gods, the sex is awful. I can't take screwing another man who has a super tiny dick. I had bigger balls than Igor by a long shot. Odette tilted her head. Do you think Theo has a big dick? I try to look when he walks by, but I can't tell. Oh, what am I saying? She covered her face with her hands. See how this is messing things up already? That your wondering proves you want to find out, I laughed. But I have to say, worrying about sex is the least of your problems. You're right. The gears in Odette's head worked. Theo is certain you have a mating bond. If you do, you guys are meant to be. Why wouldn't you take a chance? But what about you and Ethan? Odette stuck out her lip. You two have a mating bond, but it couldn't keep you together. I sighed. Ethan and I are very complicated. Theo might be running around in a mask with the rest of us, but he doesn't have a vigilante complex. Or a death wish, Odette added unhelpfully. I scowled, and Odette said, Sorry, too much? Just a lot. I dragged Odette upward for the second time. I'm just saying, you don't have to make a decision now, but the more you push Theo away, the more intense your feelings are going to get. And the hornier I'm going to get, she said triumphantly. He was doing reps at the bar in the studio the other day, and girl, those biceps... It was already starting. The spark in Odette's eyes faded away as she said, 
Speaking of Ethan, Emma, I think it's time. We're too late to save him. And if the demon takes over before you break your bond, he'll kill you. It could happen any moment now. You need to break the bond tonight and save yourself. The knot in my throat hardened. Do you think I'm out of time? Yes. My visions are clear. If Ethan survives, you won't, Odette said firmly. The world needs you. I need you. You have to do what's best for yourself. Ethan would want it that way. My eyes burned with tears, but I held them back. You're right, Odette. I can't avoid it any longer. I rose off the bed. Let's find Delmare and Kiara. I'm going to need them. We located Delmare pretty quickly in the art studio, though we searched campus high and low for Kiara, and she was nowhere to be found. The anxiety in my stomach twisted as we waited for her to show up in the rec room, but she never appeared. We held off until the eleventh hour, because that was the time the ritual had to be performed. The three of us met up again outside the alchemy classroom. Kiara hadn't shown. Where's Kiara? I asked. Sorry, Emma. We couldn't find her, Delmare said. I needed my friends to support me through this ceremony, but I had run out of time. I couldn't wait any longer for Kiara to show up. Okay, let's do this. We entered the alchemy lab. I'd already started preparing the room. I'd pushed desks and chairs to the side to make an open space beside the counters used for brewing potions. In the middle of the room was a large wooden tub. I'd filled it with hot water, as well as a gallon of milk. I grabbed a jar my mother had given me and began sprinkling the contents. Himalayan sea salt, eucalyptus leaves, chamomile daisies, and fresh white rose petals. Red candles were placed around the tub in a circle. Scattered beside them were ashes, what was left of journal pages. I'd torn out every page in my journal where I'd written my feelings about Ethan and burned them this afternoon. I'd added more to the fire, pages I'd written today on every emotion and regret. This was a crucial part. Everything had to be laid out on paper and released through fire to the gods before the ritual could continue. Delmer and Odette began lighting the candles in a counterclockwise circle while I stripped for the tub. I got in. The milk washed over my skin, and I smelled the oils in the tub as I sank down to my shoulders. Delmer and Odette knelt by the edge of the circle and waited. I had to forget about Ethan and focus on casting the spell for myself. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. I closed my eyes and began reciting the incantation. As a child of the goddess, I am worthy. I accept that I am whole just as I am. I accept I need no mate to fulfill my purpose. I accept that I love myself and that I will cherish myself in a way no mate ever could. I am strong, beautiful, wise, and brave. I am all I will ever need. I love my mind, body, and spirit just as it is. I am enough in every way. I ask the goddess to cast away my pain and bring about a better change in my life. I could see the firelight burning through my eyelids. I kept my eyes shut and imagined Ethan and I's bond. It was a thick cord connecting him to me, unbreakable in every way but one. Even though he was far away, I could still feel him at the end of our connection. I swallowed and said, Tomir, king of the gods, use your sword to cut my bonds that my mate and I share and sever any ties we may have, negative or otherwise. In my mind's eye, I saw a golden sword appear. It came slicing through the air and cut in half the cord that tied Ethan and I together. The two edges of the bond fell away from each other, falling like frayed ropes. The cord by Tomir was cut, but it would reform if I didn't finish the ceremony. Radek, Red Stag of War, give me the honesty to admit when my bond has met defeat. Vesna, Doe of Wisdom, give me the knowledge to know that I will love again, better and deeper than before. Neva, Spectre Doe of the Shadow, Heal my heart with the passage of the days to come, as time heals all wounds. 
Asking Luca for help was hard, as he was Ethan's chosen god. Tears ran down my face at his name. L Luca, ghost stag of chaos, help me to steal back my life and take what was always mine to give. My mouth filled with bitterness at the thought of Droga. Even if he was my enemy, he was still one of the seven gods, and I had to have his aid in the ceremony. Droga, black stag of wrath, allow me to feel suffering, as it is only by experiencing pain that better days are to come. Odette and Delmer were crying now. I could hear their sniffles as they echoed throughout the empty classroom. Gods, this was the hardest thing I'd ever done. But I knew I'd feel relieved once it was over. I'd finally be free. I had to ask Melana to do the final work and end the bond for good. As my chosen goddess, she was the only one that could. This would be the last part. Once Melana ended my bond, I'd take the ashes of the journal pages and scatter them into the river, letting our bond drift away as if it had never been. I still didn't know if I could do this, and yet I was strong. I wasn't performing the ceremony because I had no other choice. I was doing this because my relationship was dead, and moving on was the best thing I could do for myself. It was painful, but I had to love myself more than I loved Ethan. And if I was being truly honest, deep down, I just couldn't do this anymore. Ethan wasn't my knight in shining armor. He wasn't riding in on his white horse to save me, and he wasn't going to whisk me off into the sunset for a happily ever after. That Ethan was gone forever, and I had to accept it. Goddess, I whispered, my voice like a breath on the wind. There was a whispering noise and I opened my eyes as Milana appeared at my summoning. She stood before the bath in her human form, hair twisted into her antlers as she blinked at me with those beautiful doe eyes. Odette and Dalmer kept their heads bowed, staring at the floor. My lip trembled. Goddess, is this the right decision? Milana gave me a motherly stare, and she reached out to stroke my red hair. There is no path, champion. You will make many choices on the journey of your life. They will all lead you to your destiny. Whatever road you take will deliver you to where you're meant to be. Her words brought me comfort. I knew I'd be okay. I'd always have my goddess. Milana would never leave my side, no matter what kind of sorrow came my way. I opened my mouth to invoke her blessing and end the bond for good. But before the first letter left my lips, the door to the alchemy lab burst open. Milana vanished at the sound, and all the candles in the room went out. It was Stefan and Alexei. Both of them were heaving for air, as if they'd run through the whole university. They leaned over their knees to catch their breath. Both of their eyes went wide as they saw the remnants of the ceremony and realized what I'd been doing. Guys, what are you doing? You're interrupting! Odette squeaked. Emma, you need to come now if you want to say goodbye, Stefan said. Ethan's on his deathbed. I felt the blood drain from my cheeks. Where is he? He's in the woods. He crawled off by himself, Alexei explained. I didn't care that I was naked in front of the boys. I jumped out of the tub and got my clothes back on, still sopping wet. In the hallway, both Alexei and Stefan changed into their shifter forms. I leapt on Alexei's back and held on to his feathers as he charged ahead, while Dalmer and Odette clung to Stefan. They ran us into the forest. The university fell into darkness behind us as trees loomed from every shadow. My eyes searched the woods, looking for Ethan. He was lying face down in the snow. I jumped off Alexei while he was still running and fell to the ground. Theo was kneeling beside Ethan and gave me a helpless look. I turned Ethan onto his back and brought him into my lap. His lips and skin were blue from the cold. The dark veins had broken across his face, and there was a distance in his eyes that caused terror to flood my entire body. I felt his life force waver at the end of our bond. He had seconds left. It's time, Emma. He rasped, the death rattle in his throat even more pronounced. 
let me go. Ethan? The tears were dripping down my nose and onto his cheeks. This couldn't be real. I didn't want to let him go. I couldn't. I love you, Onawilka. Ethan's last gasp came. His eyes rolled back and his eyelids shut. Numbness invaded my senses until I had to face the bitter, inevitable truth. I gave a cry of grief that shattered the great hunting grounds and the underworld below. I had dreaded the day this moment would come, but I never accepted it. Ethan was gone, and there was nothing I could do to bring him back. I'd failed him. The world crumbled around me, and my life ceased to matter. I threw myself on Ethan's chest and sobbed, wishing I could have gone with him. The pain, it was unbearable. The whole thing. I would have preferred to be cut apart inch by inch than to experience this agony. Everything in my universe dissolved and blew away, ashes on the wind. There was no light anymore. I'd never smile again. The change was instantaneous. I wouldn't have had time to notice if Theo hadn't yanked me back. Ethan's eyes shot open, glowing red. I gave a scream, and Theo pulled me several feet away. We scrambled against a tree trunk as the demon used Ethan's body to pull himself upright, moving his limbs like a dying spider. The Lachane smiled. He's not coming back this time. The Lachane rasped. Mine for good. You bastard! I leapt to my feet. I shot off spell after spell, directing all my rage at this monster that had stolen the love of my life. The Lachane laughed and darted away from each one. My spells hit trees and exploded them apart, and the broken tops fell into the woods. I'm going to enjoy killing you all. The Lachane cackled. My friend's mouths dropped open in horror as the Lachane beckoned the power of the woods to his bidding. It grew even darker as he called the energy to his command. He directed his magic at a tree, and the oak began moving, pulling its roots out of the ground to use as its feet, the tree swinging its branches like arms as my friend screamed and ran for cover. Although my friends were scared, I felt nothing but pure hatred for this monster, unadulterated revenge. I couldn't let Ethan's soul be in torment. He was trapped inside his own body, a slave to the Lachane's will. As Ethan's mate, I had to put him out of his misery. The Lachane was too busy controlling the tree to see me coming. His back was turned to me as he laughed, maneuvering the oak after my friends with malice in his eyes. I ran up from behind, fueled by despair, and raised my hand to deliver a final killing spell to the Lachane's neck. Stop! Kiara's voice rang out. She approached, one hand flung outward, a crumpled letter in the other. I moved out of her way. From Kiara's fingers burst a jet of yellow magic. It wrapped around the demon, binding his legs and arms together. He struggled, and the yellow magic strained to keep him contained. The oak tree stopped moving. It fell to the ground, frozen without the help of the Lachane's forest magic to move it. Delmer, Odette, and I all reacted without having to be told. We threw out our own binding spells, cords of red, pink, and blue. They circled around the demon and merged with the yellow spell, holding him tight. As the cords faded from sight, the demon struggled. The binding spell held. Together, the four of us could keep the Lachane contained, but not for long. Kiara panted for breath. Alexei spun on her. Where have you been? We've been worried sick about you. Kiara drew up and waved the letter in the air. There's a way, she breathed. We can still save Ethan. What are you talking about? He's already gone. Theo's voice was full of sorrow. The faces of the other companions mirrored his. They thought this was all over. Not yet, Kiara snapped. I know someone who can exorcise the demon, even if it's already taken over. I've spent months tracking her down, and I've finally found her. Who is she? Stefan demanded. Kiara hesitated. 
she's a witch. The Lachaine's eyes contracted, and he struggled even more violently against the bonds, though they didn't break. Stefan's face turned red. No. No. No damn witches. It's the only chance we have. The pool of memory told us fey magic wouldn't be enough to exorcise the demon. We have to look to other supernaturals. Do you want to save Ethan or not? Kiara snapped. We can't fuck with the Miriamic coven. Do you want to get us all killed? Stefan hissed. They hate Fay, Odette added. We'd be asking for trouble if we went there. Look at him! Kiara flung a hand toward the Lachaine. Do you want Ethan to suffer like this? Stefan winced. Delmer went to defend him. We don't know if Ethan would have wanted this. If we go to the Miriamic coven, we're putting all of us at risk. Emma is Ethan's mate. This is her choice, Kiara screamed. God, can't you all put your prejudices aside to save Ethan's life? Everyone's expression was conflicted. This was a risk. Ethan might have a chance, but the one maybe we had to save him could just as well kill us all. I didn't know anything about witches, but from what I'd been told at Arcania University, they wouldn't hesitate to murder a fae on sight. So why did this witch want to help us? Tell me more about the witch, I said quickly. The Lachaine gave a groan, but I kicked him in the face, hard. His head slumped to the side, and he stilled. Her name is Hattie. She's good friends with my mother. They've worked on spells together, Kiara said. She's wise and has knowledge. I sent her a letter asking if anything can be done, and she told me to come immediately. We must leave now. The other still seemed hesitant, but I didn't care. Which warlock or a fucking llama, if Hattie had the ability to save Ethan, I was bringing him to her. Where is she? I asked. In America, Kiara said. Emma, can you make a portal that'll get us to Connecticut tonight? That's across the Atlantic Ocean. She could kill herself, Stefan argued. She took all of us to Edenmire and back. If Emma can transport us to a new dimension, across the world should be nothing, Kiara shot at him. I can do it. I could do anything if it saved Ethan. I need to know the exact location. Octavia Falls. Kiara shakily handed me a postcard that was attached to the letter. I looked down. On the postcard was a photograph of a small gothic town, the building surrounded by maple trees. A sign advertising apple cider and a ghost tour was beside a stack of hay bales. A jack-o'-lantern stared back at me with a huge grin. A photograph was all I needed. I took a deep breath and closed my eyes, summoning the portal to my aid. It manifested immediately, spinning out before us and creating a window to the other side. An orange autumn forest spanned below me, sunset spreading across the sky. It looked to be about 5 p.m. there, twilight. I hope you guys are right about this, Stefan mumbled. He'd grabbed the Lachaine and threw him over one shoulder to carry him through the portal. We have to be. I wasted no time and stepped on through the portal toward our one salvation. The only hope we had to save Ethan was to trust a witch. Either we'd find Hattie and come back with him alive or the coven would realize we were there, and none of us would come back at all. Chapter 15 Ethan I was floating outside of myself. My spirit was still attached to my body, but I couldn't take back control. I was no longer present within my own mind. The demon had won. All I had the power to do now was watch as my friends carried my body through the portal into another country, where Kiara claimed there might be a witch that could bring me back. I wanted my friends to give up. For them to travel to the Miriamic Coven would put them in great danger, and I wasn't worth their lives. But I had no say in the matter. So I observed them from above like a ghost as my friends stepped out of the portal and into the twilight forest. Emma, are you all right? Alexei knelt beside Emma, who was kneeling on the ground. He put a hand on her shoulder as she recovered her breath. I'm fine. Transporting you guys across the world is harder than Edenmire, Emma said. I think I draw power from there. When I'm traveling across borders, I'm just relying on myself. 
Take a moment to breathe. We have to figure out where we are. Kiara turned in place. The woods all looked the same. Every tree was identical to the other. Had Emma even gotten close to Octavia Falls? Theo snapped his fingers twice and grimaced. My magic doesn't work here. Stefan flung a hand out to cast a spell and nothing happened. Mine either. Bastard warlocks must have thrown up a war to take away our powers, too. I can't shift or anything. Emma rose to her feet and experimented. A few blue sparks flickered from her fingertips. My powers still work, but they're weak. It must be because you're the world weaver, Kiara suggested. Our magic might get stronger the farther we get from Octavia Falls. But we have to go into it, Delmare argued. So if we get caught, we can't rely on our magic to save us. Kiara turned in place before she began walking to the north. This way. The group followed. Stefan and Alexei dragged the demon behind them by the legs. The Lachane snarled and attempted to break free of the binding spell. From my spiritual vantage point, I could see him wearing away at it, fraying the magical ropes that kept him contained. They'd better hurry. This place reeks of warlocks. Theo wrinkled his nose in distaste. And cats. All I can smell is cats. We won't be here long. Kiara increased her pace. Eventually, the trees broke. The roofs of a small town came into view. The group went to hurry toward it, but all at once, they hit an invisible barrier. Everyone went flying backwards several feet and collapsed to the earth. The Lachane's body rolled, hitting a tree. Odette got up while the others were still groaning. She put her hand against the barrier. The witches have put wards around the town against Fay. We can't get in. Hattie lives in town. We have to get past that barrier if we're going to save Ethan, Kiara insisted. How? Our magic doesn't work. It's not like we can blast it down. Emma ran a hand through her hair in frustration. So what do we do? Just set the demon loose on the Miriamic Coven? Alexei asked. That wouldn't be our worst idea, Stefan said with a shrug. We have to find a witch or warlock to let us in. It's the only way, Kiara said with conviction. Uh, excuse me? Stefan asked. I thought you had a real plan. I'm making it up as I go. I'd never seen Kiara so panicked. She ran a hand through her frizzled hair and tugged on the verge of a breakdown. Alexei placed a hand on her arm. We'll save him, he said calmly. Don't give up. Kiara relaxed at Alexei's touch. Emma began stomping down the ward's barrier. Come on, there's got to be someone out here. The group walked for ten minutes. Emma paused when there was rustling in the bushes up ahead, and the entire group froze. Two figures stepped out of the bushes, a boy and a girl. They looked to be around our age, probably students at the nearby college. Definitely a warlock and a witch. The girl stared at us, but the boy jumped into action. Some sort of spell swelled at his command, and whatever it was, it didn't look pleasant to be at the other end of. Get back, Nade, the boy warned. It's a group of fucking fey. The girl's brow furrowed in confusion, yet she didn't make a move to attack. The shifters bristled, but seeing as there wasn't much they could do, held back. Kiara put her hands up, and the other girls followed her lead. We're not here to harm you, Kiara pleaded. We need help. Yeah? Then what'd you do to that guy? The boy gestured to my body, which was convulsing as the Lachane struggled to break free. He's been possessed, Kiara went on. We've been told there's a witch who can save him. Why should we believe you're not invading? The boy snarled. There's eight of you. Stefan sheepishly rubbed the back of his head. Yeah, we might have been able to do this without everyone coming along. Emma took the lead. She stepped in front of Kiara and asked, What are your names? The boy went to object, but the girl replied, Nadine and Lucas. Emma took a breath. Nadine, Lucas, my name is Emma. This is my mate. Ethan, she gestured to my body. He's been possessed by a forest demon. Lucas took in a breath, and Nadine's eyebrows knitted together. As witches, they worked with demons, 
so they knew how dangerous they were. He's in the final stages of possession, Emma continued, the demons totally taken over his body, the demons being held by a binding spell, but it won't keep him contained forever. If he's that far gone, nobody can help him, Lucas protested. There's a witch there that might be able to save him, but she lives in town, and as Faye, we can't cross the ward, Emma pleaded. If you can take it down for us, just for a second, we might be able to save his life. Lucas and Nadine shared a look, as if contemplating if we were telling the truth. Who do you want to see? Nadine asked. Hattie. Their eyes flashed in recognition of the name, but Lucas said, You're a fae. You're obviously lying. This has to be a trap. Lucas, if this man's dying, we have to help, Nadine insisted. Lucas gave a cold laugh. Do you know how many witches have died because of fae? We don't have to do anything. Please, I don't care that you're a witch. Only if you can do something to save my mate, Emma begged. She was on the verge of tears now. The coven is our only hope. Wouldn't you do anything to save the person you love? Nadine gave a wary glance to Lucas. Finally, he spat. Fine, but if this is a trap, don't blame us when all hell comes down on you. Trust us, we don't want to be here any longer than you do, Stefan said. We wouldn't be asking witches for help if we hadn't exhausted every other option. Nadine led the way back to the ward. Lucas remained behind the group, as if to watch and make sure my friends didn't try anything. Nadine spread her palm wide, and I observed as a small slit in the ward opened, easily visible beside a dying oak tree. It was big enough for one person to slip in at a time. Here, this will get you inside. Can we get out once we leave? Kiara whispered. The hole in the ward will last until morning. Once that happens, you're on your own, Lucas said. Trust me, the last thing we want to be is trapped inside a witch village, Stefan said as he slipped past the ward, dragging my body behind him. We'll be gone long before sunrise. Emma ducked through. You guys want money or something? We're just trying to help. Pay us back later, Nadine said. I couldn't imagine a world where a fay would give a favor to a witch, but Emma nodded and stepped through. Where can we find Hattie? She lives in an apartment above her shop. The place is called the Jolly Pumpkin, Lucas whispered. It should be pretty deserted. Everyone's at some big event on the other side of town. If you're lucky, you should get in and out unseen. Good luck. I was surprised he actually wished us well, but maybe the sight of my deteriorating husk had changed his mind. Blood was beginning to ooze out of my mouth and eyes. Octavia Falls was a quiet little town. The street lamps illuminated the road, casting an eerie glow. Apple trees grew on both sides of the street, and as it was November, the leaves that fell from their branches landed in big piles next to the sidewalks. Gothic houses, two stories tall, with big walk-around porches, surrounded the area until we got to Main Street. There was every shop imaginable that a witch could ever need. Metaphysical stores that sold magical ingredients stood beside cauldron shops and places to buy tickets for corn mazes. There was a coffee shop next to a candy store, and further down, a brewery sat beside a cider mill. Advertisements for palm readings, the farmer's market, and wineries lined the streets. Wooden carts on the side of the road were covered with herbs and other potion ingredients. Yarrow and St. John's wort grew in every pot around here. The Miriamic coven was very concerned about keeping Fay out. As promised by Lucas, the area was deserted. But I wasn't sure it'd stay like that for long. My friends soon found themselves at the entrance to the Jolly Pumpkin. The outside of the shop was painted orange, with a green roof and black shutters. I took in the shop's decor as they dragged me inside. Potions, wands, and crystals were on display, along with tarot and oracle cards. On the other side of the store were shelves full of candles, maple syrup, scarves, ornaments, fall decorations, and books. Candy apples and toffee were sold in a glass case at the front. It was certainly a magical store, but had more of a gift shop feel than anything else, touristy in a way that was homey and welcoming. There was a witch behind the front counter. She was old, 
with long white hair and wrinkles running across her face. She leaned on a cane and was dressed in a black peasant's dress that was made of cotton. She was exactly as I'd pictured an elderly witch to look. A gray wolf sat by her side. Ah, the witch said in a wizened tone. I was hoping you would come. The rest of them hung back, but Kiara ran to give her a hug. Hattie, I haven't seen you in ages. I missed you too, my dear. Hattie looked between us as she pulled from Kiara's grasp. What is the possessed? Stefan hauled my body forward. As she took in the Lachane's slumping stature and red eyes, Hattie's mouth thinned. This is very dire. But can you save him? Emma asked. Hattie's gaze flashed to Emma. That is for Prince Ethan to decide. Hattie picked up a cauldron that was on the front counter. She locked the store door and drew the shades to give us some privacy before she began pulling items off the shelves, placing them into the cauldron. She took down black candles and a bag of salt, moving as fast as her age would allow. There was an intricate, twisted piece of metal lying on the front counter. Odette stood over it, fascinated by its glint. Please don't pick up my wand. It's iron, forged by my own hand. You'll burn yourself if you touch it, Hattie said. Theo pulled Odette back. Stefan was eyeing a tray of pumpkin cookies by the window. He reached out to grab one, but Hattie slapped Stefan's hand. Don't take without asking. Stefan's lips stuck out. Sorry, they look so good. Hattie sighed and handed him a cookie. He began chewing with a look of bliss spread across his face. How can you think of food in a time like this? Delmare scolded. I eat when I'm upset, Stefan shouted. You should have seen me at my grandma's funeral. Half the buffet was gone. Hattie's wolf curled around Emma's legs. Emma stroked the wolf as it walked by, and the creature arched her back. You have a wolf instead of a cat? She is my familia. I am half elementi, an elemental, Hattie explained. I grew up on indigenous lands in California, within the Hawkeye tribe. So, why are you in Octavia Falls? Odette asked curiously. I relocated from the elementi lands in Kinpago a few months ago, Hattie said. The Elementals are in a civil war at the moment, and I had no desire to get wrapped up in their affairs. Octavia Falls is where I wish to be, for now. Don't the Elementi need your help, if they're truly in a war? Theo asked. Hattie paused before she said, Sophia and Liam will do fine without me, I'm sure. I've helped them all I can by offering my reading of their future. They are on their own path now. My friends relaxed a little. Elementi were allies with the Fae, which made Hattie more trustworthy. I didn't know who this Sophia and Liam were, but if Hattie had aided them in their own journey, perhaps my friends could trust her to help me as well. Hattie passed a small tree that grew on a countertop, surrounded by crystals. She wiggled her fingers, and the tree grew three inches in height, dropping leaves from its branches to use for incense. Hattie caught the leaves as they fell into her cauldron. As the tree continued to grow, Alexei said, You must be an earth elemental. A divita from the earth house, Hattie said. I have power with rocks and plants. And what caste are you? Theo added. Like Fay, the witches had different factions. Castes, they called them. A seer, Hattie replied. My talent lies in... Empathic work, like your griffin friends. Are you strong enough to get the demon out? Emma asked. Hattie picked up her wand. As I said, I will do what I can, but it will be the prince who will make the final decision. Only he has the power to truly cast the demon out. I am merely a guide. Hattie stood before us. The ceremony will take place in my own home, above my shop. I will need the prince and his mate. The rest of you must wait down here. Emma's not going anywhere alone, Stefan demanded. The more that interfered in the ceremony, the less likely it will work. This will be painful, but not in a physical way. 
Had he insisted. Give these two the space they need to perform the work that must be done. I'm sure you can all entertain yourselves. The Fay looked between themselves, but Kiara said, We can trust Hattie. It's only right upstairs. There were uneasy movements, but no one went to stop Hattie as she began ascending. Emma used her telepathy magic to hover my body as she followed Hattie to the attic. Hattie's house was small, well-kept, and comfortable. She motioned Emma to follow her through a door off the kitchen. Inside was a blank room with no windows. The walls and floors were both painted black. Hattie set the cauldron down and began pouring a salt circle. She lit the candles at the four directions, north, west, east, and south, and began burning the incense in the cauldron. Emma hesitated, and I couldn't blame her. This looked all too similar to the failed exorcism we'd performed months prior. Lay the prince within the center of the circle, then sit at his right hand, Hattie instructed as she stood at the candle in the north. Her wolf familiar stood at the south. Emma did as she said, and placed my body down on the hardwood floor. She sat cross-legged beside my body, both of us within the confines of the salt circle. The Lachane's red eyes, for the first time, shone in terror as he worked against the bonds of the binding spell. Within the salt circle, his magic was reduced. Emma stared down in disgust. What must I do? Emma asked. I will put you in a deep trance with a prayer to Mother Miriam. She is my coven's goddess and will help us vanquish this demon. There, you will be able to communicate with your mate, as he's on the soul plane, Hattie instructed. Prince Ethan must win the war within himself and face his demons. With your support, he'll gain the strength to push the demon out. How can he do that? You will have to ask his god for help. If the prince is able to excommunicate the demon from his body, I will destroy it, Harry said. But I can do nothing unless Prince Ethan orders the creature out. Don't force him, Emma. Let the prince make whatever decisions he will. Emma closed her eyes to prepare herself for the trance. Hattie raised her hands and spoke solemnly. Mother Miriam, goddess of our coven, offer your healing. Bring that which lies underneath to the surface and illuminate the shadows to bring demons to light. Hattie began to chant a low prayer to her goddess, mumbling the incantation in repetition. Her wolf familiar accompanied her with low moans that sounded like howls. Emma's head lolled. The demon struggled, and I watched as Emma's head fell backward, her eyes taking over a supernatural sheen. Hattie, her familiar, and the demon vanished. I was no longer floating. I was sitting across from Emma, in the confines of the salt circle with the candle burning lowly around us. The trance had worked. Emma reached for me, but her fingers slipped right through my arm. She stared. We blinked at each other for a few moments before she let her hand fall to the floor. I didn't think we'd ever speak to each other again, Emma began. Don't get your hopes up. Might be the last time. Emma frowned. Don't say that. You don't know. I do know that I'm tired of fighting, I said. I fought for all the wrong things, and it brought me to death's door. I'm not sure the choices I've made are reversible. If you can't reverse them, you can move on from them, Emma said firmly. No one is who they were yesterday. We're always changing and evolving. This demon isn't just an entity inside of you. It is you. And if you're going to live, you have to wrestle with that piece of yourself and put your past behind you. How can I live with what I've done? It was a mistake to choose the phantom over you, Onavilke. It was a mistake to put Malovia before you, I began. I realize now that a man can't save his kingdom if he can't keep his home safe. You were supposed to be my home, Emma. My job was to take care of those closest to me before I attempted to rescue everyone else, and I failed at that. You did the best you could with what you had at the time, Emma said gently. I've forgiven you for putting the phantom before me, but my forgiveness isn't the most important to earn. It's your own. What forgiveness can I give myself? My father is dead because of me, 
and I allowed the creature who killed him to take residence inside my own body. It's my greatest failure. Your father's death would have come regardless of whether you were there or not, Emma said. The gods were going to take him at his time, and his time came. It's done more than cause me grief. My father's death brought about a change in Malovia. I've condemned my country because Gabby and Elijah took my father's place. People have died and suffered because of it, I said, hollowness aching in my spirit. You've got to stop blaming yourself. Not everything is your fault, Emma said. There were other contestants in the king's contest, and all of them failed to stop Gabby and Eli. We beat them, and the gods still willed that they be crowned king and queen. You can't fight the will of the gods. I gave a cruel laugh. How could the gods possibly will such suffering upon us? Because the only way to bring about change is through pain, and you can't avoid pain. You must walk through it, Emma said. Changing Melovia isn't going to be easy. No matter who's on that throne, there's always going to be someone or something to fight against. The Black Claw wouldn't have vanished if you had been king. They'd still be out there killing people, and even as a monarch, your power would be limited to stop them. You're just a shifter. You're not a god. And not even the gods can violate our free will by changing our choices. I want you to understand. Being king, it was my dream. Everything I'd ever known. Without that dream, I don't know who I am anymore. My voice was so full of agony it nearly made me want to sob. I look in the mirror now and don't know who's looking back. Just because a dream dies doesn't mean you have to die with it. You can make a new one, Emma said. But who am I without the crown? Since I was born, things have been expected of me. I've had dreams planted into my head that I'm not even sure are mine. Fuck their expectations. What do you want? Emma's expression was burning. You think that since you lost your chance at being king, you can't help the people of Malovia? But that's not true. Change happens when a lot of people do a lot of little things to create an impact. You aren't responsible for the world. My throat burned. It feels like I am. You don't have to make a major impact to change someone's life. You can make a change by starting small and working your way up, Emma insisted. You believe power only lies with one man, but even if you were king, you can't force anyone to live by your laws. The only person you ever truly reign over is yourself. So what kind of man are you going to be? Her question gave me more curiosities than answers. If I stripped away all the expectations that made me who I was, what would be left? You're not the prince and you're not the phantom. You're just Ethan, Emma insisted. What happened yesterday doesn't matter. All that matters is what you do today, and you have to go forward one step at a time. I'd mused on something similar months ago. If I was to survive, I had to be born again and become a different man. Not a monarch or a monster, but merely myself. Who was I, and what did I want? It was a tough question to answer. I couldn't come up with any solution, except I knew I wanted Emma. I wasn't sure if that was enough. Most of my life, I've walked alone. It's what made being the Phantom so comfortable, I told her. I had friends and family, but I kept them all at a distance. I never opened up to anyone. That notion was challenged when you came into my life. Hiding things was unbearable. I couldn't keep secrets from you, though I tried. And my biggest secret blew up in my face. You have to learn to let people help you, Emma said. All of us have said it, but I'm done begging, Ethan. Do you want me or not? Of course I do. Then make a decision to let people in. Her voice grew even more urgent. That's your biggest flaw, that you don't ask for help and try to shoulder everything on your own. I'm your mate. It's my job to be your partner. And I feel so alone when I can't share our burdens because whatever you may think, your problems aren't just yours. They're mine, too. You always want to play the hero, but sometimes you're the one who needs to be saved. My hand is reaching for you. Just take it. I could hear the genuine love in her voice. She wanted us to be united and face things together. 
My life could be so scary at times, so terrifying. I hadn't wanted to put Emma through that, didn't want her to see the dark side. Yet, I couldn't fight my demons without her. I needed her support if I was going to pull myself out of this. I have a duty, I argued. I can't just think of myself. Why not? You don't have to bring down Gabby and Eli. You don't even have to help us find the crystals, Emma protested. Emma, the dragon oath will kill me if I don't own up to my vow, I told her. I promised to do whatever I could to find the crystals of harmony with the rest of you. I sighed. And I'm tired of making promises and breaking them. When people believe in me, they become disappointed. Try harder, Emma insisted. I wouldn't still be here if I thought you were a lost cause. Our friends wouldn't be downstairs right now, stealing cookies from a fucking witch if they didn't think you could be saved. We're all standing at the door, but you have to be the one to open it. Emma was right, but the choice to allow people to help me was a painful one. I was an alpha. I wanted to shield the ones I loved from my pain and protect them. Yet, that urge to protect had turned to poison and changed into an obsession to defend Malovia at any cost, even if it hurt someone I loved. I couldn't do that anymore. I wouldn't. But was I strong enough to make the change? You have the strength to move on without me, I said. Why haven't you done it by now? Why are you still fighting for a lost cause? I don't think you're lost. I don't need you in my life. If this doesn't work, I'll carry on without you. Emma took a breath. But, Ethan Nowak, you are the person I cherish the most, the mate of my soul and the love of my life. Don't make me move on without you unless you're ready to let go. Don't give up on me unless you can't stand to go on any longer, because I will never give up on you. Emma placed a coin in front of me, a channel to summon Luca. I brought this into the spiritual plane when I began meditating, Emma said. I'm holding it in my palm in the real world. If you love me, prove it. Use the coin as an offering to Luca and face your demons. Do the shadow work and forgive yourself for what went wrong in your life. If you want me, fight for me. I'll wait for you, Ethan, but it won't be forever, and the first person you need to learn to love is yourself. Emma faded away, and I was alone in the room. I reached out and took the coin, turning it in my hand. This was an exceptionally painful process, but Emma was right. We couldn't move on and be free unless I became a changed man, and the only way to do that was to leave the past in the past. I stared at the coin and concentrated. Instead of immediately summoning Luca, I began my shadow work. I forgive myself for not saving my father. There was nothing that could be done. His time had come, and I had to accept that his death was what the gods wanted. I could not bring him back, but I could keep his memory alive by living out his legacy as his son. I forgive myself for losing my leg. I was no longer burdened by being an amputee. Losing my leg had ceased to bother me. I had proved I could still do everything I wanted without it, and though there was a piece of me missing, it did not define me, nor make me less whole than anyone else. I forgive myself for hurting my Emma. This was the hardest. I didn't want to forgive myself for hurting my mate, but continuing to hold on to my mistakes was hurting her more. I had to leave it in the past. Luca! I spoke the name aloud, summoning the god to my presence. A whisper of wind blew out the candles, leaving me in darkness. A figure had appeared before me. His movements were so quiet and still, I could have sworn he was a shadow. A tall man in a dark cloak stood several feet away, inside the salt circle. The hood of the cloak fell so low, it shielded his eyes. All I could see were his nose and mouth. Horns like that of an elk's stuck out of his head through holes in the hood. The rest of his form was covered by the cloak, save for a coin bag that was tied around his belt. The shadows and darkness seemed to cling to him as if he were their master. I moved to my knees and bowed before the thief god. As I straightened, Luca said, You summoned me, my son. My form trembled. After so many failed attempts, 
I couldn't believe it had worked this time. Why didn't you come when I called you before? You were not ready to hear what I had to say. Luca stood so still, it was unnatural. And I am not a god of many words. What message do you want me to receive? Whatever he had to say, I would take in full regard. I had been pushing Luca away, but I was ready now. Luca turned up his hands. On his palms rested two wooden cups. The wooden cups floated out of his grasp. They shuffled so quickly I couldn't keep track of their movements. I had no idea what was underneath. Eventually, the cups came to a stop and hovered in front of me. A game. I wasn't surprised. Luca's cunning was the reason I'd chosen him as my token god. Choose. Luca crossed his arms, waiting for me to make my decision. Both cups were equal in size and presentation. I couldn't distinguish one from the other. I wanted to pick the one on the left. It felt natural. It called to me like an old friend. Someone I once knew. And that's the reason I chose the cup on the right. I couldn't be who I once was. I had to become someone different. Starting over was my only chance at life, even if I didn't know who that new person would be. I would figure it out. Not just for Emma's sake, but my own. Luca smirked as I turned over the cup. I rummaged inside and opened my palm to see a small stone. Carved into the stone was a ruin, a Malovian symbol of rebirth, whole again. Luca waved his hand, and the other cup floated to him. He reached inside to reveal to me the opposite ruin, the Malovian symbol for cycle. Do not repeat the patterns of the past, my son, Luca boomed. Begin anew each day, and you will become the alpha you were always meant to be. Luca's gaze tilted to the side. At his feet materialized the Lachane. The dark creature was on his knees before Luca. The demon stared at me with hateful eyes, his form wispy and weak. In Luca's presence, he could not speak. I wasn't afraid of him. Not anymore. Luca was here, and I was no longer willing to allow this demon space in my life. It was insane that was all it took to cast him out. One decision. But coming to that decision had been no easy feat. I wanted to hold on to my demons, fix them instead of letting them go. I knew better now. I rose to my feet. In the name of Luca, I order that you leave my body at once, I commanded the demon. You are no longer welcome here. The demon screeched. He threw his head back and wailed in pain, and at his scream... I was thrown back into my body. Luca vanished. The trance ended, and I realized I was on my back in the middle of the salt circle, Emma at my side and Hattie at my head. The Lachane had detached from me and was hovering in the air. It spat and hissed, but within the confines of the salt circle, it couldn't escape. Emma gaped up in horror, and I moved to shield her from the Lachane's power. Hattie wasted no time. While her familiar growled, she unleashed her wand from her side and cast a spell. The spell whizzed through the air and connected with the Lachane. He gave an animal-like screech, and there was a hissing sound as he exploded into ash, trickling into nothing but a pile of dust. Hattie got up and wiped off her hands with her apron. There. Done. Emma's mouth was trembling. Are you serious? Is he really out of Ethan? Yes, he's quite dead now, Hattie said. He won't bother you again. Dead, never to return. Relief ran through me like no other. Finally, I had my own body back again. I was no longer captive to that twisted creature. Emma gave a cry of joy and flung her arms around me. I squeezed her as tightly as I could. With the Lachane gone, I felt like I could live again. A heavy weight had been lifted off my chest, and though the air in the attic was musty, as I inhaled, it felt like a breath of life. You did it, Emma whispered. I knew you could. I wasn't going to leave you, Ona Wilke. There were tears running from my eyes, too. So much relief. I hadn't been damned. I had the power to save myself from the beginning. 
Hattie was sweeping up the ashes of the Lachane and putting them in a velvet bag, probably for use with a spell later. You all had better get a move on, Hattie said. Don't want to be caught sneaking about in Octavia Falls. Emma helped me to my feet. We must repay you, Hattie. We owe you everything. I don't take money. The Lachane ashes are payment enough, Hattie said. I only mean to help. My chest warmed. Whatever I'd been told about witches as a child, the rumors obviously weren't all true. There were some good witches in the world, one of which I had to thank for my life. Everyone looked up when they heard Emma and I coming down the stairs. Wide smiles spread across relieved faces, and I got tackled by six people at once. Ethan, Odette sang, you're alive. Yes, and very much recovered, I replied as I hugged her back. The demon is gone for good. Delmere looked impressed. Damn, what are we missing that witches aren't telling us? Ethan actually did most of the work, Emma said. But we owe Hattie one. Thank you, Kiara, for taking us to her. Kiara nodded. It sometimes helps to have friends in odd places. I'm sorry I didn't think of it sooner. Alexei had moved to the window and was peeking through the curtain. By this time... Darkness had shrouded the town. Uh, guys, I'm really happy Ethan's recovered and all, but we should leave. We don't know when the rest of the witches will come back. Can you make us another portal back home? Theo asked Emma. Emma shook her head tiredly. Maybe tomorrow. I couldn't make another portal if I tried right now. I actually booked us a mountain retreat while we were waiting, Stefan said, waving his phone around. It's got food. And the door's unlocked from the owner's cell. We'll have the place to ourselves for the night while Emma recovers, but there's no time to dick around. Not unless you want to get your wings pinned to a spreading board by a warlock once we're caught. That didn't sound good to any of us, so we left the Jolly Pumpkin and ran down Main Street. I was no longer feeling tired or ill. Now that the demon was gone, it was like my health had recovered instantly and my shifter healing powers were working overtime to restore my body back to optimal condition. I was never stronger. Lucas and Nadine were right. The slit in the ward was still there. We crossed through and only breathed a sigh of respite when Octavia Falls was long behind us, and we could feel our magic pumping through our veins again. Stefan changed into a dragon. The retreat isn't far, just a few miles up the road. The girls can ride on our backs there. Everyone climbed onto their respective mounts. I changed with ease, moaning as I stretched myself back into my wolf skin. Gods, I'd miss this. It felt great to be on my paws again. Emma was hesitant, but when I nudged her with my head, she climbed on my back. We set off. Nobody flew, because we didn't know if there were witches outside the ward who'd witness our escape. As we bounded toward the retreat, the exhilaration in my gut from being unleashed turned to worry. I was free of the demon, but I hadn't yet won back Emma's heart. She was my mate, but not my girlfriend, fiancé, or otherwise my partner. I wanted that to change. I'd made mistakes, but they were in the past. I could do whatever it took to make Emma see that I would become the mate of her dreams, become the man that she needed me to be. I'd made a fresh start, and that first step toward a brand new life involved mending our relationship and getting back the love we once had. I only hoped she accepted me as I was and didn't turn me away. Chapter 16 Emma The retreat was beautiful. It towered above us built into the side of the mountain and constructed in a modern style. I got off of Ethan's back and began to climb the steps with the others. He shifted and followed me. His presence was overwhelming, souls so near it was overpowering my senses. It was like when I moved, he moved. I felt the power of our bond before, but now that the Lachane was out of the way, it was as if Ethan and I were one spirit and not two separate people. I could hardly stand to breathe. Delmer noticed my concerned look. Something wrong? Does it feel like this all the time? I whispered. The bond? 
Yeah, Delmer nodded solemnly. Intense, isn't it? I thought it was strong before, but this is so different. The need to be around Ethan was consuming me, suffocating the desire to do or want anything else. I thought I'd go crazy from the emotions rattling my senses. Well, you've never been in his presence before without the demon being there. He was possessed when you met him, Delmer pointed out. All those powerful feelings are just now flooding out. I don't even know if I want them. Ethan and I weren't together. And gods, that seemed like a crime now. Just don't think about it. Follow your heart, Delmer suggested. I suppressed what I felt for Stefan for too long, and I regret that now. What did you guys talk about up in that attic? He said he was going to change, I mused. He wanted to put me first and make me his priority. Do you think he's going to? Yes. He wouldn't have been able to get the demon out if he wasn't serious about becoming a new person. Then let him have that chance, Delmer suggested. You still love him. You can break the bond later if he doesn't live up to his promises. But why not take this time to be happy? Delmer's words made my loud thoughts quieter. I was still on the fence about Ethan, yet she was right. I loved him, and I didn't have to give up on us anymore. What was keeping us apart was no longer there. Things could be different, but only if I didn't push him away. I had changed into a better person. Why couldn't my mate? We entered the house, and Stefan turned on the lights. Sounds of delight rang out from the group. The house was huge, decorated in a trendy and modernist way. Alexei began rummaging through the giant fridge in the kitchen for food. Kiara, Odette, and Theo jumped on the sectional in front of the fireplace and turned on the 70-inch screen TV to watch a movie. Stefan dragged Delmer to the nearest bedroom. She laughed and grabbed a bottle of champagne that was lying on the counter. If you excuse us, my mate and I are going to enjoy the master suite, Stefan purred. Don't come in unless you want to see some perverted stuff. Trust us, nobody wants to, Kiara laughed. The house was gorgeous, but I couldn't enjoy it. All I wanted was space to be alone with Ethan. We still had a lot to talk about. Ethan sensed my need for isolation. We're taking the bedroom upstairs. Emma has to lie down. Have fun, Alexei said. Nobody watched us as we climbed the stairs. The sound of the TV faded as Ethan and I walked together to the bedroom in the farthest corner of the house. I opened the door and immediately relaxed. The suite was gorgeous. The lights were dim, and the bed was pushed against a wall of floor-length windows that showed the mountain range beyond. The attached bathroom had a massive jacuzzi tub, big enough for two people, and fluffy towels that felt like blankets as I ran my fingers over them. I heard the sound of water running. Ethan had turned on the tub. I figured your muscles were sore, he said. You can't be comfortable after making that portal for us. They were worse than sore. The tension in my body made it difficult to move. I was so stiff I felt like the Tin Man. I hobbled to the tub. Ethan poured in bath salts and a small bottle of bubbles. I stripped. Ethan's eyes roamed up my nude body, but I paid him no attention. I got in the tub, sinking up to my nose. Relief coursed through my bloodstream, and the aching in my muscles ebbed. Finally, a bit of respite from my own body. Ethan wanted to leave, but as he put his hand on the doorknob, I said, You can come in. Ethan paused. He waited for a few moments, then removed his shirt. I observed him carefully as he took off his clothes. He didn't look at all like he did hours before. The broken veins in his face were gone, and so were the bags under his eyes. The bruises and scars that matted his body from the Lachaine's influence were no longer there. He appeared to be at his prime. My eyes flickered downward, but only for a moment. He wasn't aroused, just apprehensive, and I couldn't take my gaze away from his eyes for long. Despite us not really being, well, together, being naked in front of each other was the most natural thing in the world. There wasn't a need to hesitate. 
only a need to expose and lay bare everything that we'd been holding close to our hearts over these past few months. Clothes wouldn't do any good to conceal what we felt. We always had seen each other for who we were, even if there were illusions or lies in the way convincing us otherwise. I'd known he was the Phantom before I wanted to admit it. He'd known I was the White Rose despite what logic told him. What was in our hearts couldn't hide from the light. He sat on the edge of the jacuzzi to remove his prosthetic. Our skin touched as he slid into the tub, and that singular motion made goosebumps rise over my skin. Ethan played with the water, but said nothing. He was waiting for me to make the first move. I reached for a sponge, then handed it to him. Can you wash my back? I moved my hair aside and relaxed as he washed the sponge over my skin. It felt so good. In some parts, he pressed too hard, and I gasped, but Ethan backed off until he was applying the correct amount of pressure. Staying awake? he asked. Uh-huh. My eyes were closing. I didn't have to do anything but breathe. The weight of trying to save Ethan for months had finally been lifted off my shoulders. A good thing, too, because I couldn't carry another moment of it. Ethan put the sponge aside, then wrapped his arms around my front. He leaned back, and I pressed against him as we laid in the tub. Yeah, this was paradise. Good night. We'll figure out what we are in the morning, because I'm happy where I'm at. Do you still want to be with me? Ethan had to ask. His voice was scared, but not broken. I did what Delmare suggested and followed my heart. Yes, but I want it to work this time, I started. I can't go through this again. It'd kill me. Perhaps we can go back to what we were before, he said. That was the wrong answer. I don't think we can go back, I said. I think we have to start over. Ethan mused over that notion. When he was silent for too long, I spoke up. I can't shoulder our burdens alone anymore, Ethan, I said tiredly. I've carried us for too long. My life is difficult enough. I need to be with someone who makes our relationship easy. I can't fight against my disease, fight against Droga, and fight against you, too. I'll shoulder the battle for you, he said. I asked more from you than I ever should have. I don't know what I want from you, but I do know that I don't want our past, I continued. Things need to change if I'm going to be with you. Ethan turned me around, then took my hands in his. I want you to marry me, Honoruka. I want to stay by your side and live the rest of my days with you as my wife. He sighed. But what I want doesn't matter if you're not happy. Tell me what I can do to make that happen, and by the gods I'll do as you ask. Oh gods, here we go. I wasn't sure how well this would go over, but if Ethan wanted me back, I had conditions. Ones I wasn't sure he'd like, but that he'd have to accept if we were going to be together again. I need time, Ethan. I'm not ready to be your fiancé again, or a true mate, I stated. I just want us to be a regular boyfriend and girlfriend. There was too much pressure on a relationship to be everything. I don't need that kind of stress. I just want to have fun. He frowned. Like you had with Finlay. He was different. I moved closer. I cared about Finn, but I never loved him like I love you. Yet at the same time, I didn't feel all this strain to get everything right all the time. I could mess up. I didn't have to keep secrets or pretend to be perfect for the press. To get Finn to love me, all I had to do was be myself. That's all I want for us. Ethan squeezed my hands. It was never my intention to make you feel like you had to be more than what you already were. You're a prince that comes with a lot of baggage that I can't carry anymore. I'll handle dealing with your mom and suck up being the headline in all the papers. I took a breath. But when we're together, and it's just you and me, I don't want things to be complicated between us. My life is complicated enough. I'm the world weaver. I'm the only one who can save the Fae. And I need you to help carry my burdens, not make them heavier. I know I said earlier that I'd help you with your issues, but it can't just be one of us doing all the lifting. We have to work together. 
Ethan's eyebrows knitted together. I know I've asked a lot of you since we've met. Too much. I don't want to do that again. But will you? I can't take being in a super serious relationship right now. I'm in college. I'm 20 years old. You want that wedding and the happily ever after. I want that too, but not right now. What I want is a good time with the person I love. Ethan's face was confused as all fuck. It's a foreign concept to me. Nothing in my life has ever been simple. Why can't it be simple with us? I pressed. We make things harder than we have to. Ethan nodded. I understand I can be theatrical when my emotions run away with me. That's an understatement, I mumbled under my breath, but Ethan forged on. I must ask you this, he began. Before we traveled to Octavia Falls, you were undergoing the ceremony to break our bond. I could feel it on my end. You didn't finish, but you still have a chance to. Is that something you're considering? I grasped his arm. If you took our bond away, I'd still love you. I don't need the magic to know you're brave or kind-hearted and giving. I don't need a bond to realize you have a good heart. Now that the demon's gone and I know you've changed, you can be my safe haven again. I can fight everyone, fight all of Droga's armies, but I need to know I have somewhere to go home and rest at the end of the day and escape from the world. Ethan, I'm asking you to be my home. Ethan's eyelids beaded with tears. He pulled me to his chest and held me so close I could hear the beating of his heart. I will be your home, Onawilka, he promised. And if it's fun you want, I can happily oblige. Emma and Ethan decide that they will be together, but their relationship will be casual and carefree, instead of filled with drama and obligation. They make love for the first time, and afterward crawl into bed to sleep. I turned off the lights and nestled myself beside Ethan. He put his arm around me as he nestled his nose in my hair. Good night, Onawilka, Ethan said. His voice was utterly at peace. Good night. I closed my eyes, and my whole body relaxed as I felt Ethan brace himself against me. We didn't say I love you, but we didn't have to. Ethan knew how I felt about him, and I how he felt about me. It was all I needed for now. When I woke up the next morning, I realized three things. I was still hornier than a toad, Ethan's dick was against my ass, and he was hard. Upon waking, Emma and Ethan make love once again. I can't seem to keep myself off of you, Miss Sosna, he said. Even in my sleep, I act like a wild beast. I smirked. Hey, he could act like a beast all he wanted. I wasn't complaining. Just how long were you asleep through all that, I asked. Your sounds woke me, Ethan said. I had the most incredible dream, until I realized it wasn't such a dream after all, and the most perfect woman in the world was really at the receiving end of my cock. I giggled. Couldn't pass up an opportunity like that. Guess not. Sleeping while nude is apparently dangerous in our condition. He could say that again. I sat up and yawned, looking at the clock. It was six in the morning here, noon in Malovia. I was supposed to meet up with Arthur later today. He didn't know where I had gone, and I didn't want to worry him, which meant we needed to get back home. The others are probably up, I suggested. We should head downstairs. Ethan frowned. But what if I want to stay in this little paradise forever? They'll be banging down our door soon. Do you really want everyone to come up here and find us in a compromising position? Ethan reached out and pulled me against his chest. He kissed me tenderly which instantly warmed my heart. Let them. We are doing what lovers do. I rolled my eyes. Well, I'm hungry, and I can't survive on sex alone. Unfortunately. Ethan sat up. I suppose I should eat something, too. Now that the demon is gone, food will finally nourish me. Which I was grateful for. Though Ethan had maintained most of his muscular structure, he'd definitely lost a lot of weight during his fight with the demon. Now we could work on getting him healthy again. 
The smell of bacon and eggs wafted from the kitchen as we headed downstairs. When we met the last stair, a round of applause went up around the room, followed by cheers and shouts. All of our friends were gathered around the kitchen counter, giving us a hand. Yay for Emma and Ethan! Odette said, flinging glitter into the air. Who knew where she got it? But then again, she probably carried glitter with her at all times. Stefan clapped Ethan on the shoulder. Proud of you, man. Welcome to the world of sex. My eyes traveled upward to a homemade banner hanging from the ceiling. Congrats on losing your virginity, I read aloud. My friends had no class. Ethan scowled while I asked, How did you guys find out? Uh, you might have been upstairs, but trust us, we could hear you even with the TV on. Kiara laughed. It must have been good. Didn't know we were that loud. Odette sat on the counter and perched forward eagerly. So are you guys back together? We're taking it slow and seeing where things lead, I said. Just a regular relationship for now. Huge smiles spread everywhere. Odette turned pink. Yay! Oh, I love a happy ending. So does Ethan, Stefan quirked. Ethan elbowed him in the gut. Hey, I'm gonna need some help over here, Alexei said as he juggled eggs on the stove. I'm making breakfast for like 40 people. Um, there's eight of us here, Theo objected. Yeah, still a lot. Anyone want to jump in? Alexei asked crossly. The guys went to help. The girls pulled me to the other side of the room. We sat down at the dining room table. They leaned in, speaking in low voices. How do you two get back together? Delmer asked. I figured you were done for good. I was, I said. But then I decided there's no reason why I couldn't give him another chance. I told him I wanted an easygoing relationship. I giggled. He basically asked me, What is fun? The girls laughed. That sounds like Ethan, all right, Delmer said. So how was that sex? Odette cut right to the chase, eyelashes battering. I swooned. Oh my god, girls, his dick is like so perfect, I gushed. It was fucking amazing. Then I frowned. But it's not exactly like I thought it would be. We were acting like porn stars instead of, you know, in love. Delmer rolled her eyes with a smile. Don't take it in a bad way. The first time is always really nuts. The mating bond just makes you go crazy. Trust me, once you get used to each other, the romance comes in. Just give it time. We are seriously so happy for you, Emma, Kiara praised. We wanted you and Ethan to work out. Well, we're starting over, so maybe we will this time, I said. When I said that, I believed it. Ethan had changed, so had I. We'd grown and become better people. There was a lot to look forward to in our future together. Delmer and Kiara went to get plates, but Odette reached forward to grab my arm. I am happy for you, Emma, she said, before a flash of worry crossed her eyes. But I'm still afraid my vision is going to come true. My life or Ethan's, right? I asked glumly. Yes. She bit her lip. Now that you chose to save Ethan from the demon, your life is in danger. What if my visions are right, and Ethan brings the Hidden King right to you? What if the Hidden King kills you? We'll find a way, I told Odette. Maybe there's still a course we can take that will change the future. Odette swallowed like she wasn't sure. Despite everything we'd been through, there was still a lot in Ethan and I's way. But this time, we'd handle it as a couple instead of divided. There were no secrets between us now, so we could have our fresh beginning. I knew I could survive the prophecy as long as I had Ethan by my side. We could do anything, so long as we were together, even survive a deadly war and avoid Odette's dangerous vision. At least, that's what I wanted to believe. Only time would tell. Chapter 17 Ethan Emma was simply amazing. Now that she was mine again, there was nothing in my universe that didn't encompass her. Our mating bond was secure. We'd strengthened our connection when we made love for the first time, and ever since, she consumed me. If I thought I felt strongly for her before, it was nothing like what coursed through me now. Every thought was her. Every breath I took intoxicated me. In love wasn't the right term. 
Delirium was more like it. Stefan told me the strong feelings would eventually subside as the bond grew more and more solid, turning from something wild and inebriated into a connection that was unbreakable. Right now, my emotions were a drug, and I planned to ride the high as long as possible. It felt nice to be back at Arcania University without this demon hanging over me. My first day back at class was like the first day being born. I cherished this sense of normalcy that I didn't have before. The smallest things meant the most, especially when you'd gotten them back after months of precious moments slipping through your grasp. Lord Lucian smiled as I entered his classroom. You're looking on the upside, Prince Ethan. Feeling much better. I took a seat beside Theo. We shared this class together, Fay in tension. I hadn't bothered with my classes all semester, and so my grades were shit, but there was still time to pull things together before exams in a month and a half. I couldn't remember a single thing Lucian had taught me this year, so I was focused on making up time. Theo flipped open his textbook. You're late. I smirked. Emma and I might have enjoyed a quick rendezvous in my bedroom. And what a time it had been. Emma and I were back together, but she had insisted she didn't want anything too serious. The notion bothered me, but I couldn't push her into anything. I figured I might as well take advantage of the situation by sinking myself into her as often as the opportunity permitted. And temptation happened. Often. Hardly a day went by now where Emma and I weren't having sex. The crazy urges would slow, Stefan insisted, so it would be best if we enjoyed my raging shifter hormones while they lasted. Lucky son of a bitch, Theo growled while staring at his notes. I grinned, but my smile fell when I saw that Theo was being serious. He clearly had Odette on his mind. What's the problem? Theo sighed. The problem is, I'm lonely. I love Odette. She's avoiding me. You know, we kissed on Heimskinnen. Yeah. It was all he'd talked about for days afterward. Well, I can't seem to make a move since. Every time I do, Odette makes up an excuse or runs away. We don't hang out or talk. It's like we're not even friends anymore. This is exactly what I was worried about. Theo's fist pounded against the desk before he put his knuckles to his mouth and bit down. I grabbed his shoulder. You aren't losing her. Your relationship is just changing. It has to if you want to be together. Yeah, and what if it changes in a bad way? Like, it's so awkward, she ends up hating my guts, he spat. This back and forth between us is driving me crazy. So sit her down and talk it out with her. That's the only way you'll solve it. I can't do that, Theo whined. I'll make a fool out of myself. I held back a noise of impatience. Alicorns never confronted their feelings. It was rare for them to voice their emotions aloud. You beating around the bush is what got you into this situation in the first place, I said. Lay it all on the line and just get it over with. Then you'll have an answer. Theo scowled. He scribbled something down in his notebook, and Lord Lucian took command of the class by rapping the chalkboard. You all know the basics of fey magic, Lucian boomed. Our intention is our power. Our creativity brings impossible things to life. Fey manifest their desires in the physical plane by believing in what we want. In Edinmire, this was even easier. A fey would think of something, and it would appear instantly whether belief or not was there. On Earth, this is harder. Though the portal is closed, we still pull our magic from Idenmire, and how much magic we can harness through that connection to our otherworldly home dictates our capabilities here. The mark of a powerful shifter or sorceress is determined by how much power they can harness from Edenmire. That made sense. It was the reason Emma was so strong. She had a direct line to our ancestral home and could easily open and close portals that went there. Lucian lifted a finger. However, there are limitations. A fae in this world can manifest food, but it will not give the same nutritional value as it would in Edenmire. A fae's ability to create illusions 
also depends on their ability to believe. The most powerful fey in the world could harness all the power from Edenmire they wished, but if they did not believe they had the ability to cast the spell, it would cease to manifest into existence. The true law of our race is that we are the creators of our destiny and our lives. We can create our reality, so long as we use our belief to bring what we want into our existence. Our thoughts and our faith become our reality. Nikolai raised a hand. You say our faith becomes our reality, but don't the gods give each of us a path to follow? Lucian lifted an eyebrow. Does it truly matter whether the gods exist or not? Shocked murmurs went throughout the classroom. I was confused. I'd met Luca face to face. I knew he was real. What was Lucian playing at? Lucian waved a hand. Don't consider me a heretic. I'm merely making a point. What I'm saying is, it does not matter if the gods are real or if they are not. Our belief in them makes them come to life. We harness power and blessings through them because we believe they help us and guide us. Without faith, the gods in our lives mean nothing at all. If you believe your god will help you, then he will. If you don't, well, you'll have a hard time using your magic besides. Trust me. A couple people laughed, but this concept made sense to me. I'd asked Luca for help when I was possessed, but I didn't believe he would aid me, or that he wanted to. I hadn't received his blessings or his aid until I'd chosen to believe in him myself. My decision to have faith my situation would improve made all the difference versus when I'd been convinced that all would remain hopeless. Even so, having that faith had been the most difficult thing in the world. Lucian went on. Many fey have used this concept of belief to trick humans and even other fey. For example, a home could be disguised by the illusion of a ruin, tricking the viewer into thinking the home was destroyed, when really it could still be standing. If a fey believed that the home was still there, they could open the door to the ruin and the illusion would fall away. What you see is not necessarily what is there. Theo's eyes narrowed. Lucian went on for another hour, speaking on all the intricacies of fey intention and how our thoughts led to the manifestation of our magic in the real world. At the end of the lecture, Theo's look was contemplative. He stared at the chalkboard, as if mulling an idea over. Something on your mind? I asked Theo. He rubbed his chin. Maybe. I need time to investigate. Is it about the Alcorn Court? I whispered. We were no closer to finding the mythical Fey Court than we had been months ago. Clues had dried up. Yeah, but it's just a theory. Theo shook his head. I don't know. I'll get back to you later if it leads to anything. I sure hoped it did. Most of the semester had been taken up by fighting the Lashane. It had left little time to look for the Alicorn Stone. And there wasn't any time to waste. Each day that passed was another day closer to Droga rising from the dead. If we didn't have those stones before that happened, God save Malovia, as well as the rest of us. That afternoon, Emma and I took a carriage to Dolinska. We were planning to get dinner at her mother's restaurant, our first official date in a very long time. Emma snuggled against my side to ward off the cold. Snow was falling, and it had coated the top of the carriage. We stepped out in front of a small stone diner. You okay? I asked Emma. Her steps were slow today. Yeah, she replied. Just feeling out of it. I want to go out to eat, but I'm not sure how much energy I have to go shopping around to Delinska later. We won't go far, I promised. If she was too frail, we'd return to the university after our meal. I knew going out could really wear on Emma, and at this time of the year, I didn't want to push it. As we walked inside the diner, warmth surrounded me, along with the smells of freshly baked bread and a wood-burning stove. Ivy and small lights hung from the ceiling. The chairs and tables were all mismatched, and vintage paintings hung on the brick walls. 
A sign behind the antique bar said, Ivona's Place. The clinking of glass and silverware could be heard as waiters ran out food to customers. The place was absolutely packed, which made me a little nervous. There was a pandemic going on in the human world at the moment. Most supernaturals weren't affected. The magic in our blood made us immune to the disease, save for our disabled. Viruses, colds, and flus had to mutate to affect supernaturals, unless the individual was already immunocompromised, such as Emma. A couple of vulnerable fae that mingled in the human world had caught the virus, and although they couldn't spread it to the rest of our population, it had either killed or severely sickened them. I wouldn't take that chance with my mate. Do you feel safe here? I asked as my eyes roamed the busy restaurant. Would you relax? No one is going to give me anything. We're surrounded by healthy shifters and sorceresses. I'm safe as long as I don't leave Malovia or any other supernatural community, Emma said. I knew she was right, but it didn't stop me from worrying. We took a booth in the corner. Stefan and Delmare were here, sitting at a table of their own not too far away. Delmare waved to us, and Emma waved back. Dude, you're in for a treat, Stefan called to me over the noise. This place is the best. My mom's a great cook, Emma said. She looked a little green. Are you all right? I asked. You were quiet on the ride over. Yeah, I was throwing up all night from pain, she said. My back and hips have been killing me lately. I've been working too hard at practice. I'm sorry. Anything I can do to help? She smiled. You being here helps enough. That was sweet. Another redhead came up to the table. Arthur, Emma's brother. He placed two menus in front of us and gave me a glance. Arthur scratched the back of his head. I uh, got a job. Mostly bartending, but waiting when we need it. I talk things over with Ivona, I mean, Mom. She really wants to work on having a relationship, and I figured we can do that if I'm spending a lot of my time here. That makes me so relieved. You two work things out, Emma said. Arthur shrugged. Yeah, well, she's my mother. Can't rule her out completely without getting to know her. Arthur glanced at me. Can I talk to you for a minute? Emma facepalmed. Oh, jeez, Artie, let it go. It's fine, Emma. I rose from the table and Arthur took me aside, to a corner of the restaurant out of Emma's earshot, though she glared at Arthur from across the way. I knew what this was going to be about. Arthur took a breath. Hey, we're cool and all, but if you hurt my sister again, we're going to have problems. I don't care about your title or how tough you think you are. My magic's strong enough to do some damage, and the last thing I want to see is Emma suffering through another broken heart. Got it? We are completely clear. I have no intention of ever leaving Emma's side, I told him. His gaze flared. Good. Keep it that way. Arthur walked off. The moment he did, Stefan slid up to me and nudged my arm. He'd been watching us, too. You gonna let him talk to you like that? He's being a good brother. It's no issue, I said. What would you do if you had a sister and someone had done to her what I did to Emma? Probably rip the fucker to pieces. Stefan said fairly. Exactly. Let bygones be bygones. I wasn't doing anything to divide my mate and I ever again, and so I had to get along with the family. Arthur and Emma were twins, and I would do nothing to invalidate their connection. Stefan snickered. It was kind of funny, watching a little guy like Arthur threaten a big dude like you. I'm not underestimating him. Emma's small, but she's powerful. Her brother's probably the same. Stefan nodded. I bet you're right. Call me when you piss him off. It'd be funny to see him kick your ass. I sat down at the booth. Emma had her arms crossed. What exactly did he say to you? Nothing you need to worry about, I said. It's all good. Emma huffed. Gods. Men. Ivana slid up to the table. Emma's mother looked in her element. Red curls swept back with a handkerchief as she dusted flour off on her apron. It's great to see you two again, Ivana gushed. I was hoping you'd stop by. Ivana was certainly happy to see us back together. At least I had the approval of Emma's mother, even if Arthur wasn't giving me a free pass. 
I've heard a lot about this place, I said. It must be incredible. You should give him the specialty. I know he'll love it, Emma said. Ivona smiled. Coming right up. I suppose you want the same? I'm feeling very nauseous, Emma said. Everything I take down churns my stomach. I'm going to stick with soup. A look of concern crossed Ivana's face. I'll get it out soon as I can. Arthur brought us drinks. Emma got water while I stuck with ale. She sipped at it slowly, as if worried it might set her digestion off. Are you sure you don't need to leave? I asked. Emma grimaced. It's okay. It'll subside soon. My health's like this, on and off. Just have to wait it out. Emma's eyes traveled upward, and I turned around. Two people wandered by our table holding hands, Finley and Amantha. Hey, you two, Emma exclaimed. They paused, eyes gleaming with recognition when they saw us. Finley glanced at me, but instead of the jealous look he typically gave, he seemed relaxed. What's this about? Emma gestured to their joined hands in a teasing way. Amantha blushed. We're kind of a thing now? Finley smiled, and an excited look spread across Emma's face. Really? That's amazing, Emma paused. Do people date across factions? Her question was valid. Amantha was a griffin marked, and Finley was a woven shifter. They were a bit of an odd couple. Sometimes, after mates are rejected or pass away, Finley explained, and we're pretty much in the same situation. Amantha nodded. Both of us lost our mates. We found a way to comfort each other. You can say that again, Arthur called across the room as he carried a tray. Finley flipped him off. I'm really happy for you two, Emma added. Looked like everything worked out. For you guys as well, I see, Finley added. At least we're all getting some. Amantha nudged him playfully, and they took a table on the other side of the room. I leaned forward. Doesn't seem like there's any hard feelings between you and Finley. She nodded her head. No, and I'm relieved it's that way. I didn't want to lose any friends. I could care less about Finley hanging around Emma now. She'd chosen me, and for that, I trusted her. Our food came out a short time later. Ivana placed some sort of pie in front of me. I cut into it. The pie was filled with ground beef, quartered potatoes, and sauerkraut. Smelled fantastic. I took a bite. The crust was buttery and flaky, and all the contents of the pie melded together to create a savory combination. I'd rarely tasted anything so delicious, not even at the palace. What is this? It's amazing. It's a pasty. It's a northern Michigan thing. My mom makes the crust from scratch, Emma explained. Emma started in on her tomato soup, and her cheeks warmed in pleasure. Well, it's fantastic. Tell your mother this is excellent. I had almost a quarter of the pie gone already. She has a lot of Michigan food on her menu. Coney dogs, Detroit-style pizza, Reuben sandwiches, even Mackinac Island fudge, Emma said. It's the only place in Malovia you can get authentic American food, not that thing you Malovians like to call a cheeseburger. I didn't care enough to think of a comeback. I was too busy enjoying my food. When Arthur was clearing away our plates, I heard the sounds of chants outside. Arthur froze. His eyes darted to the window, where he watched a group of people walk by with signs. Their voices grew louder and louder as the crowd increased in number, repeating the phrase, Elijah Zlodia is not our king. The patrons around the restaurant immediately stood up. Most were right in the middle of their meals. They threw money on the table and left as quickly as they could, faces ashen. Soon, the only guests left in the restaurant were Emma, Delmer, Stefan, Finley, Amantha, and myself. Ivana came running out of the kitchen. She took a look outside the window and paled. Emma, Arthur, both of you need to go back to campus. Ivana bustled around, shutting drapes over the windows. It's not safe here. What's going on? Emma's eyes scanned the various signs, most of them written in Malovian. She couldn't read the signs, but I could, and what was written on them wasn't good. It's a protest, 
Ivana glanced out the window again before she pulled the last shade shut. They have a habit of getting out of hand. What are they protesting? Emma asked. The king's policies, Ivana waved us over. Leave out the back, quickly. We wasted no time. The six of us followed Ivana to the kitchen. She opened a door to the back alleyway and locked it behind us once we left. Arthur led the way, gesturing we had to follow. We left the alley, but apparently the protest was bigger than we thought, because the organizers were on this street too. I kept Emma close to me against the crowd, in the direction of the university. Finley and Stefan kept the other girls tight to them. Arthur insisted we press against the wall as we moved up the sidewalk. I'd been keeping up with the news. There'd been a few protests since Elijah had eliminated all the social programs in the country, but they'd been small. This seemed to be the biggest one yet. Elijah had gained the favor of the few rich, but in doing so, he lost the support of the many poor. There were no carriages in sight. We had to walk. The street Arthur was leading us down conjoined with Delinska's main square. Hundreds of people had congregated in the square, holding signs and screaming for justice. The Arcania Alliance bordered the protest. They stood at the ready, hands brimming with spells and ready to shoot. One sorceress, who seemed like she was one of the leaders of the protest, stood on the edge of the great fountain in the middle of the square. She used her magic to project her voice as she screamed aloud. King Elijah treats his people with disgrace. We are sacrifices for his war, sacrifices for the greed of a king who only cares about himself. He discards the sick, the elderly, the poor, and anyone else who gets in his way of a vision of a perfect Malovia. Are we going to allow him to enslave the working class and take away our freedom to life? The crowd roared, and the police at the edge of the line began to move forward. My chest tightened. We had to get out of here. I shifted immediately. Emma, get on my back now. The rest of you, leave if you can. The other shifters took my lead and changed. Stefan flew off. He was followed by Finley, who was the only woven among us with wings. The two of them got Delmare and Amantha to safety, while Arthur and I were left to guard Emma. Emma's hands tightened on my fur, and Arthur moved in front of us, raising his lip in a growl. The voice of the sorceress grew louder. We demand justice. There are more of us than there are of them. She shouted, pointing in the direction of the royal guards. Let's join together and send a message to the king. We will not stand for this. Noises of agreement rang out in the streets. The protesters came together to hold hands and form a chain. They faced off against the police as Arthur and I began to run. An officer's voice boomed over the protest. We have orders from the king, he shouted. Disperse or face the consequences. He couldn't legally order anyone to leave. Protesting was legal in Malovia, at least for now. A couple of officers pushed a few protesters, but no one reacted. A chill quivered in my heart as the protesters began to sing the Malovian national anthem. Their voices swelled against the cold night, and I heard another officer give a shout. The protesters were being peaceful, but the Arcania Alliance seemed determined to force the crowd into being violent. The police shot off spells into the crowd without warning, without being provoked. Screams ignited, and smoke filled the air. The protesters scattered as the Arcania Alliance moved in. So many spells lit up the night, it was like fireworks were going off in the square. I flattened myself to the ground as spells flew over our heads. I watched as a spell an officer cast hit a sorceress in the eye. Her eye exploded, making her blind and giving a huge gash to her head. She cried out and clutched at her face as the police moved in to arrest her. One old man, who had to be pushing seventy, had a sign ripped out of his hands that said his pension was all he had to live on. The police surrounded him and began kicking. Blood trickled out of his head and ran down the cobblestones. The police stampeded over him as they moved on to their next target, a little girl clinging to her mother. She cried out as an officer tore her out of her mother's arms. The sorceress reached out for her daughter, but was forced to the ground as an officer put a knee on her neck. The protesters began fighting back with magic of their own. 
Shifters changed, battling the police with tooth and claw, while sorceresses flung back shields and battle magic. I heard a hissing sound go through the air, and I looked up. My heart convulsed as I saw a canister spinning through the sky. Noxite gas. Noxite was the only thing that could take away a supernatural's magic, and Noxite gas was even more deadly. Emma, hold your breath. Emma buried her face in my shoulder. I held my breath and closed my eyes as a gas canister burst beside us. We ran through a cloud of Noxite gas that was beginning to bloom over the square. We were only in it for seconds, but already I could feel the Noxite wearing against my powers. Arthur and I were both forced to change back, and Emma fell off of me. My magic had evaporated, and the Noxite gas stung at my lungs. I gagged and coughed, though I was grateful Emma hadn't inhaled any of it. Arthur tried casting a spell, but the magic flickered at his fingers and died. The Noxide had made our powers useless. We continued running as men, and I grabbed Emma's hand to force her to keep up with me. We couldn't stop. Along the way, we witnessed so many horrible things. People whose eyes were bleeding from the Noxide gas, or on their hands and knees, suffocating as they grasped at their throats. The Arcania Alliance, armed with gas masks and body suits, strolled in and began arresting the people who couldn't breathe. With the Noxide gas, the protesters were quickly overwhelmed. Multiple people raised their hands in surrender or tried to run. It didn't matter. The Arcania Alliance shot them in the face or in the back. As spells took them down, the police put them in handcuffs and hauled them away. I was so terrified. This wasn't a protest. It was war. Elijah was waging a battle against his own people, and the Arcania Alliance was completely compliant. I had learned, had accepted, that I wasn't responsible for the world. But this? It was madness. Would no one stop it? Emma faltered. She was already tired today, and her body just couldn't keep up, even if we were in danger. I gathered her into my arms and carried her, my instincts driving me on to get her to safety. People were running in every direction. Though my lungs burned and Arthur heaved beside me, we couldn't slow down. Sirens blared behind us, and the smell of the bitter noxite gas continued to permeate the air. I nearly wept when I saw the sanctity of the university gates. A couple of teachers were closing them. Arthur cried out to keep them open, if only for a few more seconds. Dozens of students had gathered at the fence line of the campus, to watch the horrors that were taking place from afar. Wait! Arthur coughed. He fell to his knees again, and Emma slid off my back. Both of us reached out to drag him as Lord Lucian held the gates open for us. They closed the minute we were inside campus. Stefan, Delmare, Finley, and Amantha had made it. They stared at us in horror as we gaped for any small source of air we could find. Are you guys okay? Stefan asked. He clapped me on the back, and my throat finally cleared. We made it, Arthur rasped. That's what matters. The courtyard turned silent. Heads looked up as Lady Magdalena strolled in front of the university gates. She raised her hands to get our attention. Even her face was drawn and pale. She stood as a stark contrast to the smoke and gas rising from within the city. For the next few days... No student is allowed to leave university property for their own protection, Magdalena said. Many innocent people have been hurt tonight, and it is my obligation as headmistress to keep each one of you safe. Student services will remain open all night in case anyone wishes to talk. I advise each of you to return to your dorms and do not watch the news. There is nothing that will provide any benefit to observing suffering. Students began to disperse. When Lady Magdalena said something, it was an order, not a request, and everyone was looking for some sort of instruction right now. Emma shivered against me, and I wrapped her in a tight embrace. She closed her eyes, as if she wanted to block out everything that we'd seen. How can Eli let this happen? I refuse to believe. Even he is so cruel. Emma wept as she pressed herself into my coat. Because he doesn't care. In his eyes, those protesters deserved what they got. 
Emma sniffed and wiped her tears. This isn't the country I know, the Malovia I love. I don't recognize it anymore. Eli's tearing it apart. I didn't recognize this Malovia either. It wasn't the nation I'd been born into, the country I'd been so ready to sacrifice myself for. It crossed my mind that maybe this country wasn't worth dying for, not if it was like this, and that my entire life I'd merely been too ignorant to see all the problems that were igniting under the surface. But what could Emma and I do? Nothing. We had no power, no control. The best we could do would be to find the crystals of harmony and use them to bring peace. Once we had the stones, we could overthrow Elijah and save our nation. If there was even a nation left to defend. Chapter 18 I'd never been through anything so brutal in my life as that protest. Not even the king's contest could compare. Most of the protesters had gotten arrested and were rotting in a Malovian prison without bail or word of a trial. Others had ended up dead. A few had escaped, and it was enough to make the Arcania Alliance worry there'd be another protest, though they wouldn't admit it to the press or otherwise. But I could see it in their eyes during the interviews on TV. The people made them nervous. My friends and I were sitting in the rec room, watching the news the next week. Lady Magdalena had insisted we limit our intake of the media, but at the same time, it was like I couldn't keep my eyes off of it. I watched another interview with the Arcania Alliance, in which the reporters questioned the actions of the officers during the big uprising. Our duty is to install order, the Arcania Alliance chief said. We will employ whatever methods necessary to keep the law and foster peace. Kiara switched off the TV. A couple of us protested, but she didn't turn it back on. Lady Magdalena is right, Kiara insisted. This isn't making us feel better, or doing a damn thing to help. Alexei sighed as he relaxed. He'd been sucking in all the emotions through the television as we'd watched the news, and it nearly turned him gray. It was then that Andrik walked by, the shitty dragon shifter who tried to rape down there last semester. He was still creeping around the school, as Eli had gotten him off of any pending charges. His face was permanently disfigured now. Stefan's brutal assault of him after the incident had left half of Andrik's face caved in, the bones in his jaw so broken they fit raggedly together, hanging off the side and leaving his mouth half open at all times. Delmer still cringed whenever Andrik was in her presence. She sank against the couch, avoiding Andrik's stare. Stefan put an arm around Delmer's shoulders. I got you, baby. He glared at Andrik, and the shithead scuttled off. He's so terrified of you, Odette giggled. Good, Stefan said. He looks my babe again. I'll ruin the rest of his face. I wish all problems could be solved so easily. But I didn't think violence was going to be the way to stop this. We should talk about something happy, Odette insisted. How is everyone's bedroom life going? I need the deets since I'm no longer getting any. A couple people groaned, and Theo's cheeks turned pink. Delmer snickered. Ask Emma and Ethan. They've got all the juicy stories. Hey, we've only done it like twice today, I said, counting off. Twice? Kiara fell forward, smacking her face with a pillow. Just don't get pregnant, you'll scare Ethan off, Delmer joked. Yeah, we have video proof, Odette shouted. Alexei let out a cackle. Hey, maybe you should have gotten pregnant, Stefan cracked. It'd have scared the demon right out of him. Everyone laughed but my mate. Ethan's lips downturned. I'm glad you're all having a joke at my expense. Lighten up, we're just messing with you. I slapped his broad chest playfully. Ethan scowled deeper. Arthur came out of his dorm room. He held a wrapped package in his hands and stood beside the couch. Hey, Em. Ready to go? Babkia and Papa are waiting. I stood. Yeah, see you guys later. I let my fingers trail out of Ethan's. Arthur nodded to Ethan, and he nodded back. I was sure the two wolvens were speaking telepathically, Arthur promising to keep me safe. I was on guard as we left campus, but the streets were quiet. 
Arthur remained in his shifter form until we got to our grandparents' house, changing back only until we'd locked the door behind us. As usual, Babkia and Papa were gathered around the hearth. Papa was reading the news with his pipe in his mouth, and Babkia was stirring another pot over the fire. Stuffed cabbage, it smelled like. Babkia tapped the ladle against the pot as we walked in. About time both of you showed up. I was beginning to think you weren't coming. How are you holding up with the protests? I asked as Arthur and I sat on the couch across from her. Babkia huffed skeptically. It'll take a lot more than that to make me move from my home. I'd like to see someone try to get in here. Protesters, police, or otherwise. Arthur shook his head. You two are so stubborn. You should consider moving out of town. Papa folded his paper and tossed it into the fire. Listen here, boy. We've been chased and hunted and bothered our entire lives for being on silly fay. We aren't going to start kowtowing to people's demands now. I could hardly see that happening, ever. Droga himself could pound on my grandparents' door, and they'd tell him to go to hell. At least I knew now where I got my bullheadedness from. We were working on unseely spells the last time you were here, Babtia said. Before we begin, are there any questions you'd like us to answer? I paused to consider. Yes, actually. We've spoken before how I harnessed the power of the dark necklace in the contest. Yes, go on. Baba growled. Well, the dark necklace burned me. I pulled down my sweater to show a few of the scars that were still there. When I used it, it was painful. It took a lot out on my body and sucked all my energy. Wearing it was literally killing me. But why would that be if it was an unseely object and I'm an unseely myself? Did you know how to read a book before you learned the alphabet? Babtia asked. I suppose not. Then of course the necklace would burn. It overpowered you, and without you having the knowledge of how to direct the necklace's magic, the object drew energy from you itself while in use. Perhaps if you wore it now, you could direct the dark magic in a way that wouldn't hurt you, Papa said. From what you've told us about the necklace, I've deduced the gemstones within the object were what provided the power. As you used the power in the gems, the gems would have to harness power from elsewhere. If you were able to guide the stones into taking energy from things around you instead of your own body, you might have been able to continue wearing it. I nodded. That makes sense. I have a question, Arthur asked. When I was speaking with my mother, she mentioned that she bonded with two shifters instead of one, our father and King Lycus. Is such a thing possible amongst Fae? That was a good question. I hadn't thought to ask that. Polyamory was common among the old fae, but women were the only ones who chose multiple partners. It wasn't unusual for a sorceress to bond with two or more shifters that were devoted only to her, Babkia said. Back in the old days, fae were fae and didn't try to be anything else. We did what we wanted and didn't bother ourselves with the consequences. What changed? I asked. There was influence from the humans, but truly, the circle wanted power, Babkia shrugged. It's easier to control people when you can force them to follow a specific doctrine. What about other races? Or other factions? Even same sexes? I dared to ask. Papa's eyes flickered up to me. I've never heard of a fey bonding with someone outside of their own faction. A Mark's faction is chosen for her when she comes of age by the magic in her blood. You know this, because your mother was born to griffin parents, but became a wolven when she bonded to our son. It might be possible, though I'm not certain. As for other races, I've heard of Fae choosing mates from different supernatural communities. Mermaids, vampires, and the like, although it is exceptionally rare to bond with them. And you're asking if men can bond with men, or women with women? Babkia added. Most will tell you it isn't possible, but they forget the old ways. Your papa and I are ancient enough to remember the stories of how it used to be in Edinmire. Remember, Emma, it's all about control and how much power the circle desires to exert over the fey. Babkia began to dig in her apron. From her pocket, she procured a few herbs. You've been sick often this semester, Emma. I will teach you how to make an unseely tea. It's not a healing spell. We don't have those in our culture, only potions that might help us heal faster. But this will harness the defenses of plants to protect you against other illnesses. Babkia gestured for me to follow her to the kitchen. I filled a teapot with water, then set it on the stove to boil. Babkia began cutting the herbs on a board. I helped her slice them, 
noticing the special ingredients, rose, vervain, chamomile, and feyweed. Something that isn't taught anymore is that food and drink preparation is important to a fey, Babkia said. Cooking is a spiritual act as much as a physical one. Whatever emotions you put into your food, sadness, resentment, anger, show up and are digested into your body when you transfer them unintentionally into your meals. Wow, really? My eyebrows shot up. I didn't know that. Yes, and it's the same with the happy emotions as well. When you cook, you want to have a clear mind, even if you're preparing a simple tea. Babka transferred a few ingredients to a mortar and began mashing them with a pestle. When you prepare a meal or a drink, it is no different than casting a spell. Keep focused and your mind calm. Relax. As you brew the tea, meditate on the idea of health, taking energy from the herbs that are inside the contents we prepared. Babkia dumped the ingredients into a cup, then poured hot water over the tea. She told me to watch the tea, focusing my illusion magic on provoking wellness within the tea's contents. I stared at the water, feeling my eyes go cross-eyed as I did my best to infuse the tea with every healthy thought I could imagine. After the tea had cooled, I took a drink. The effects were instantaneous. My shoulders, which were sore from practice yesterday, instantly relaxed, and the upset stomach I'd had since last week ebbed away. Babkia smiled as she saw the relief brim on my face. It works, I marveled. All because I changed my intent? Precisely, Babkia said. Even the smallest of efforts in our lives are magic, Emma. We don't need to perform great spells to do great magic. Sometimes, the littlest things can provide the best results. My grandmother was so wise. She still had so much to teach me. I couldn't believe something so simple and tiny as a cup of tea could have such a big effect on my life. But it did. Faye valued big things, like money, power, and impressive magic. Yet as I was starting to learn, with unseelie magic and otherwise, it was the most unexpected things that made all the difference. My grandmother's tea worked. As I made the tea each morning, I found that my immune system grew a bit stronger. It couldn't ward off everything, but it gave me strength, and one less cold than I had to have was always a plus in my book. I found that the tea didn't work if I made it when I was in a hurry, or already feeling pissy. It made me reframe my thoughts each time I cast a spell, or even did small things like complete my homework. If fame magic was intention, everything was a spell, and I needed to do my best to respect the magic so it worked in my favor. Although it was hard to remain in a positive and clear mindset when the world around you was falling apart. At 9am before my Illusion 102 class on Friday, I was in my dorm room working on translating the grimoire when Delmare poked her head in. Hey, you better come look at this, she said. Her expression was grim. My stomach dropped. Gods, what now? There are more protests. They're starting to turn into riots, Delmare said. People are looting and burning buildings down and everything. That Elijah's refusing to acknowledge what's going on has everyone pretty pissed. I got up from my desk to follow her. Tigris fluttered onto my shoulder as I walked into the rec room. Multitudes of people were pressed around the TV, watching footage from last night's protests. Flames flashed across the screen, statues were toppled and windows were broken as protesters took their anger out on whatever was within reach. The Arcania Alliance arrested people on screen while a separate group walked behind them also carrying signs and shouting. This crowd was considerably older and wealthier than the first, and different from the original group of protesters. I leaned in to ask Ethan a question. Who are they? Counter-protesters who support Eli's rule. They're mostly from the upper-class districts, Ethan informed me. A lot of them have been getting tax cuts and other benefits from the law changes. They don't want things to go back to what they once were. I wasn't good at reading Malovian yet, but I could translate some words. A couple of the signs of the counter-protesters read, If you don't like Malovia, leave, and King Elijah brings freedom to our nation again. I wasn't sure if these people knew the same Elijah I did. To these counter-protesters, it was like he could do nothing wrong. It was sickening to watch. The Arcania Alliance was clearly protecting the wealthier class. 
They had their backs turned to the counter-protesters and had made a wall against the other side, throwing spells and noxite gas canisters to disperse the poor and allowing the counter-protesters to walk free. As I continued to take in the footage, my concern grew deeper. I was worried about my grandparents and my mother's business. My loved ones weren't safe in Dolinska, no matter what they told me. Elijah came on screen, the subject of a press conference that had been recorded this morning. I wanted so badly to punch the TV and break it so I didn't have to listen to his stupid speech, but Ethan grabbed my shoulder and held me back as his shitty cousin went on another ridiculous rant. Tigris growled and lashed his tail as he watched Elijah ramble. These protesters are causing division in our country. They need to go back to the crime-infested slums they came from and cease trying to harm hard-working Fay who only wish to make Malovia a country of greatness once more. Elijah boomed from his stand in front of the palace. As king, I thank those that have stood up for liberty and used their God's given right to protect that which matters most to the Fay of this land, our pride as a nation. The crowd before him cheered and my insides burned. This country was divided, and Elijah was fostering that divide because he benefited from it. It was so crazy. I couldn't watch this anymore. I turned my back to the TV and returned to my dorm. I planned to bury myself in my grimoire and ignore the rest of the world until I had to go to class, but Ethan stopped me. Don't let this ruin your day, Onawilka, he said. How can they think he's a good leader, I burst. It's obvious he's hurting so many people. A good leader installs peace and brings people of different viewpoints together over common ground. He doesn't drive them apart and take sides. But not everyone knows that, Ethan said. He squeezed my arms. I know it's hard to see now, but leaders like him don't last forever. They're taken down, or they fall away to allow better men to take their place. We must keep faith in that. But how? How can we have faith when our world is falling apart? I asked. This world is just so disgusting and I can't do anything about it. You told me the gods put Eli on the throne for a reason, and I am apt to believe you. Our world has to get worse before it gets better. Things are just coming to a head now, and it's tough to slog through all that shit. But we will get through it, I promise. Just hold on. My lip quivered. I just wish we had more power to make a change. Hey, remember what you told me? Ethan took my face in his hands. It takes a lot of people doing a lot of small things in order to make a change. This is what we can handle and what we can help with. All we can do is our part, nothing more. I knew he was right, but I still felt so helpless. I wanted to do more. My mood hadn't improved by the time I walked into Illusion 102. I sat beside Kiara at our desk and took a few deep breaths, trying to get myself in the right frame of mind. I'd been improving so far with my magic because I had been working on my thoughts. I didn't want to ruin my progress by continuing to have a shitty attitude. Lady Corva walked around the room, distributing back our essays from last week. If anyone refused to acknowledge the divide in this country, it was Lady Corva. She couldn't give a shit or less if someone was bothered or upset by the political bullshit currently holding us all hostage. She expected you to make her class your first priority, no exceptions. While some teachers had given us less homework due to the distraction of all the uprisings, Corva had made up for it by doubling our workload. Yeah, she was a real bitch. Lady Corva slapped my paper down in front of me. My jaw dropped open when I saw the grade at the top of my paper. D minus? Excuse me? I worked forever on that paper. I knew my research was accurate, and all my sources were cited. When I looked for the comments on what I might have done wrong, the only thing I found was a note at the end in Corva's handwriting, insufficient explanation. Kiara had gotten a C which told me Corva had been really tough on us this time. Kiara never got anything less than straight A's. Kiara frowned at her paper, but her eyes pleaded with me not to say anything. Too late. My hand shot into the air. Lady Corva, excuse me. I think there's been a mistake. Corva's lips tightened as she stared at me. 
Mistake? I think not, Miss Sosna. You have earned the grade I think you deserve. But it's not fair, I insisted. I cited everything from our textbook and from the noted materials in the library that you put on the syllabus. Is there anything I can do to earn a higher grade? Corva's mouth upturned in delight. I'm afraid not. I understand people with your condition cannot aptly perform the duties most students can handle. I'm sorry to say that your disease has gotten in the way of your learning, and unfortunately, this is the best I find you capable of doing. Perhaps your time would be better spent in a hospital instead of a university. My face drained of color as Corva outed me to the entire classroom. Kiara froze. The other girls in the class gasped. Corva gave a devious smirk as my classmates began to whisper, Disease? What's Corva talking about? Is Emma sick? No one knew I had CVID. No one but my family, my friends, and my teachers, who had been alerted to my condition by the school's disability office. At least, that's how it had been a few seconds ago. Now the entire class knew, and it wouldn't take long for word to spread. I could already hear people typing on their phones as they texted my business to the world. News that I had a rare illness would be around the school before lunchtime. Helena had her hand over her mouth. Gosh, Emma, do you have cancer? We feel so sorry for you, her partner purred. Is your life even worth living? Because I'd kill myself if I had to deal with all that. I so couldn't have a disease. A girl across from me leaned in. It's not anything contagious, right? Like, you can't give it to the rest of us, I hope? We all knew there was something wrong with Emma. She lost the contest because she's weak, and this proves it, Morgan said from the front. It makes sense she hangs out with freaks like Kiara Malersky. Melissa giggled. Emma probably gave Kiara what's all over her face. Kiara stood up from the desk. Her chair knocked backward. You're going to have something all over your face if you don't shut up, she cried, raising her hand. A yellow spell gleamed in her fingers, and Melissa lurched back. It was so crazy to see Kiara like that. She never stood up to bullies, but apparently she would if it was to defend me. Miss Malarski, I won't tolerate this in my classroom. Sit down, Corva barked. Of course Corva was taking the side of the bullies. She hated supporting anyone who was different. My cheeks were burning. I was so embarrassed. The minute Corva's back was turned, I grabbed my things and ran out of the classroom. A couple of laughs followed me out, but I ignored them. I ran down the steps of the Illusion Tower as quickly as I could. I didn't stop running until I'd gotten to the inner courtyard. It was abandoned. I sat on the stone bench beside the pool and tried not to bawl. Corva had told my secret to the entire world, and it wouldn't cease with the school. The papers knew I was back with Ethan. They'd done a five-page spread about it in last week's magazine. They were going to have a field day once they found out about my CVID. And they would find out. They'd do some digging, and if they couldn't come up with the facts, they'd make something up. Emma! I heard Kiara's voice. Her books were nearly tumbling out of her hands. She'd grab them in a hurry to catch up with me. She sat down beside me, breathing heavily. There was a small cut on her head, just above her eye that was draining blood. Kiara, are you okay? I asked. Had Morgan tossed a spell at her? I tripped and fell down the stairs when I was running after you. It's merely a scratch, Kiara insisted. Don't bother with it. I'm concerned about you. You should go back to class, I said as I wiped my tears away. Corva's going to punish you for ditching class. I hardly cared if Corva gave me detention for fleeing her classroom. There was nothing worse than what she just did. Battleaxe Corva can go to hell, Kiara raged. Telling others about a disabled person's condition is like exposing a person's sexuality when they're not ready. It's forcing them to come out. Corva needs to face penalties by the school board. She won't, you know that. Elijah's her son, I sighed. Something at the edge of my senses tightened and panicked. Ethan had found out. He was reaching through the bond, asking where I was. I sent a mental picture to him of the courtyard. I felt him shift, running to me as fast as he could. 
If Ethan knew, I bet everyone else did too. I felt so defeated. I was already treated like shit because I was shunned. This would make it worse. A white wolf stalked through the entryway to the courtyard. Ethan shifted back and reached out to give me a hug. I'm sorry, Onawaka. Corva will hear about this, even if it's only from me. I don't care about getting revenge. My secret's out now, I said. I just wanted everyone to believe I was normal, and that's over. But you're not normal, Em. You never have been, Kiara said. You're a stronger sorceress than all of us. This doesn't define who you are. You know how the Fae work. People are going to say I'm cursed by the gods because I'm sick, I stated. So prove them wrong, Ethan insisted. He grabbed my shoulders and squeezed tight. Yes, there's nothing you can do about the situation now that the news has broken. But we must do something to turn this into a positive. The puck has been passed to you. How are you going to respond? His words made my mind work. Yes, Corva had taken my chance away to tell the world about my illness on my own terms, but I had the opportunity to take advantage of it. My grandmother's lessons had been focused on creating positive intent out of even the worst situations. How could I turn this thing around? Then it clicked. Vara had connections. She worked for the annual Arcania as a student reporter. And I bet an exclusive for Malovia's most hated woman was something they'd ate right up. I steeled my tone. Corva took away my choice to come out, but she didn't take away my dignity. I'm not ashamed to be who I am. If everyone knows I'm sick, I might as well use it to bolster my position. What do you need us to do? Ethan asked. Find Vera. Tell her I want to meet up as soon as possible, I said. It's time I took my illness back into my own hands. I was waiting in the journalism classroom when Vara walked in. Ethan was holding my hand for support. He wasn't sure if this was the right move, because he knew the press could be ruthless, but he stood beside me in my decision. And I knew in my heart this is what I wanted. Vara looked me up and down. Wow, Emma. This is really brave. Are you sure you want to do this? I stood from my chair, dressed in my day clothes. My infusion pump hung off my shoulder. Four lines went straight to my stomach, infusing my medicine into my system. Absolutely. I want to do an interview, and I want to do a photo shoot with my medical pump. That is, if the annual Arcania is interested. Vara gave a psh noise. Are you kidding me? They offered a huge payment for an article that was ready for tomorrow's paper. I don't need the money. I just need someone to tell my story, I said. Vara sat across from me. She took out a pencil and a notebook from her bag, setting it in front of her and placing her glasses over her silver eyes. If you're ready, we can begin now. Can you start by giving me a quick summary of your disability? This was an easy one. Common variable immune deficiency disorder is an antibody deficiency that leaves the immune system incapable of fighting off against bacteria and viruses. It's very rare and is treated with antibiotics, as well as an infusion of human plasma, which contains antibodies that people like me need. Vara looked up. Just to be clear, because I know stupid people are going to ask this, you aren't stealing people's blood through dark magic, correct? The plasma is donated through centers by volunteers, where it's taken to a processing center and made into medicine. Yes, there's nothing magical about it. It's all medical, and volunteers make the choice to donate their own plasma. They aren't forced. I wasn't offended by Vara's question. If anything, I appreciated she was thinking of all the angles to make my story fair. And it's not contagious, I'm assuming. No. From what I've read, it's mostly hereditary, though sometimes people can develop it without it being in their family line, I said. I probably have a relative in my ancestry who has a history of CVID that I don't know about. The problem is in my DNA, some sort of genetic mutation. I can't give something like that to people. Vara nodded. It's different from diseases like AIDS, correct? Yes. AIDS is an acquired immunodeficiency syndrome that's caused by a virus. CVID is a primary immune disease, which means it's a deficiency within the immune system. It's not an autoimmune condition where the body attacks itself, though people with CVID can develop autoimmune issues. Vara wrote something down in her notepad. So, personally, 
What precautions in your daily life do you have to take that most people don't even think twice about? That was a loaded question. I didn't know how to summarize. There's so much. I have to be careful with how much I do in a day. I only have so much energy. If I push myself too hard, I'll be in bed the next day and be unable to get up. I have to evaluate how far a walk is and if I can make it that day. I have to be very aware with my food intake and check everything that goes into my meals so it doesn't make me sick. I have to make sure I have my medicine with me at all times and take it at regular intervals. And I have to be extremely cautious when I go into public places. Anyone could be carrying a virus that might kill me. I stay away from crowds and sanitize as much as possible. Sometimes I'll wear a mask if I have to go somewhere that's really busy, so my risk of getting infected goes down. Being at a university makes staying well tough, but I deal with it by washing my hands a lot and by exercising whenever I can. That was just a taste, but I felt if I kept going, we'd be here all day. Vara nodded and said, So, do you have to take precautions with certain things, like be careful around smoke? I haven't developed asthma yet, though it is common for CVID patients. We have chronic lung issues. I do have a sensitivity to smoke, and I can't tolerate extreme temperatures, especially extremely hot days. I get very sick if I'm in the sun for too long. I also have a lot of digestive issues. Since the immune system is based in the gut, I have to tailor my diet so I don't get really ill and end up puking back what I ate. Uh, sorry, that's too much info. Not at all. Vara scribbled on her notepad. Have you developed any secondary conditions? Nothing that's diagnosed yet, but I'm sure I have some, I said. I have a lot of pain when I move and when I sleep. My muscles get very tender and stiff. I have to take pain relievers often, use heating pads, take hot baths. Truth be told, there are a couple times when the pain is unbearable and nothing helps to ease it. Some days I can barely move. It really sucks when I'm on the ice and I can hardly skate around the rink. You're a skater, right? Vara asked. How do you handle being an athlete and having a rare illness at the same time? It's a huge misconception that disabled people can't be athletes, I said. Does my illness get in the way of my skating? Yes. But I still push myself to be the best skater that I can be on the days when I actually can. I don't need to meet other people's expectations, only my own. In the end, the only person I'm truly competing against is myself. She nodded like that was a good answer. Okay, this might be a tough one. Do you think your disease makes you a stronger person emotionally and gives you more love for yourself? Her question made me pause. No one had ever asked me that before. I really had to think about it. After a moment, I said, yes, I think so. I've had to deal with things most people never have to at a very young age. There are parts about my disease that would devastate others, but to me, it's just routine. I can handle tough times easier because I've already been through so much. When you're diagnosed with a rare illness, all the small stuff ceases to matter. It really forces you to look at life from a different perspective. I'm not the best at loving myself, but I'm trying. I know I do what I can every day and I'm learning to accept that's good enough. Before, I struggled to find value in myself. Now I realize just how precious every moment is. Sometimes I forget that. But when I really stop and force myself to look at my life from the eyes of the gods instead of the eyes of the world, it's magical what I've achieved. I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. What's the most difficult part about it? Vara asked. I took a breath. The hardest part of my disease isn't the disease itself. It's how people treat me. Even if you're close to me, if you love me, you can never truly understand what I'm going through. But being here and helping me to accommodate my needs makes all the difference. I know that some people in society don't think I have any worth. I think that just pushes me to find the value in myself. Ethan's look was proud and full of affection. It made me feel so loved. Vara asked me a few more questions, mostly about my infusion and how it worked. She closed her notebook, then took a professional camera out of her bag. Okay, if you want to do the photo shoot, I agree that we should take pictures of your infusion. 
It shows you're not trying to hide anything. That means taking your shirt off if you're comfortable with that. I was wearing a lacy black bra underneath my shirt that functioned more like a cut-off top. It's not like I needed Ethan's permission, but I glanced at him anyway. I'm not stopping you, he said. Do what you feel is best. Well, that meant stripping down. I took off my shirt, then laid it aside, exposing the butterfly needles in my stomach and the medical tubing. Vara pointed to a white screen that was set up on the other side of the classroom. I stood in front of it, feeling more exposed than I would be naked in the black bra, jeans, and tennis shoes. Vara put a finger to her lips as she contemplated my look. Can you take your infusion pump out of your bag? I want to see you pose with it, you know, strong and tall. This was a lot. I felt my courage waver as I took my pump out and tossed the bag to the side, but Vara nodded. Yes, that's just it. Act natural. I'm going to snap a couple of pictures. I felt pretty silly at first. Ethan watched me as I stood with the pump, keeping it at my side as Vara took shot after shot. She posed me a few times, and I felt self-conscious about the needles that were obviously a focal point. What if people saw the pictures and thought I was a freak? But as time went on, I began to love it. I loosened up. I felt a smile cross my face. And as Vara encouraged me to take silly shots, I laughed. I blew a couple kisses to the camera, and Vara even brought out a fan to blow back my hair. It felt like goofing around more than an actual photo shoot. You look so relaxed and at ease. My editors are going to love this, Vara gushed. She put away her camera and said, I'll make you sound good, Emma, trust me. Don't worry about what people will say. After tomorrow, Malovia will know a whole new you. Vara left. Once she did, the bravery I felt wavered. I wondered what the hell I'd just done. Was I going to regret this? What did you think? I asked Ethan as I slipped my shirt back on. The photo shoot felt over the top. To be honest, it was kind of sexy, Ethan confessed. I love a woman who has confidence. I feel confident now. What if I make a fool of myself? I asked. You had good answers, Ethan assured me. If people don't like it, that's their fault. They're too stupid to see the brilliance of my own Awilka. Ethan's words were comforting, but I really hoped they were true. Yet this was a part of me. If the rest of the world didn't like it, that was too bad, because I did. I didn't need Malovia to accept me. I accepted me, just as I was. I smirked. Whatever happened, it would all be worth it to think of Lady Corva's face when she saw me half-naked on the front page of the paper tomorrow morning. I could hardly wait. Chapter 19 Ethan The moment the news article broke about Emma, it took Malovia by storm. Papers were flying off the shelves. People were reading it everywhere. The online comments had numbered in the hundreds. Emma didn't look at them, and I didn't bother myself with them either. We didn't need the opinions of others. Our own were all that mattered. We were sitting in the student cafe, discussing the article. On the annual Arcania's front page was a picture of Emma, standing tall with her infusion pump and looking brazen as I ever knew her. It was very sexy. I was attracted to women who were bold, and Emma had just taken a huge step. What Lady Corva did to her was absolutely dismal, but my Ona Vilke had turned a negative into a positive, and I couldn't be prouder of her. I think your plan actually worked, Kiara said to Emma. Some people were offended by what you said, but so many are supportive. How can people be offended by what I said? I didn't even try this time, Emma complained. Well, there were a couple of comments from old people how it wasn't proper that you told your business to the entire world, Stefan said as he scrolled through his phone. Said you should keep it private and all that. But besides those elderly bags, everyone else said it was cool how open you were. I don't think everyone's happy about it, Delmare snickered, and she held up her phone to point at the online social media rankings. Emma's article was ranking number one in Malovian news, while news about Gabby and Elijah's latest edict was second. Oh, that's gotta piss them off, Alexei said in glee. 
Especially Gabby, Kiara gushed. I bet she's fuming. What's their new edict about, anyway? Emma said, turning to me. I sighed. Well, it's not exactly a good thing, but we don't have to worry about any protests at the Yuletide event this December. Eli passed a decree this morning, making the right to assembly illegal. Really? Emma raised an eyebrow. So Eli's way of dealing with the protests is just shutting them down? Yeah, that's all he knows how to do. Pass laws. The man can't compromise. I set down my tea. Never liked coffee. My mother had more or less forced me to enjoy tea, and now I drank it out of habit more than anything else. How Emma could stomach the strong stuff was beyond me. Delmare drummed her fingers on the table. How long before Elijah goes after free speech or the right to a free press? He's got the press in his pocket and hardly matters, Stefan said. It does matter, I said sternly. Emma's article ran because it's trendy and people like gossip. But I'm sure if Eli or Gabby had heard about it before it was published, they would have forced the paper to pull it. Our news isn't reliable if the king and queen are quashing any useful information to the people. I sat back. But... Regardless, it's not our concern. We need to focus on finding the stones. Emma's face was curious. Really? You're letting it go that easily? I promised you I'd change, Ona Vilke, and change for the better. I'm keeping my promise, I said, as I grasped her hand. I've ceased to be obsessed with what the monarchy is doing. Eli is no longer my priority. Emma smiled and moved nearer to me. My insides continued to warm. It was like we were growing closer every passing second. Despite what we'd gone through, our walls had come down, and what we'd been through had only helped to make us stronger. I was so attached to her now, I couldn't think unless my thoughts were of her. The overpowering feelings I felt for Emma were animalistic. These days, I felt more wolf than man, and there was no place I'd rather be. Odette raced into the café, her pink knitted hat bobbing on her head as she waddled to us. Her blonde hair was matted with snowflakes as she flung herself onto the table and gave a dramatic gulp of air. Guys, we found it! We found it! Odette exclaimed, cheeks bright and nose pink against the cold. Theo came stumbling after her, trying to breathe. You found what? Emma asked. We think we discovered the thing, Theo hissed glancing around. We should go right now. His tone was urgent. We barely shared a glance before all of us snagged our coats. We followed Odette and Theo outside, where a heavy snowfall was coating campus. Chunks of snowflakes trickled down, making snowbanks that were three feet high or more. Where are we going? I asked, as Theo led us beyond the university gates and into the forest. I'm assuming you found the alicorn stone? We did, or at least we think so, Theo said in a rush. Odette and I brainstormed, and I think her visions have been leading us to it all along. We can't have overlooked it this whole time, Stefan argued. Yes, we did. The pool of memory showed me a stone gate, remember? Theo asked. I knew it had to be the location of the Alicorn Court. I went looking for it after we returned. I found it, and thought the gate might act as a portal to where the Alicorn Court is, but it didn't work. I tried passing through the gate over and over, but nothing happened. I figured the portal was dead. If it didn't transport you anywhere, isn't it? Emma asked. Theo shook his head. No, the stone gate is a trick. I kept on ruminating on what Lady Iris told us. The gate will open when you discover the door. It didn't make any sense at first, until I realized the riddle was actually a clue, instructions on how to find the court. I went to the stone gate, thinking it might be a portal, but I didn't believe it was one. Lucian said for fey magic to manifest, you have to believe the spell will work, or it won't. If we believe this time, the portal might appear, Emma breathed. Theo, you're a genius. And it's an excellent way for the Alicorn Court to hide their location, I added. Someone looking for the court might come across the gate, but if they don't have faith that the gate is an actual passageway, they'll never find what they're looking for. Exactly. Theo increased his pace to nearly a jog. We ran for about 30 minutes. Then the trees parted, 
and all of us looked up as we came face to face with a large round gate. The gate was completely made of stone and surrounded by ruins. It was big enough for an alicorn to pass through in their shifter form. Theo and Odette stopped in front of the gate. We gathered around them until Emma spoke up. Wait, the rest of us should hold back. Why? Alexi asked. Because this is the entrance to the alicorn court. I bet only alicorns can open the gate, like how Stefan and Delmare were the only two who could get past the ward to retrieve the dragonstone, Emma said. Maybe the gate only opens for alicorns. Fair point, Theo acknowledged. Everyone stand back. The rest of us stood a good twelve feet or so away from the gate, so it wouldn't detect our presence as Theo and Odette faced the stone circle. Theo observed the gate calmly, like he knew the portal would materialize in front of him. Odette, though, quickly grew frustrated. Her cheeks turned red, and they puffed out as she attempted to imagine the portal manifesting and failed. It's not working, Odette said in frustration, and she stamped her foot. I knew it was too good to be true. You have to believe, Odette, Theo encouraged. Try again. He took her hand. With the gesture, Odette's expression cleared, and she gazed up at Theo in a semblance of purity. Innocence flashed across her face, and Theo's kind eyes melted. A portal in front of them blossomed. It opened up within the circle of the stone gate, glowing a bright pink hue and concealing what lay beyond. Odette gasped and dropped Theo's hand. She began jumping up and down. Oh my gods! We did it! Can the rest of us get through? Delmare asked. She stepped closer, but the portal didn't close. I think so, now that we opened it, Theo said. Follow us. We don't know where it's going to take us. I can get us back, I'm sure, Emma said. Let's hope, I said. Emma and I fell in line behind Theo and Odette, and the others gathered around us. I held my breath as I walked through the portal, hoping that it would take us to the Alicorn Court, and not a place where we'd end up trapped. When I stepped out of the portal, it was like entering into another world. The eight of us gasped in unison as we turned in place, trying to take in what we were looking at. The grass below our feet was amethyst, while the skies lit up a teal blue with a sapphire sun that gave everything a cool glow. Around us grew turquoise willow trees, and a river of silver rushed by. I could hear the tweeting of birds echoing against stone walls as we gazed up at a palace made of clear quartz. We were in some kind of courtyard, in a fairyland I did not know by name. Look, Kiara pointed, and through the fog a figure emerged. She was wearing a soft velvet robe that draped behind her, a crown that looked like it was made of starlight upon her feathery hair. Lady Iris! Theo's eyes widened as she approached. The lines in her face creased, and she smiled. Hello, Theodore. Odette. She greeted them kindly like a mother would. You have passed the first test. Welcome to the land of the Alicorn Court. Theo stuttered. Y you You're one of them! Yes, I have Draika blood. My mother, my grandmother, and her mother before her have all served on the court, Iris said. It was my duty, since I was a little girl. I'm so glad that you finally found us. I wish I could have led you here myself, but the magical oath I took to the court years ago prevented me from telling you of its location. But no matter, here you are. Where are we? Emma asked as she looked around. You are inside an illusion, a creation of our own minds, Lady Iris said. Many years prior, the first Draika combined their powers to manifest another realm, a place where the Alicorn Court could conference in solitude. Through the ages, this place has been sustained by the magic of the court. So long as one member of the Alicorn Court is still alive, this place will continue to exist. So you made another world? Are you gods? Odette squeaked. Lady Iris smiled, like the idea was humorous. We are not gods. This castle and its surroundings are all that we have the power to create. Although, unlike back on Earth, food does not nourish here, 
and drink does not sustain us. We can only remain within the confines of the illusion for so long before we must return to Melovia. These days, the court only uses this place for meetings, and to hide our most precious treasure. Lady Iris turned. She wound through the courtyard, and we began following her as she led us up a winding set of steps that went inside the castle. Once we were within the castle, I saw that the insides were bare. There was nothing within except the gleaming clear quartz that made up the building, cast blue by the light of the sapphire moon. Lady Iris began to explain as she led us down the hallway. The goddess Neva, the spectre doe of shadow, entrusted the alicorn court with the alicorn stone, believing we would bestow it upon those who needed it the most. For centuries the court has kept it hidden here, and it has waited all this time for you. She inclined her head to Emma. You knew we were looking for the stone, Emma said. How? Each of us has the ability to see into the future, Miss Sosna. It is in our Draika blood, and the requirement of being on the court, Iris said. We know you are the world, Weaver, and need the crystals of harmony to reopen the portal to Edmire. Why couldn't you just give us the alicorn stone if you knew we were looking for it? Theo asked. It's not that simple. Lady Iris shook her head. A fae has to show they have the qualities that exemplify the stone. It is the way the magic works. The alicorn stone will not permit us to simply hand it over to you. You have to first find it, and then prove that you are worthy of it. It is the power that the gods set upon the crystals before they scattered them across the two worlds. Every crystal of harmony must be earned. So how do we prove we're worthy? Emma asked. You don't, Iris said. Only an alicorn, or should I say, alicorns, can harness the alicorn stone. Her gaze turned to Theo and Odette. Her meaning was clear. This was a test they would have to endure alone. Theo laced his fingers with Odette's. He grasped her hand tightly as he said, What must we do? There is a trial to obtain the alicorn stone, set by the members of the court. Iris said, We will use our magic against you to test your worthiness. If you pass, the alicorn stone will be yours. If you don't, well, let's not talk about that. A trial? Odette squeaked. Her eyes grew wide with fear. Yes, and there is no time to prepare, Lady Iris said. If you wish to obtain the alicorn stone, you have no choice but to fight. Chapter 20 Emma Now? Like, right this second now? Theo and Odette were thinking the same thing I was. They glanced at each other, and Lady Ira said, Neither of you should be worried. Should you exemplify the trait of the Alicorn Stone, you will pass the trial. Is it dangerous? Odette asked. Oh, very, Ira said. But I'm certain it's something you can handle. Lady Iris led us to a large, circular room that appeared to be in the middle of a quartz castle. Inside there was a staircase that spanned down to an arena. Around the arena was a balcony where spectators could watch the challenge below. In the center of the arena was a tall pillar with a jeweled box that perched on the top. It was very similar to the box the Dragonstone had come in. I bet anything the Alicorn Stone was inside. Four other Draika were stationed around the room. All of them looked very old and were wearing the same velvet robe and starlight crown Lady Iris had. There appeared to be five fairies on the court, though I only knew Lady Iris. What is the test? Theo asked as we stopped at the head of the staircase. Challengers are not allowed to know what they will face before the trial begins, Lady Iris said. You must go into it blind and have faith that you will succeed in your quest. That was asking a lot. Who knew what they'd face down there? Monsters? Magic? Maybe even something they couldn't handle? Odette moved closer to Theo, and he ran a hand through her hair. Theo, I don't want this. I'm scared. I'm scared too, but I'm with you. We can't give in, he said. He hugged her and pressed his lips to the top of her head. I felt very guilty. 
You guys don't have to do this for me, I said. We can turn back. No, we can't. Theo faced me. This isn't just about you, Em. If we don't do this, all of Faye kind will be destroyed. Odette and I won't let that happen if there's something we can do about it. Odette sniffed, but she nodded. Okay, I'm ready. Theo changed into an alicorn and bowed his head to her. Climb on my back. Odette clambered on. She clung to Theo's mane as he carried her down the stairs to the middle of the arena. Lady Iris left us to sweep around the balcony and stand at the circle's head. The rest of us lined up around the balcony's edge and held on tightly, fearing what the court had in store for our friends. Lady Iris's voice boomed above the arena. Theodore Antov, Odette Oksana, are you ready to accept the challenge before you to claim the Alicorn Stone? We are, Theo and Odette said in unison. Lady Iris's expression was somber. Then let this be a test of your faith. A table of apples appeared in front of Theo. There were three, all identical in shape and form. Theo's nostrils flared, and Ethan leaned in. The apples are poisoned, he said. I can smell them from here. One of them's not, Alexei objected. Theo's got to pick out the right one. Theo's nose moved over the apples as he smelled them. His head weaved back and forth, as if he wasn't sure which one to pick. Minutes passed, and nervousness welled in my gut. What if Theo guessed wrong and accidentally poisoned himself? Odette's complexion grew paler and paler with every passing second as Theo sniffed the apples. Even as a shifter, he was clearly confused. Eventually, Theo settled on the middle apple. Theo tried to eat it, but his mouth went right through it. He attempted to push the apple off the table with his nose to no avail. Odette slid off of Theo's back and reached out. The apple became solid as she grasped it with her fingers. Theo gave a wild snort and Kiara whispered, Odette has to eat it. Odette hesitated. She wasn't sure if Theo had made the right choice. She parted her lips to ask if Theo was sure, but the second Odette's grip tightened on the apple, a wicked roar shook the floor of the arena. My heart plummeted as I realized a monster had spawned near the staircase of the arena, preventing escape. The monster was humanoid. It balanced on two cloven hoofs before it came down on all fours, stalking around the arena like a gorilla. Its hands were scaly and rough, hooked with terrifying claws that were at least a foot long. It had a goat-like face, one red eye in the middle of its forehead, and jagged teeth emitting in every direction from its mouth. Two curled horns rose from its skull, each of them just as big as Theo was. It's a fiend, Ethan said, recoiling from the balcony in revulsion. Around me, my friends grimaced in similar displeasure. I felt absolutely terrified for them. The fiend was just as scary, if not more so, than the bees Ethan and I had faced in the contest. Odette and Theo could be killed. Theo planted himself in front of Odette and brayed, like a stallion protecting his mare. He stomped the ground three times as if warning the fiend to stay back. The fiend charged. It lowered its horns, and Theo had to gallop out of the way to avoid being hit. The fiend slammed into the quartz wall and pieces went flying off, filling the arena with dust. Odette coughed, and the fiend shook its head. It noticed her for the first time, and its red eyes sparked. The fiend charged again. Odette was frozen to the spot, form shaking in terror as the fiend went to run her down. Her knuckles went white as she clutched the apple in her hand. Odette, get out of the way! I screamed, but she didn't hear me. She was so scared she couldn't move. Theo let out a scream. He charged and put his head down. His horn slammed into the fiend's side just before he got to Odette, and the fiend was flung to the other end of the arena. Theo stood heaving, gathering his strength while the fiend crashed against the wall. The fiend snorted and got up, shaking off dust. My jaw dropped. Even though Theo's horn had punctured the fiend's side, it didn't look like it'd been hurt or even stabbed. There was no blood or wound to observe. Theo galloped up to the fiend. He struck out with his hoof and slammed it into the fiend's cheek, hard enough to break its jaw. The fiend hissed, but no wound. Theo's eyes widened. 
He backed away, shaking his head in disbelief as steam poured from the fiend's nostrils. What the hell is going on? Why can't Theo kill it? I asked. Fiends usually have impenetrable shields connected to objects. Probably that fucking apple. It'll be unstoppable until Odette eats it, Stefan said quickly. But if it's the wrong one, it'll kill her! I yelled. It seemed they didn't have a choice. The fiend's eye grew bright red, and Theo pivoted to gallop away. From the fiend's jaws emitted a red ray of magic. It blasted into the floor and created a huge hole. The fiend continued firing off its magic. Theo's hoofs slipped on the quartz, and he almost fell down in a desperate attempt to escape, though in the circular arena there was nowhere to go. As the fiend chased Theo around the room, Odette watched in terror. When the fiend lunged out with its giant teeth, Odette gave a cry. She flung out her hand to bloom a shield around Theo to protect him. But the fiend shattered through her illusion, breaking it like glass and sending pieces of her shield everywhere. One of them flew across the room, and Odette cried out as she fell to her knees. Blood spurted from a fresh cut underneath her eye. Not even Odette's shields could stop it. Odette tried more spells. She created miniature shields, like bubbles, and fired them off at the fiend in a powerful beam. Yet her bubble beam merely smashed against the fiend's side and bounced off. Members of the Alicorn Court had to duck aside as Odette's bubbles burst against the court's columns, exploding like bombs. Nothing worked. The fiend was just too strong. The monster lashed out with its claws and struck Theo in the side. Theo gave a whinny of pain as a gash opened up on his stomach and on his flank. Blood droplets coated the floor, and my hands immediately went to my mouth. Theo hadn't been mortally wounded, but one more hit like that and he would be. Theo spun around to face the fiend, jabbing out with his horn. The fiend hissed and backed away, though it didn't stop the attack. It only paused for a moment before letting out a roar that knocked Theo down. Theo scrambled to get back on his hoofs, only to narrowly get away before the fiend's claws gutted him from the inside out. Oh, Dad! Theo screamed. He was backed against the corner, pawing out with his hoofs frantically as he tried to keep the monster off of him. The fiend gave an ugly, guttural laugh that scared me to my core. That thing, it wasn't animal. It was evil. Tears were streaming down Odette's cheeks as she realized Theo was pinned. Without hesitation, Odette took a bite out of the apple. She chewed and quickly swallowed. It was then the monster stopped charging. It gave a shriek and collapsed onto the floor, twisting in pain. Theo saw an opening. He plunged forward with his horn, stabbing it into the monster's front. The fiend gave a roar of agony as Theo's horn pierced its heart. The alicorn drew back his horn, and it was dripping black with the fiend's blood. The fiend snarled a few times before its breaths grew quick, and then the monster's eyes rolled back in its head as it died. I let out a whoosh of breath that almost made me lightheaded. Once the fiend died, it disappeared as quickly as it come. It vanished on the spot, leaving only the trail of its black blood behind. Theo! Odette dropped the bitten apple and ran forward. He saw her coming and transformed back into a man. She caught him before he collapsed on the floor. Are you all right? Odette screeched. Theo was holding his side. Blood was dripping from his fingers and soaking through his clothes. I'm okay, Theo gasped. Give it a few minutes for the wound to close up. Carefully, Odette moved Theo's hand aside and lifted his sweater. Before our eyes, the wound the fiend had given him began to mend together. The skin stitched tightly, stopping the bleeding. Theo still moved gingerly, like he was in pain. His shifter healing abilities had been all that had saved him. If the fiend had cut any deeper, he'd be a gunner. What did the apple taste like? Theo grabbed Odette's shoulders, observing her worryingly. Was there anything bad? Odette shook her head. No, it tasted normal. Theo glanced back at the table. He relaxed as he saw the two other apples had vanished. They'd gotten lucky. Odette had eaten the right one. Theo pulled Odette to his front and held her, form shaking like he had been terrified she could be poisoned. 
Odette's blue eyes swam as she hugged Theo, staring out in disbelief. Odette turned from Theo and walked toward the box which held the alicorn stone. She yanked at the top of the box, but it didn't open. Odette glanced upward to the alicorn court, yet the council made no move to give her any direction. What happened? Did they fail the test? Alexia asked. Delmer leaned forward. Before I earned the dragon stone, I had to be brave enough to admit to Stefan that I loved him. The alicorn stone is a crystal of faith. Odette has to prove she has faith in Theo before the box will open. So there are always two parts to the test, Kiara murmured. I knew she had to be thinking of her own challenge when we'd go looking for the griffin stone, but that wouldn't happen at all if Odette didn't pass this test now. Odette stared at Theo, wondering what was going on. There was a great flash of light in the middle of the room, erupting from the box. It radiated outward, beaming like the sun and feeling ten times as bright. The rest of us had to look away. Odette fell to the floor, shielding her eyes and letting out a yell. When the light was gone, I rubbed my face in a daze. Spots danced in front of my eyes as I saw Odette look up. Her gaze widened as she saw that there were not one, but two Theos. Both Theos were identical. I couldn't tell them apart. It was like looking at twins. Both Theos gaped at each other, expressions paralyzed with shock. They even had the same injury from the fiend, blood staining their matching sweaters. Odette glanced upward at the alicorn court again, but they said nothing. She looked back and forth between the two Theos, trying to figure out which was her friend. The Theo on the right stepped forward. Odette, it's me. I'm Theo. No, I'm Theo, the man on the left pleaded. He sounded identical to the first. You have to believe me, Odette. So this was the final test. She had to pick the right one. But they were so identical, I couldn't tell which Theo was real and which was the illusion. Then the Theo on the left flickered, and I knew. He had to be the illusion. The real Theo was on the right. But I think both Theos must have remained solid for Odette, because she blinked blankly. I searched the eyes of the Alicorn Court. I saw one woman mumbling something under her breath and I knew she was the one who was casting the spell. We could see the falsities, but down there in the arena, the magic held strong. Odette couldn't tell. Odette drummed her fingers on her arms. One of you has to be lying. Tell me, how did we meet? The true Theo opened his mouth. Ballet class. I was the only boy. I was hiding in the corner until you took my hand and pulled me to the bar. I never stopped dancing since. Okay, Odette said, but she stared at him like she wasn't quite sure he was the true Theo. She turned to the fake one. And if you're the real Theo, you should be able to tell me what we were doing last Saturday. Cuddling in the loft, fake Theo responded. You told me you didn't know what you wanted. I didn't know that had happened, but apparently it did, because the real Theo's face flashed and hurt. The fake Theo appeared to have all the memories the real one did. Odette chewed her lip. She conjured her bubble spell again, and shot it out of both hands. Her bubble stream struck both Theos at once, and they cried out simultaneously. The illusion spell was so strong, it made the fake Theo solid. Odette ran her fingers through the arms of both boys, and her hand didn't go through either. Odette backed away and stamped her foot. This is impossible! How am I supposed to do this? Odette, you know me! Theo burst. How can you not tell that I'm right in front of you? What are you talking about? I've always been here, fake Theo argued. Don't listen to him. He doesn't understand you. I understand her better than you think, Theo snapped. He looked seconds away from punching his own self in the face. Stop! This isn't helping me make a decision. Odette paced back and forth, hands shaking with anxiety. Odette, you must know it's me. Fake Theo moved to grab her hand, but Odette yanked it away. I've always been there for you. I even gave up dancing for you. That's not true, Odette. I gave up dancing because I needed a break. It was too much, Theo argued. It had nothing to do with you. You were there when your mom said I'd have to find another partner if I wanted to continue ballet, Fake Theo said. To be honest, I kind of want to go back. You'd be okay with that, right? You wouldn't stop me from pursuing my dream because you don't want to dance anymore? 
Odette's gaze flickered to the side, like this was something that had haunted her for months and plagued her with guilt. That's not true. I'd never dance with anyone but you, Odette, Dale pleaded. We've been partners since we were six. I wouldn't give that away. Odette's eyes moved from left to right, unsure who to believe. The cruel truth slapped me in the face. The fake Theo was telling Odette everything she feared, everything she already believed. The real Theo spoke the truth, but words Odette wasn't sure she could have faith in. Odette would put her faith in one or the other, her fears or her love and that she'd chosen her fear up until this point had me very worried she'd make the wrong decision now. Gods, Melana, help her. She needs it. The true Theo thinks we have a mating bond. I want to know why, Odette said. Someone better start explaining. Fake Theo launched into a tirade before our Theo could speak. Being together would be easy, he said. We know each other so well, and I want to take care of you. But if we're bonded... Doesn't that put our friendship at risk? Odette, the reason I took so long to tell you was because I was afraid of losing you. I can't let you go if we don't work out. So maybe it's okay if we don't try at all, because I can't stand to lose my best friend. Odette nodded, and my heart fell. That was exactly what she wanted to hear. It wasn't very far off from what Theo had actually said before. The real Theo stepped in front of her. No. That's not good enough anymore, he insisted roughly. I thought like that months ago, but my stance has changed. Being afraid of losing you isn't enough to ebb the pain of not having you as my mate. Then I know you can't be the real Theo, Odette shot at him, and my heart broke. My Theo would never take a risk. I'm taking one now! We kissed in the alleyway. Don't deny it, you know we did, Theo said as Odette looked away. You have feelings for me too. And those feelings are too strong to keep denying. It doesn't matter what I feel. What do you think, Odette? What do you want? Do you want to be my mate? It's a little too late for that now, Odette snapped, and she whirled on him. You made me wait so long that I just gave up. I'm sorry, Theo begged. But you can't have truly given up, because you still love me. If you didn't, we wouldn't be here. Odette looked to the fake Theo, and he said, See? This is what it would look like if we were together. Do you really think something like that can work out? Theo snarled and faced his doppelganger. I hate you so goddamn much. You were too much of a coward to put your heart out there. Theo ran a hand through his hair. And now that you were, I might have lost everything. Fake Theo didn't give a reaction. It was just as well, because our Theo was falling apart. Odette crossed her arms as she stepped between the two boys. This isn't getting anywhere. I need hard truths. If we were to be together for real, what would be the worst part of it? What would make you leave if things got really tough? Fake Theo scratched his head. I mean, I do love you, but you're kind of needy. I don't know if I could handle being suffocated all the time. Odette flinched. It was the same kind of shit Igor spouted at her, that she was too desperate. Odette was terrified of repeating the mistakes of the past. Had Igor hurt her so badly she believed she was too annoying to be with? Odette's gaze connected with the true Theo. His tone steeled as he said, You know what would be the hardest part of being with you? Watching you walk away. Because that's what I've been doing for the past three years, and I just can't do it anymore. Every step you take away from me is another ocean we're farther apart. Theo's voice began to waver. Odette... I will always be here for whatever you need. You have to believe me when I say that I love you. I've always loved you, and I always will. I can't sit here and promise you that there will never be any hard times, because there will. I can't say I'll never hurt you, because people make mistakes. But I can promise I will never hurt you on purpose, and I will never walk away from you. A tear ran down his face as he took a shuddering breath. For God's sakes, don't be the one to walk away this time. Try. Just try. Odette's face cleared. The confusion left her eyes. In one fluid movement, she spun around to face fake Theo and said, You're not real. Fake Theo blew away like a wisp on the wind. Odette twirled and shouted, Oh, my mates! 
Odette jumped and flung herself onto Theo. He staggered a few steps backward as he caught her, and Odette leaned forward to give Theo the sweetest kiss I'd ever seen. He clutched her tightly and kissed her back, boosting her up higher so he could continue to profess his love. In the balcony, the crowd was going wild. Me, along with the rest of my friends, cheered and clapped like we were at a freaking game and our team had scored the winning goal. The alley corn court did not applaud, and yet they wore thin smiles. The box on the court's podium clicked open. Odette and Theo didn't notice, not at first. They continued to kiss until they needed to come up for air. Then both of their heads swiveled to the side, to take in the sight of the open box as if they just realized it was there. Odette slid down Theo's body. She walked to the box and opened the top. Lying on a velvet pillow was a small war axe that would fit perfectly in Odette's hand. In the hilt of the axe was a circular pink diamond, the alicorn stone. Odette squealed and yanked the axe out of the box. She turned it toward us and waved the axe in the air. Hey guys, we got it! All of us laughed. I went running down the staircase, and I flung my arms around Theo. Guys, that was amazing, I cheered. Amazing? That was, like, totally insane! Odette gushed as she went into a flurry of sentences. That fiend was, like, so scary, and then Theo was like, Wah! and then I was like, ah! and then I ate that apple, and then we did that thing, and then, oh my gods, can you believe that Theo and I are actually made it? Never would have guessed, I said with a laugh. Theo put his arm around Odette. I'd fight a thousand fiends if I could have you. Well, you only had to fight one, Odette squeaked. This is going to be such an amazing story to tell our cute babies. Theo blushed, and Stefan elbowed him. She's already talking about babies, man. She wants your horn, if you get what I'm saying. You're ruining it, Theo growled, and Stefan shrugged. Lady Iris approached us from the staircase, and the rest of the alicorn court behind her. She upturned her palms as she said, Well done, both of you. You have succeeded in passing the trial, and have obtained the alicorn stone by proving your faith. Hey, that was too easy, Stefan objected. I had to die to get mine. Delmer rolled her eyes. I rushed to say, Thank you for all your help. Do you know where the other stones might be? Lady Iris frowned. I'm afraid the court is unsure of the location of the other three stones. If we knew, we would help you find them. You've done enough, thank you. Ethan said, as he bowed slightly to Lady Iris. If there's anything we can do for the court, let us know, and we will do our best to repay the favor. It is our duty to help the world, Weaver, Lady Iris replied. The Alicorn Court has no need for allies, but rest assured we will continue to do everything we can to help you save the world of the Fae, from Droga and from King Elijah. Thank the gods she was on the circle. She was one of the few sane people left on Malovia's governing council. Perhaps she could help keep Eli in line. We'll reach out to you if we need anything else. Thank you again. It is our honor, World Weaver. Lady Iris weaved her hands. A pink portal blossomed in front of us, spinning like a flower with petals spanning outward. This should take you back to Arcania University. Keep the Alicorn Stone safe. You will need it. I didn't ask what Lady Iris or the rest of the court had seen in their visions. It was probably stuff that would scare us off our quest, and to be honest, that shit was terrifying enough. We'd leave the future-seeking to Odette. Lady Iris smiled as she inclined her head to Odette. The Alicorn Court will be here in your deepest need, for you are our sister, Draika. When the time comes, look to the pool. Odette tilted her head then like Lady Iris said something peculiar she would remember. Theo grasped Odette's hand, and our group stepped through the portal as one. We emerged in the woods outside the university, the spires of the school standing tall as the snow fell like clouds from the sky. The alicorn stone glistened from its place in Odette's hand, and I felt a fresh bout of confidence. Half down, half to go. Chapter 21 Ethan. Exam weeks passed in a blur, and before I knew it, the Yuletide celebration was upon us. Now that I was no longer possessed, 
Time had sped up to an incredible level. All of us were in high spirits after gaining the Alicorn Stone and had decided to take a well-earned break between now and the new year before starting our search for the Griffin Stone. Dolinska was absolutely radiant the day of the winter solstice. Christmas trees decorated with silver and gold ornaments lined the cobblestone streets as snowflakes trickled through the air. Garlands of pine and berries hung from every building and lights twinkled above window panes. The smell of gingerbread wafted through the air and people were lining up in front of a large pile of wood to pick out their yearly Yule log. Today was the day of the winter hunt, Malovia's main winter holiday. As legend foretold it, Droga chased away the sun during the autumnal equinox, and today would be the first Tomir would bring it back. A light show had been set up in the middle of the town square. Emma and I walked through it arm in arm, appreciating the scene. There were lights designed in the shape of Father Christmas and his reindeer, as well as other Christmas symbols like stars and gifts. We passed a nativity scene that was beside a hot chocolate cart. A woven behind the cart levitated cups to waiting children who sipped at the brew with glee. An altar had been set up by the road to the cathedral. It was adorned with pine cones, chestnuts, and bows of holly, gifts to help Tomir chase back the sun. Candles were everywhere. They lined the streets, providing a warm glow under the twinkling of the night sky as the sun set over the city. Emma observed it all with a rosy blush in her cheeks, pleasantness radiating from her eyes as colors danced across her skin. Her smile grew wider as we passed a group of carolers. You haven't stopped smiling all day, I told her kindly. Her mittened hand became tighter on my arm. Christmas is one of my favorite holidays, Emma said. It brings so much joy to people. Plus, I'm kind of a winter fanatic. Me too. I had to yell over the sound of a few snowmobiles that passed. There was a race going on later today. We'd just gotten back from the public skate. Every year, the city froze over one of the squares and turned it into an ice rink. Neither one of us wanted to get off until it became too crowded for us to even hold hands. If there was one thing that truly bonded Emma and I, it was our love of the ice. We dropped our skates off at the university before rushing back into town. Though we'd been in Dolinska all day, we hadn't even seen half of the winter hunt activities. There was the sound of shouts as red and green ribbons were hung from the stage in the square. Workers were getting the stage ready for the choosing ceremony, which would be held later on tonight. Delmer and Stefan were both participating, as well as Odette and Theo. Near the stage was a huge Christmas tree, decorated with hundreds of ornaments and lights. Emma laid her head on my shoulder. I wish we could have gotten to experience this last year, but, you know, I did. The winter hunt had been cancelled because of the king's contest. If I could go back in time, I wasn't sure if I would ask Emma to compete again. Since I'd let my cares over the monarchy go, I felt so free. The weight on my shoulders was gone, replaced with nothing more than focus for my mate and our quest to find the crystals. Nothing else mattered. I have a surprise for you. I told her, a bit of an early Christmas present. Really? Her eyes brightened. Yes, climb on. I changed into a woven, and Emma settled on my back as we bounded through the snow. We left the streets of Dolinska until we were back on the university campus. I took a turn, and we ended before the same groundskeeper cabin we'd enjoyed a year ago. Emma slid off my back, and I changed. I stepped inside the cabin and lit the log in the fireplace. The firelight illuminated the room, and Emma's expression became bewildered as she witnessed the various twinkling lights lining the ceiling. The cabin had been decorated for the winter hunt, with stockings hanging on the mantel and a Christmas tree in the corner adorned with blue, gold, and silver ornaments. The cabin smelled like cinnamon, and the reindeer bedspread looked warm and inviting. Holly and garlands hung from the rafters, with a cranberry wreath on the door. Across the bed and all over the floor were rose petals, a bucket of champagne sitting on the table with two empty glasses. We removed our coats. I popped and poured the champagne before toasting to Emma. Your good health, Ona Vilke. 
Emma smirked before she swallowed her glass. Gonna need the whole bottle, then. We refilled our glasses, then sat on the rug in front of the warm fire. Emma dragged a knitted blanket off the couch and adjusted it over our legs as I reached behind us. Underneath the Christmas tree was a small blue present. I grabbed it, then turned to place the gift on her lap. For you, my little wolf. If I had known we were doing this, I would have brought your present, Emma said as she began to unwrap it. Nonsense. It's my treat to spoil you. Emma's jaw dropped as she opened the box. She reached down to dangle a necklace off her fingers. The silver chain was composed of large square diamonds. A circular sapphire pendant, an inch in size, dangled from the chain. Her hand sagged as she held the elaborate strand as it was heavy. Ethan, this is gorgeous, she whispered. Where did you find such a thing? This is going to shock you, but it's actually an unseely necklace. What? Emma held the necklace away from her like it was cursed. It's not like the dark necklace you used in the tournament, I explained. Arthur helped me to make this one. It's from the royal treasury, a woven heirloom. It's tradition for a prince to give his mate something from the Malovian Imperial Jewel Collection during their first Christmas together. I asked Arthur to infuse the sapphire with a little unseely power so you can fill it with your own magic and pull from it when needed. That's incredible. It's beautiful, Ethan. She turned to the sapphire to observe its glitter in the firelight. I'm not sure where I'll wear it, except at formal events. It's far too grand to parade around school, unless you want me to make the other girls jealous. We actually get into a lot of trouble at parties and balls, I pointed out. I've no doubt it will come in use at some point. Emma nodded. Fair. This is such an elaborate gift, Ethan. The diamonds in the necklace alone must be worth millions. Don't go saying you refuse to accept. I won't allow it. Emma rolled her eyes and placed the necklace back in its case. Of course not. I know better. Thank you. You put a lot of thought into it. I'll wear it the first chance I get. I wanted something you could use, and something that would draw attention to your pretty face. It'll certainly make an entrance, she said, as she glanced at it again. She'd never had something so expensive or precious in her entire life, save for perhaps the sapphire in her sword. But that was the woven stone. That didn't really belong to her. The necklace I'd picked out was hers, and only hers. She was worth the grand sum I paid for it a hundred times over. I gave a look upward. Oh, look, mistletoe. Emma's smile was sly as she noticed the mistletoe hanging directly above our heads. You did that on purpose. So what if I did? Emma and Ethan have a passionate experience in the cabin together, drawing out the moment. My heart warmed with a bit of hope. I knew we were just having fun and all, but I wanted to be more to her. I knew Emma loved me, and this relationship was secure. But there was still a lot of trust to be regained after everything we went through. Our bond was there, but as of yet, it wasn't near as strong or as deep as it could be. But we were working on it. Time was the only thing that could heal all our wounds. I was certain we would get there eventually, but still, any distance from Emma, no matter how minimal, was heartbreaking. It was all I could do to continue to bear it. She still needed her space. I would give her as much as she desired until she decided she was ready for us to be more. Just then, Emma's phone rang. She slowly rose from the bed to answer it. I felt a note of satisfaction as I watched her waddle the first few steps. Emma put the phone to her ear, and someone began speaking immediately. Odette? Odette, what's going on? I could hear Odette's panicky voice from across the room, and my gut hollowed. I hurried to put on my clothes and my prosthetic as Emma frowned and said, We'll be there as soon as we can. Just hold on. Emma hung up the phone and scampered to put on her clothes. Something's wrong. Odette wants us to get to the city square as fast as we can. Is anyone in danger? I got off the bed, already fearing the worst. She didn't explain, but she's very upset. We have to move. Emma's hands fumbled as she tried to put on the necklace I bought her. I grabbed it and fastened it for her. It hung securely around her neck as she quickly tucked it underneath her winter coat. When the necklace was on her, my anxiety ebbed, but only slightly. 
This was supposed to be a day of rejoicing, yet from what I'd heard over the phone, it might have changed into a night of peril. My biggest concern wasn't if Emma would need to use the magic I'd provided for her in the woven necklace. It was if there would be enough magic in that sapphire to stop whatever else we had to face. Chapter 22 Emma My heart was filled with so much fear as I rode Ethan back to the city square. By Odette's tearful, worried voice, I expected half of Dolinska to be on fire by the time we got there. I waited to hear the screams, see the blood, but I was met with neither. All I heard was Christmas music, and all I saw was smiling faces all around, families and friends waiting for their loved ones to declare their fated mate to the world at the choosing ceremony. What was going on? Something wasn't right. I spotted Odette's curly mass of blonde curls near the fountains. Theo was there, rubbing her back as she trembled close to tears. They had their formal choosing outfits on, Theo in a white suit and Odette in a big pink dress with a fluffy white coat, but neither of them appeared ready to go on stage. Kiara and Alexi stood nearby, both of them anxiously still. I jumped off Ethan's back and he transformed to join me as I rushed to Odette's side. She didn't sag in relief until she met my gaze. Odette, are you okay? What are you two doing? You're supposed to be in line for your choosing, Ethan said in confusion. I just had a vision. Odette grabbed my hands and squeezed. Oh, Emma, it's simply awful. She looked into the water barrel over there and began seeing things, Theo said, casting his head to the side. What she foresaw isn't good. Something really bad is going to happen here tonight, Odette squeaked. I don't know the specifics, but I saw so many bodies and fire and blood. Oh, it was just terrible. So many are going to die. We have to get out of here. My heart thudded in fear. If the city's in danger, we have to protect it from whatever's coming. Odette's curls bounced as she shook her head. No, Emma, you don't understand. This feeling I have is bad. If we stay and fight, it could turn out all wrong. We tried to find down there and Stefan, but they're at the front of the line, Theo explained. We'll have to wait for them so they can be warned. There isn't much time, Odette insisted. Once Delmer and Stefan get down from that stage, we need to leave straight away. Are you sure? Odette, you said Ethan wasn't with us when we found the Alicorn Stone. It was in your vision, and yet that didn't happen, I said. Visions can change. We saved Ethan, so the future changed as well. The future isn't set in stone, Odette insisted. But so far, everything else I've come to see has come true. I don't think there's any changing this. It's too late. I looked to Kiara. She was the sensible one. But Kiara didn't rush to replace Odette's worries with logic. If Odette says she had a vision, let's not take chances, Kiara said. We get the rest of our friends and we leave. Best thing that can happen, Odette and Theo miss their choosing and they have to do it next year. But if it's the worst case scenario... She didn't need to finish that sentence. I nodded and said, right, we'll leave once Delmer and Stefan are done. A horn sounded, and we turned toward the stage to see the same high priestess that had declared Ethan and I's bond last year. The old sorceress bellowed over the crowd, giving opening remarks and welcomes to cheerful applause. Looking around, it seemed so strange that such a happy occasion could turn deadly so quickly. Yet I wasn't fooled. I knew things could jump from good to bad in an instant, and I trusted Odette. My eyes scanned the crowd for rioters, the King's Guards, anything that might be a tip-off to the upcoming chaos. I saw nothing. The first few couples came on stage and were bonded. I held Ethan's hand, trying to keep my composure. I needed all my friends to be safe. I wouldn't leave this square unless all eight of us left together. Finally, Delmer and Stefan walked on stage and stood underneath the arch. It had only been ten minutes into the choosing ceremony, but it felt like an eternity. Both of them were dressed nicely, Stefan in a black suit and Delmer in a beautiful black lace gown, her hair draping down her back in long curls. 
They knelt beneath the arch and held hands as the high priestess said, Do you, Stefan Slasky, join yourself to this sorceress in mind, body, and spirit? Proclaim her to be your mate? Vow to one day be married with her in sacred union, defending her at all costs? I proclaim that Irina Delmare is my mate, for now and forever, until my watch on the hunt is over and until the end of time, Stefan said. His words were proud and full of love as he stared at Delmare, and she returned his gaze as if he were the only dragon for her. To which god do you align? the high priestess asked. I pledge myself to Radek, the red stag of war, Stefan proclaimed. There were a few polite claps, and the high priestess turned to Delmare. Do you, Irina Delmare, vow to join yourself to the shifter in mind, body, and spirit? Proclaim him to be your mate? Vow to one day be married with him in sacred union, loving him despite whatever the cost? I proclaim that Stefan Slasky is my mate, for now and forever, until my watch on the hunt is over, and until the end of time. Delmare's voice was certain and sure. There was absolutely no doubt, and I could see Stefan's hand squeeze hers gratefully. And to which god do you align? I pledge myself to Neva the specter doe of shadow and the goddess of time, Delmare said. Applause burst from the audience as Delmare and Stefan kissed and rose to their feet. The nausea in my gut settled. I was delighted they were formally bonded now and happy for them, but the nervousness I felt from Odette's words overshadowed the real joy I should have felt at their choosing. As they walked down the stage stairs leading to the square, Odette frantically waved them over. Delmare and Stefan cut through the crowd, clearly confused. Why weren't you guys up there with us? Stefan asked Theo. You backing out? Odette took a frantic breath. No, it's not that. We need to... The sound of the trumpets burst again, but it was a different medley. The tune of the king. I grasped for Ethan as I saw Elijah and Gabby stroll on stage in all their finery. They were flanked by a battalion of guards. Eli sent a nasty look at the couple currently being bonded, and they hurried off stage. The high priestess stepped forward, confusion shining on her face. My king, what is the meaning of this? she asked. We have traitors in our very midst, Elijah boomed. Five alicorns have been found guilty of ferrying information to the Black Claw, betraying us to the cult that wishes to end our country so dearly. Shock and terror burst out among the audience. Elijah waved his hand. My heart plummeted as five alicorns were dragged on stage, all in chains. The terror within me mounted as I realized that Lady Iris was at the line's head. Her hair was askew, and her robe was bloody. Her face had been beaten so badly it was barely recognizable. I searched the other faces and realized... Elijah had arrested the entire Alicorn court. I wanted to run, but as Elijah had captivated the audience's attention, guards had swarmed in out of nowhere. They surrounded the square, boxing us in and providing no way of escape. Lady Iris spoke with a quivering voice. My lord, I assure you, we've done no such... Silence, Elijah barked. I will not tolerate betrayal in my kingdom. Tonight... All shall see the penalty for treason. A guillotine was brought on stage. Yeah, that's right. An actual fucking guillotine, like the one they used to behead Marie Antoinette back in the revolutionary days of France. Some members of the Alicorn Court began to sob. Tightness grew in my chest as panic swelled, and all I could focus on was the greedy glittering of Gabby's eyes, like she was excited to watch this. They didn't betray the country. The Alicorn Court refused to give Eli the location of the Alicorn Stone, Kiara whispered in horror. He's slaughtering them for it. The awful feeling that this was our fault sank in. The Alicorn Court had chosen to help us, not Eli. Now they were paying the price with their lives. They deserve a fair trial, Ethan cried out. Elijah's eyes flashed, and he searched the crowd for who had said such a thing but couldn't place the collar. I will have order amongst the Fae, Elijah cried out. There is no fair trial for traitors and spies. Guards, ready the guillotine. Lady Iris stared at the guillotine as if it was her worst nightmare. 
I grabbed Ethan's arm. They helped us. We have to do something. If we try anything, we'll be slaughtered, Theo said anxiously as he glanced around. There were too many guards for us to fight off alone. I knew Theo was right, that we were outnumbered. But how could we just stand here and watch? Lord Radcliffe came on stage. A bit of relief flooded through me. He was Lady Iris's mate. He'd stand up to Eli and stop this. Lady Iris must have been thinking the same thing. Tears flooded her face as she said, Thank the gods. Please tell them I've done nothing. Lord Radcliffe's face was dispassionate. Then, in a cruel voice, he said, I give no mercy to traitors. Lord Radcliffe changed into an alicorn. He put his head down as he charged forward, hoofs pounding against the wooden stage. Lady Iris didn't even have time to scream before the alicorn embedded its horn into her chest, spearing straight through her heart. Iris's head slumped to the side, and her body went limp. She collapsed on stage, dead, as Radcliffe pulled away his horn and the crowd roared with bloodlust. Radcliffe stood tall as his wife's blood dripped down the point of his horn. My hand went over my mouth. Lord Radcliffe's loyalty to Elijah went so far, he was even willing to kill his own mate. The sickening reality that Lady Iris was dead swept upon me, and there was nothing we could do about it. A guard grabbed the prisoner behind Lady Iris, stepping over her body as he shoved the prisoner to his knees in front of the guillotine. The alicorn was weeping as the guard forced his neck over the chopping block. At this point, some people were trying to escape, mostly families with children. But the guards blocked their way with their swords, preventing the crowd from abandoning the square. No one is allowed to leave, Elijah boomed. All must see the consequences of betraying their king. Ethan clung me to his side and tried to block my eyesight so I didn't see what happened, but he wasn't quick enough. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the blade come down, and my ears rang with the swish of the guillotine. There was a harsh thump, and I saw the man's head come loose from his shoulders and land in a basket below the guillotine, eyes still wide open with shock. His neck spurted blood all over the stage, and his corpse slumped to the side. The guards moved his body out of the way as the next prisoner was dragged to the guillotine. She screamed and screamed, her throat emitting bloody murder until she was finally silenced by the blade as well. I didn't see the other death. Ethan had forced me into the front of his coat. His hand was on the back of my head, his other arm keeping a firm grip around my middle so I couldn't move. But I'd seen the first, and I heard all the sounds. I could imagine every death one by one as lives were brought to a cruel end by the guillotine. Ethan's body sagged in disbelief, and I was able to sneak another glance. Eli began tossing the heads of the court into the crowd. Some people screamed, though a couple of college boys ran forward laughing, kicking the heads back and forth to each other like balls, spewing blood all over the streets. A few shifters put the heads on spears and paraded them around, like they were trophies to show off in the spoils of war. Lady Iris's body was nailed to the backboard of the stage. People laughed and threw things at her corpse, and nobody went to stop them. The Fae were cruel, wicked beings that desired blood. Tonight made me realize why the other supernatural races were so afraid of us. We slaughtered our own without mercy, then toyed with their bodies as if they were our playthings. It nearly made me sick to share their blood, to be a fairy myself. Is it over? Odette whispered, face buried in Theo's jacket. The other shifters had done the same thing Ethan had, and were refusing to let the other girls watch, save for Alexi. He was on his hands and knees, sobbing as he felt the after-effects of every person that had died in the square. Kiara was kneeling beside him, rubbing his back and throwing desperate glances at the stage. It should be over soon. They're all dead, Ethan said, voice haunted. Eli's had his entertainment. He'll begin calming the crowd. I hoped such a thing would happen, but it was at this point that Gabby strode forward. The crowd fell silent, and the torment of the dead stopped. Gabby spoke so infrequently, 
It was practically a treat to be addressed by her. Everyone was wondering what she would say. Gabby folded her hands in front of her. I need everyone to listen. The Black Claw plans to attack the city here tonight. Gasps and cries of fear echoed through the square. Gabby lifted her hands. We must not panic. Gabby lifted her voice, and the crowd began to calm. From what we discovered during our interrogation of the executed, the Black Claw has broken our protective wards down around the city. The cult plans to send monsters into Dolinska. I need everyone to return to their homes as quickly as possible before... As if on cue, and it was, a shrieking roar shattered the night. Everyone turned in unison to see a terrifying monster stalk into the square. It was huge, as big as a dragon, with scaly gray skin and long limbs that walked on all fours. It had the wings and head of a crow, but a muscular, humanoid body, with claws that could tear a fey in half. The monster screeched. It reached down and grabbed a fey within its claws, tearing it to pieces before it approached the stage. Body parts rained down, and there were pleas of terror. More roars echoed around the square. Approaching from the south was a giant, a humanoid monster with green, moss-like skin who was as tall as most of the buildings, twisted antlers rising out of its head and eyes glowing red. It carried a massive club, which its giant hands dragged behind him. From the west, a raptor-like being prowled. It had the body of a dinosaur and the head of a cat, dozens of eyes on the front of its head like a spider. Drool dripped from its many teeth as it prepared to pounce on the masses. From the east came a sickening creature, a one-eyed cyclops with ravenous fangs. I thought of the easiest escape, to fly, but that was deemed hopeless too, because from the air came a horrible cry. A beastly bird, one as big as a dragon, hovered above the square. There were claws at the end of its wings and a big, scaly head that could swallow a griffin in one gulp. In every direction they came, and there was nowhere to go. Flee for your lives! The king and I will hold them off! Gabby cried. She and Elijah, along with their guards, turned toward the crow-like being. Gabby began firing battle orbs at it, while Elijah changed into a wolven and started biting the ankles of the beast. With a few battle orbs to the head, the monster went down after hardly putting up a fight. What a fucking joke. I wasn't fooled by this ridiculous charade. Gabby was controlling those monsters by the use of the power Droga had bestowed upon her. But the rest of it wasn't a charade. The other monsters moved in, and they began slaughtering the masses. I became revolted as I watched the giant, the raptor, and the cyclops tear through the crowd, killing anyone in their path. Men, women, and children. We were boxed in on all sides from four various monsters. The majority of Dolinska was in this square. Run for it, Ethan cried. He changed into a wolf and threw me onto his back. The other shifters followed suit, and we dashed through the crowd. Stefan was the biggest so he barreled his way through, although other dragons of equal size lashed out in their own attempts to get out of the way. We forced our way out of the square and began hurtling back to the university. As we ran through the crowded, panicked streets, I looked down and saw that Ethan's white paws were covered in blood from stepping through all the pools of gore the monsters were creating. Bodies started piling up. I saw the lifeless corpse of a girl who'd been torn apart, barely six, and I cried out in sorrow. Some fay harnessed their wings and took to the skies, but the large bird above began swallowing people whole. Shifters did what they could to fight back, sorceresses too. But everywhere we looked, there was another creature. A centipede a hundred feet long swallowed people whole. A monster with the head of a woman, body of a lion, and wings like an eagle ripped Faye apart before feeding on their corpses like an animal of the jungle. Everywhere I looked, it was absolute madness. Monsters were flooding into the city, and they were all at Gabby's command. She wanted to cause chaos, unite the city against a common foe, so they looked to her and Elijah as their saviors once more. 
It worked at the masquerade, and now they were doing it again, but on a much grander scale. Students were running into the university. We burst past the campus grounds, where the teachers were stationed all around the castle. They were taking wide stances, hands burning with magic to stop the monsters if they made it to the university. A few monsters approached the gates of the school, but once they touched Lady Magdalena's wards, they hissed and stepped backwards. They couldn't get past the boundary. Lord Lucian stood at the gates, shepherding students in. His face sagged in relief as he saw me pass, and he squeezed my shoulder as if to tell me it was going to be all right. We were safely behind the university gates, where Lady Magdalena's magic would protect us. Gabby didn't dare cross her. But the rest of the patrons of Dolinska weren't so lucky. Even from within the halls of the school, we could hear the terrible screams as people died. The eight of us gathered in the courtyard with the pool, quivering as students ran past us to hide in their dorms. We have to stop this, Kiara insisted. If we don't, more people will die. What are we going to do? If we go back out there, we might be killed with everyone else, Delmere shouted. Odette said we needed to get to a safe place, Theo said, glancing at her. Yes, but can we really stay here and do nothing when we know what's going on out there? I asked. Odette had been quiet ever since we entered the courtyard. She ignored our bickering and knelt by the side of the pool. She stared into the water, as if trying to force herself to have a vision. I wasn't sure if it would work. She'd said before that she couldn't command visions to come to her. But the gods must have wanted to give Odette a message, because a blank look overcame her eyes, and her gaze flickered back and forth for a couple moments as she stared at the water's surface. She blinked before she rose to her feet. Team Phantom, she said. We can save lives tonight. But can we keep our own? Stefan asked. I'm not sure. The vision wasn't clear, Odette said. But we have the opportunity. It's our choice if we take it. If we don't fight, many more lives will be lost. The people need a beacon of hope. They're looking for a hero. We need to give them one. The desperate cries of children being slaughtered outside the university gates welled in our ears. We all looked to Ethan for an answer. He was the original phantom. This was his call. Everyone mask up, he said. If we can save one life, it's worth the risk. It was terrifying to consider returning to that hell, but I knew in my heart that I had to call upon courage. The White Rose was braver than I. She would lead me into battle without thinking twice, because the people of Malovia were depending on us, and she wouldn't hesitate to kill if she had to. Once I left these grounds, I had to leave Emma behind and become the vigilante once more. It was the only way I'd survive out there. Chapter 23 Ethan My mind had gone clear. I didn't feel fear or anguish as I slipped on the phantom mask and donned my vigilante cloak. The only thing coursing through me was the urge to protect my city at all costs. I hadn't become the phantom since I'd banished the demon that lived inside of me. Instead of the pulsing hatred that usually rushed through my veins, there was a cool urge to bring peace and order. I had resisted becoming the vigilante until now, but my fears were put to rest. I could still be the phantom and not turn into the villain. I no longer lost to myself. There was a divide now between the phantom and I that drew a clear line from who he was and where Prince Ethan began. Each of my companions flanked me, wearing their corresponding masks and cloaks. The white rose ran by my side, and in her eyes I saw no dread. She was ready for this, and so was I. We slipped out the rear of the university campus to avoid the teachers, then ran through the woods to get back into Dolinska. Once our feet hit the cobblestone, I immediately became aware that this was a bloodbath. Entrails and dismembered heads lay throughout the streets, evidence of the carnage. Too many, I saw, were little ones. There were more children dead than there were adults. The bodies of shifters, still in their animal forms, lay fallen beside their sorceresses, who were staring out into the blackness of night. 
The yuletide decorations had been destroyed or torn down, lying in broken bits of glass and tattered ribbons amongst the dead. The nearest monster was the Cyclops. It rampaged everywhere, kicking carriages and squashing Fay underfoot. The Cyclops reached down and picked up sorceresses, chucking them into the ground. They barely had time to scream before they were silenced. It seemed like everyone had ceased trying to kill the monster and was running the other way. Why aren't people fighting back? They've all been trained to kill monsters at Arcania University, Stefan said. No one is going to fight back when their kids are in danger. They're going to try and get them to safety, Emma shouted. A twisted feeling in my gut knew she was right. These monsters were specifically being ordered to target children so their parents wouldn't stand and fight. The rest of the people who'd tried to fight back were already dead, without the help of the soldiers who Gabby and Elijah had undoubtedly ordered to stand down, the city had been overrun. We work together to take them down one at a time, I told my team. Let's move. We darted forward, running toward the Cyclops instead of in the other direction. Heads turned as people recognized my mask. The Phantom, a woman cried as we rushed past. There were sounds of relief. We're saved. The Phantom and the White Rose will stop this, someone shouted noticing Emma at my side. There were a few confused faces. People knew the White Rose and the Phantom were supposedly enemies and didn't understand why we were working together. But they didn't stick around to find out. My friends and I circled the monster, blocking it off from following the retreating crowd. The Cyclops's eye landed on me. It growled and swiped out a giant hand to smash me into the earth. I rolled to avoid it, and its knuckles grazed my cloak. The rest of my team began firing at the Cyclops with everything they had. Orbs of battle magic hit the Cyclops, but they bounced off its tough skin and fell to the ground with a sizzling sound. The Cyclops didn't appreciate being shot at. It squinted its eye. From within burst a ball of flame, and it shot the magic out of its eye at top speed. Emma jumped aside, and the fireball hit a nearby carriage instead. It sent the carriage flying as the fireball exploded on impact, embers scattering everywhere. From that point on, all we could do was get out of the way. The Cyclops shot fireballs out of its eye, exploding the area where we stood as soon as we left it. Its magic left craters in the earth, bricks turned to rubble at the Cyclops' power. Odette and Theo worked together to expand a shield over us, and we ran to their sides to take cover. They held the shield up as the Cyclops' fireballs bounced off of it, but with every hit, they winced. We can't hold this forever, Theo cried out. The shield above him was starting to show cracks, and sweat beaded Odette's brow. We can't take it down. Its skin is like iron. It's impenetrable to fey magic, Delmare cried back. It has to have some weakness, Alexi argued. Kiara shouted, The eye! I bet if we hit it, the monster will go down. We didn't have any other ideas. Another fireball hit the shield, and the magic broke. We scattered in all directions. We sent battle magic orbs whizzing at the Cyclops' eye, but it moved quickly, and each shot missed. The Cyclops was a large creature, but its eye was so small it was difficult to hit. Keep it still, I bellowed. Magic tendrils burst out of my fingers, and I forced the illusion ropes to wrap around the Cyclops' legs. The others got the same idea, and used their own magic ropes to secure the Cyclops to the spot. The Cyclops groaned, attempting to rip away, but our magic held. All of us gritted our teeth and held on, trying to keep the Cyclops contained. Emma was the only one who wasn't trying to secure the monster. She'd brought her dagger out of her cloak and was charging it with her magic. As I looked at her, I saw a faint blue glow underneath the white cloak, and knew she was pulling magic from the woven necklace I had gifted her. As the dagger shone with a blue, glowing sheen, Emma pulled her arm back and took aim. She sent her dagger flying into the Cyclops' eye. When the dagger plunged into the eyeball of the Cyclops, it let out a screech, and all of Emma's magic went rushing outward at once. It caused the Cyclops' head to cave in, and the magic burst out the back of its head, putting a giant hole in its skull. We unleashed our magic ropes, and the Cyclops went down. The earth shook as it fell, 
emitting a stinking smell from its destroyed brain. The surrounding crowd cheered as the first monster died. Applause rang out, though it was scattered amongst the chaos still going on in the streets. I turned back to the crowd. Everyone return to your homes, I shouted. My team and I will handle this. Stick together. The more of you there are, the less of a target you become. The crowd rushed to follow my orders. We left the body of the Cyclops behind, searching for the next monster, though it didn't take us but a minute to find. The giant was swinging its massive club through buildings. The force of the giant's blow toppled over apartment complexes and shops, and the giant beat them to rubble with no more than a swing of his club. Around the giant lay the smashed remains of any shifter or sorceress that had tried to kill it. Fay darted out of the way as the buildings crashed downward, though not everyone was so lucky not to be crushed. If Fay weren't killed by the club as the giant swung it back, they were buried beneath the toppling of the surrounding buildings. I flung out a hand. Stay back, I ordered my team. If we get anywhere near that giant, it'll use its club to smash us to bits. We need to fight it from afar. The giant must have heard me, because it paused from smashing the buildings to turn our way. A sneer crept across its wrinkled, wizened face, and its grip tightened on the club. Shit. This one wasn't as dumb as the Cyclops. The giant put its head down. Pointing its twisted antlers at us, it began to charge. The ground rumbled, and most of us ran out of the way, though Theo and Odette attempted to put up a shield. Get out of the way, I shouted, but my words came too late. The shield took most of the blow, but the giant's antlers shattered it, and the blast that came as it broke the shield sent Theo and Odette flying backward. They slammed into a nearby cart and struggled to get back up. The giant drew its club back and began smashing the earth. Theo grabbed Odette and pulled her out of the way just before she could be crushed by the club. Stefan and Delmare began firing battle orbs at it from the back. Take this, you ugly old bastard, Delmare cried. She welled a red battle orb in her hand that was bigger than she was and fired it at the giant. It sank into his back and sizzled, creating a large burn but not killing it. The giant roared out in pain. It abandoned Theo and Odette and began chasing after Delmare and Stefan. Its club smashed against the ground and even pinned Delmare's cloak once. She cried out, clutching at her throat before the giant raised his club again. Stefan yanked her aside and the giant nearly missed smacking them both before they ran in the other direction. Emma used her illusion magic to spread a large sheet of ice across the street, and the woven necklace flared blue again. The giant slipped and fell forward, giving Delmare and Stefan a chance to scamper away. I'm gonna rip the throat out of this thing. This would be a hell of a lot easier if I was a hundred times bigger, Stefan cried out as he and his mate hid behind a pile of rubble. Don't change, I roared. None of us could become shifters. It would risk giving our identities away, and that would have major repercussions. Eli and Gabby might know who we were, but the Arcania Alliance did not, and with my criminal record of vigilantism, we couldn't afford to be caught, even if we were helping to save lives tonight. Our identities being revealed would prevent us from aiding Dolinska in the future, though with monsters like this roaming the streets, we might not have a choice if we were going to save our own skins. I sent a throwing knife whizzing at the giant's head. It pinged off one of its antlers, and it let out a vicious groan. It swung its head at me, and one of the massive antlers caught my form. I narrowly missed getting impaled on one of the points. The giant flung its head back, and I was sent spinning through the air, the world a blur around me. I was very certain I'd crash upon the stone and break my neck, but instead I landed on a large, soft pillow. Emma had conjured it just in time, and it broke my fall. I staggered upward, still dizzy, and the pillow vanished behind me. Emma was at my side in an instant, though the giant had focused its sight on the griffins. Kiara and Alexei's eyes swept everywhere, looking for a way out. Use its antlers against it, Emma cried. It's out of control. They got the idea. Alexei stepped forward in front of the giant and flung his hands out. Though I couldn't see the magic, I knew it had to be working, because the giant's expression became infuriated. Alexei used his emotion magic to drive the giant into a blind rage. 
The giant reared his head back and gave a terrible sound before it put its antlers down and charged once again. Kiara and Alexei planted themselves in front of the biggest building they could. They didn't get out of the way until the very last second. The giant smashed through the building, creating a huge hole and an unstable foundation. The giant bellowed in a panic as the building toppled around him, burying him within the rubble. The giant squirmed amongst the concrete and bricks, and the rubble began to shift. We'd pinned it, but not for long. Quickly, Kiara conjured a glowing yellow sword with her illusion magic. The sword was nearly as big as she was. She could barely lift it. She handed it to Alexei, who swung the sword above his head with two hands. He emitted a yell, and in one fell swoop, he cut straight through the giant's neck. The giant's head rolled away, and its flailing legs went still. Alexei took a few deep breaths, calming himself down. We regrouped at the giant's feet, each of us gasping for air. There was a shrill shrieking that signaled the raptor was nearby. This was madness. It was as if once we killed one monster, another took its place, and we barely had time to recover from the last fight before we surged into another. Emma leaned over her knees. Through our bond, I sensed her exhaustion, despite pulling from the woven necklace. Emma was already getting tired. She was ill. She wouldn't last as long as the rest of us. We must press on, I said. I slapped Theo on the back, who was coughing from all the dust. We don't have a moment to rest. Bud, we've only taken down two monsters in this city, and Gabby's probably unleashed dozens, Stefan said. We only have so much strength to spare. We keep fighting until we can no longer do so, I said. That's our only option. Emma glanced at me, like she wasn't sure, but it wasn't like we had copious amounts of time to discuss. The screeching of the raptor grew louder, and it spurred us onward. Following its sounds led us back to the city square. The choosing stage had been completely destroyed, and the Christmas tree in the square had been set ablaze, burning like a beacon against the night. The wooden toy dragon of a little boy lay by the smoldering tree, broken in two. It was accompanied by the shoe of an infant, dotted with blood. So much carnage. And for what? For my cousin to trick the city into thinking he was their only hope for survival? If I despised him before, I truly considered him an abomination now for doing this to his own people. There were more bodies here than in the rest of the city. The husk of the crow creature lay abandoned. Gabby and Eli were nowhere to be seen. They'd certainly retreated to the palace to watch, or were keeping up appearances by pretending to slay monsters elsewhere. We wound through the corpses scattered on the streets, keenly aware it was too quiet. The raptor's cries had gone mute, and the silence that permeated the area screamed death. Emma held her cloak over her nose and mouth to avoid breathing in the smoke or the smell of the torn bodies. The corpse of Lady Iris still hung on one of the few pieces of the stage that had remained standing, hovering over the square like this was her judgment upon us all. Do you think most of the people have gotten to safety? Emma whispered. I don't know, I mused, but I didn't finish my sentence, for Kiara screamed. I whipped around. She was pinned under the raptor's claws, who jumped on her from behind. It hissed and went to dive its teeth down toward her throat, but Alexei rammed his shoulder into the raptor's. The raptor fell off, but not without lashing its claws out at Alexei and slicing through his mask to cut his cheek. Blood spurted, and Alexei staggered backward. Theo projected a shield as the raptor went to attack again, and it was sent tumbling. The raptor spun upward and hissed as the eight of us surrounded it. The raptor wasn't very big, only a bit larger than me in my wolf form. We had it cornered. This one would be easy. As we moved in, the raptor let out a horrible screech that hurt our eardrums. All of us covered our ears, and we fell to our knees at the raptor's cry. I had to close my eyes and duck my head in an attempt to get away from the awful sound. What kind of creature was this? Its yell was nearly as bad as a siren's scream. When the raptor saw we were down, it attacked. It darted forward with its claws extended toward Stefan. Delmare pushed him down, but not before the raptor sank the tips of its claws into Stefan's front. Stefan groaned and fell to the side, blood spilling all over his cloak. 
Delmare shot a battle orb at it and missed. What the raptor didn't have in size, it made up for in speed. The raptor jumped from this point to that, and our magic skittered by uselessly. The raptor didn't stay on one target for long. He cut a gash into Odette's arm before it lunged out at Alexei and sliced into his leg. They weren't deep cuts, but if the monster provided enough of them, we'd all bleed to death, which I'm sure was its strategy. When I was sure the raptor was one place, he was already another, and slicing into another one of my friends with vengeance. I changed course. Once the monster turned on Emma, I unleashed my throwing knives before the raptor could get to her. Three of them hit the raptor in the side. It gave a wild cry, and that put it off the attack. It backed up, lashing its tail and shaking its head. Its dozens of eyes glittered at me with hunger, the knives still embedded in its sides. The monster began screaming again, louder this time, and focusing his voice directly on me. The sound was so loud and grating, it was enough to create pain. I was sure my ears would bleed. A great pain developed in my temple, a migraine unlike any I'd felt before. I fell to the ground again as the monster advanced, making his voice louder and louder, until it felt like my brain was going to explode inside my head. Odette and Theo moved in unison. Their shields combined into one, forming a bubble that they enclosed around the creature. The shield kept the screech within, and the monster's head lolled back. Its voice died down, but by this time, it was too late. The aftershock of the noise bounced back against the shield and echoed into a tremendous clamor the raptor could not survive. Its head exploded, and eyeballs went pinging against the inside of the shield as the raptor killed itself with the sound of its own screams. Theo and Odette let the shield drop. The tangy smell of fresh blood mixed with the spilled gore. Save for Emma and I, everyone had been cut open by one of the raptor's claws. The shifters would heal quickly, but the girls were losing blood. The other shifters tore their cloaks and made makeshift bandages, wrapping them around the girls' wounds. Even so, Delmare, Kiara, and Odette's faces remained pale. And still, the roar of our enemies hadn't grown any duller. How many more are there? Delmare asked. She winced as she pressed a hand to her side, where the raptor had delivered a painful strike. As if in response to her question, several more cries rang out amongst the shadows. Sounds like a lot, Theo commented dully. He held Odette against him, who appeared slightly nauseous. We have to get a better vantage point. If we can see how many monsters there still are, we'll know how many we have to fight, I said. The rooftops, Emma suggested. It's the best way to see what's going on out there. We left the square and searched for the tallest building that was still standing. Once we found it, a large apartment complex, we scaled the fire escape until we came to the very top, which overlooked most of Dolinska. My heart plummeted as I walked across the rooftop, observing the city streets. Less than a quarter of a mile off, hundreds of fae were still trapped. Monsters had cornered them and were slowly picking them off one by one. There were reptilian behemoths, giant spiders, three-headed beings, trollish creatures with large feet that made the ground shake with thunder. No matter where my eyes landed, there was another monster more terrifying and vile than the first, and they were picking off Fay like flies. In the distance, I could see the lights of the soldiers as they surrounded the palace, giving the illusion they were protecting the royals when really they were allowing the city to burn. There are too many to fight, Alexei said in despair. We'll never eliminate them all before we die ourselves. My mind worked, trying to find a way out, to come up with a plan. Anything. Gabby and Elijah would level Delinska to the ground if they had to, to convince the survivors that building up our army was our only shot at defeating the Black Claw so this never happened again. But what could me and my companions do against such endless butchery? It was Emma who spoke. We have to get Gabby to pull them back. Her voice was rough. How? Theo choked. We have the video, Emma said. We blast it on every television screen in Malovia. Anyone inside of their homes watching what's taking place in the city is going to see her performing dark magic. Gabby will have to handle the scandal before it gets out of hand. She can't control the monsters and do that at the same time. She'll force them to leave the city. That video is our only card we have to play against Gabby, 
Kiara protested weakly. We'll have to use it. We don't have a choice. If we don't publicize that video, there will be thousands of deaths, even more than we've already lost. Emma's tone was so full of conviction it convinced me she was right. I asked, How are you going to broadcast the video? Posting it on social media would expose and otherwise implicate all of us. We don't have access to the news station. Vera does. She works for the annual Arcania, Emma said. If we can get the video to her, she'll make sure it goes live. I nodded briskly. Then it's our only shot. Find Vera, Emma. Girls, go with her. The boys and I are going to do what we can to hold off the rest of these beasts. I grabbed Emma and kissed her. I was sure our friends were having similar farewells around us, but at the moment, I didn't care or notice. The world had disappeared, and it was only my mate and I. I resolved that this goodbye kiss wouldn't be our last. It couldn't be. Be careful, please. You need to come back alive, she whispered as she pulled away. I'd fight through the realms of the underworld itself to get back to you. I will not leave your side merely to die. I grasped her tightly and held her. You must stay safe. I cannot rest until you are back in my arms. I have to do what's best for Malovia, and so do you, Emma said firmly. This is what's best. Don't back out on me now. She kissed me again before she wrenched herself away and began to run back down the fire escape. The other girls followed her, leaving Theo, Stefan, Alexei, and I to handle the rest of the monsters alone. We have to buy the girls time and save who we can, I instructed. There's no other option. At that moment, the apartment building we stood on wavered. A massive, slimy reptile that walked on two legs stalked by the apartment building. Its long tail swept behind it, smashing store windows and crushing carriages. The monster passed by the complex, flicking out its tongue as it tasted the air for more prey. Stefan smirked as the reptile skulked by. I've never been one to walk away from a good brawl. These monsters should be scared of me. Theo let out a skeptical noise. Oh, get a hold of yourself. He was the first to jump, propelling himself off the rooftop to sail downward to below. The rest of us followed, running at top speed and jumping off the ledge. We fell two stories, cloaks billowing out behind us as we landed on the back of the reptile. We grabbed onto the spikes protruding from its back and unleashed daggers, plunging them into the creature's spine. We held on for dear life as the monster flailed about, its bellows shattering the air. Though wariness showed on the men's faces, they did not hesitate to strike. I hope Emma hurried. Though we were brave and noble, we were not infallible. At some point, our strength would wear out. Hopefully, Gabby would pull her monsters back before any of us succumbed to exhaustion and death. That is, if our plan worked. I prayed the gods would have mercy on us, though I wasn't sure if they would. So many innocents had lost their lives. It wouldn't be crass to assume we were next. Chapter 24 Emma I was hopeful Vara would be at the university and prayed to the gods she wasn't anywhere among these city streets. We'd never find her in this mess. The girls and I ran back the way we came, passing by the bodies of the monsters we just destroyed. I wished the way to remain clear so we could get back to campus that much faster. The rest of the monsters had barricaded citizens on the other side of Dolinska, so we didn't run into any trouble along the way. Until I heard a wild scream that made my heart twist. That's my brother! I shouted. I turned down a different alleyway without another explanation. The girls followed. My breath caught as I saw Arthur at the end, cornered by a sphinx-like creature I'd seen earlier. The woman's head grinned as she spread her eagle wings wide and crouched her lion's body to jump. The monster leapt into the air, and Arthur changed into a wolven at the last second. He was waiting for her, and the two fell into a snarling heap. Arthur used his teeth to gnaw at the lion's body, but all of his bites missed her neck. The monster drew her claws across Arthur's chest, and he gave a high-pitched howl. Rage welled within me at my brother's cries, and I called upon the woven necklace. An unseely battle orb welled in my palm, and I fired. The orb struck the monster in the side and flung her off Arthur. 
Steam rose from the creature's body as it lay immobile, killed by my magic. Arthur! I ran to him. He changed back and gasped as blood poured out of his chest and onto his jacket. He'd been hurt badly. Are you okay? I asked. Arthur's eyes narrowed in confusion as I pushed his shirt aside to examine the cuts. They were healing, but he was still bleeding. Yes. Who are you? Arthur asked. I'd forgotten I was still wearing my mask, and as part of my disguise, the illusion was still apparent, changing the color of my hair and eyes. I yanked the mask off. As I did, the illusion ended, and Arthur's expression became clear. Sis? Well, you're the White Rose. Ethan's the Phantom, I take it. Not hard to figure out, is it? I pulled Arthur to his feet. He glanced at the other girls. None of them had taken their masks off, but I'm certain he could determine who they were. I leaned against a wall and tried to breathe. All this fighting, after a long day spent at the festival, was wearing me out. Good thing Ethan had given me that necklace earlier, otherwise I'd be on my ass right now. I see you've been using the necklace I enchanted, Arthur said. That was a good unseelie spell. Yep, I pulled aside my cloak to show him the woven necklace, and he grinned. Odette's eyes popped out of her head. Holy mother of alicorns, that is a rock. One of the many benefits of mating a prince, he's filthy rich, I said. I refastened the cloak and put on my mask, and the illusion settled once more. Arthur, what are you doing out here alone? It's not safe, Delmer asked. Arthur's face twisted. I've been looking for Vara. We were at the choosing ceremony. We got separated in the panic when everything went insane. I won't go back to school without her. We're looking for Vara, too. We need her help. So she was out here. We didn't even know if she was still alive. This was looking more and more desperate. What's going on? Arthur raised an eyebrow, and I rushed to explain about the video, as well as why we needed Vara. Arthur frowned by the end, and he said, I know she can get that video out, but we have to find her first. If you text her the video, could she broadcast it from there? Delmer asked. She doesn't have her phone. Arthur took a cell phone out of his pocket and waved it in the air. This one was hers. She asked me to hold on to it tonight, because her jacket didn't have any pockets. Otherwise, I would have contacted her by now. Do you have any idea where she might go? Kiara questioned. If she couldn't make it to the school, she'd head out at the news station, Arthur said. They let her in, but it's on the other side of town. I've been trying to work my way over there, but it's hard on my own. It's her only shot. Can you take us there? I asked. Arthur nodded. If we fight together, we should be able to force our way through. Lead the way. We followed my brother out of the alleyway. I hoped Vara was still alive. We needed her to make sure this video got out. I kept my magic at the ready, expecting another monster to leap out at any second and tear us all to shreds. As we got closer and closer to the other side of the city, that became an even bigger possibility. The crowds increased. The screams grew louder, and more blood was poured over the stones. People pushed us aside as they darted by, scattering in all directions. Arthur and the rest of us stuck to the outskirts, trying to remain unnoticed by the monsters themselves. I knew we had a job to do, but my eyes kept wandering over to the battles. I watched as monsters tore Fay apart and feasted on their bloods with zealous fervor. I heard the scream of a tiny girl. I wanted to go and fight, but as I moved past the sound of the girl's cries for help, Kiara grabbed my arm. No, we're on a mission. We have to get that video out. It's the only way to stop this. My throat tightened, but I was the White Rose right now, not Emma, so I forced myself to turn my attention away. There's the news station. Arthur gestured toward a square building in the middle of town. It was surrounded by rubble and looked deserted. The five of us ran for it. We found the doors locked. Arthur began hammering on it, crying out, Let us in! For the love of the gods, let us in! Someone unbolted it from the other side. I nearly collapsed in relief when I saw Vara. Arthur basically did. He flung himself upon his mate and kissed her, and she wrapped her arms around him in a loving embrace. Two mates reunited. It made me lonely for Ethan. What was he doing out there? Was he still okay? I thought... I... Arthur could hardly get the words out. 
I don't have a scratch on me. I'm safe, Vera said as she touched his face. She waved her hand and said, Come inside. We rushed into the news station as Vara locked the door behind us. Papers lay scattered across desks, and cameras were set up in the front of the room near a broadcast studio. It looked like a madhouse in here. Coffee cups were overturned, and computers were still on from people working on stories in the middle of the night. I'd never thought the White Rose would walk willingly into a news station, yet here she was. Most of the reporters are out filming the chaos, Vara explained. I came back here to hide seconds ago. I think I'm the only person left in the building. Vara turned toward us. You don't have to conceal who you are, Emma. You're safe with me. You must need my help, or you wouldn't have come here. I slowly pulled off my mask. How did you know it was me? Vara smiled slightly. I've been following the White Rose story since it started. Once I got to know you personally, the White Rose's true identity became obvious. I do need your help, I confessed. Can you get a video out to all of Dolinska right now at this very moment? Vara raised an eyebrow. It depends on what it is. I would have to override the live footage that's streaming in and... Can you do it? She paused. Yes. I reached backwards for Kiara's phone. She gave it to me, the video on screen. I pressed play. Vara and Arthur watched. Although Arthur grew pale, Vara hardly seemed surprised. She looked up when the video was over and said, I could lose my job for this if I'm caught. Can't you make it so no one knows? I asked. Maybe. Vara chewed her lip. Won't Gabby retaliate? Arthur asked nervously. He was concerned Vara would lose her head for being the whistleblower. I can log into the Arcania Alliance's main data frame and make it so no one can trace back who did the upload, Vara said. What about the security cameras? Delmare asked. They're down by a stroke of luck. They were getting fixed this afternoon before all hell broke loose. I felt a little better. Vara was putting her neck on the line, literally, to help us. I owed her big time. Vara attached Kiara's phone to one of the computers using a USB cord then downloaded the video. She typed quickly, pulling up so many screens that I couldn't understand what she was doing. Finally, she hovered the mouse over a big red button, took a breath, and pressed it. It's out, Vara said. That video is playing on every television screen in Malovia as we speak, in every Fey household. In seconds, it'll be online. Gabby won't be able to stop it. Arthur turned on one of the televisions nearby, which was showing the live footage of monsters destroying the city. Within moments, it switched over to the video. I watched as Gabby's wicked spell played on screen, knowing it was out there for the world to see. I felt a note of victory, satisfied that for the first time, we had her. I just hoped we hadn't made a critical mistake. We have to get back to Arcania University fast, Vara said. We don't want to be here when my boss shows back up. Arthur went for the door. Vara wiped the computer's mouse and keyboard of fingerprints before she followed us out. We ran. I barely remembered to fit the mask back over my face when we crossed into the city streets. For a few minutes, everything was as before. Nothing changed, and I feared my plan hadn't worked and we'd lost that video for nothing. Then I heard something. The marching of armies, the cry of guards. I heard soldiers shout and monsters bellow in protest. There was a clashing of swords, of spears, of shields. Innocent bystanders gave noises of relief. Only then did I relax myself. Our plan had worked. Gabby was ordering the monsters back into the forest and sending out her army to pretend like her warriors were beating them back. We had saved lives. We had saved Dolinska. We'd... My thoughts were severed as I came across two bodies, lying barren in the streets. I recognized their innocent faces, knew the lines of age and the smooth skin of a young child, cheeks still red like blood had been coursing through her veins only minutes ago. I let out a cry and fell to my knees beside them, unable to believe my eyes. It was the same old woman and little girl we'd helped a few months prior. Their clothes were nicer, and they appeared well-fed but they hadn't heeded our advice to get out of Malovia. Most likely, they'd used the money we'd given them to buy a house here. I knew it was difficult to leave your country, your home, the only thing you'd ever known. I'd done it myself once. Why hadn't they listened? 
I remember the screaming of the young child I'd heard just before we entered the news station, and I knew it had to be this child. I turned my back on her and left her to die. I could have saved her, could have done something, and yet I was in such a hurry to get that video out I hadn't even considered. I fell forward, and my forehead hit the cobblestone as I wept at their feet. Their blood stained my face, and yet I didn't care. This was what I deserved. It was all my fault, able to die, and to try and save lives, and that decision had cost two innocents their own. I would never be able to bear the choices I made. In the Fey world, there were always consequences, even when you tried to do the right thing. Emma, we have to go. Arthur wouldn't let me lie there. He put his arms around my middle and dragged me to my feet, pulling me away from the source of my sorrow. I couldn't walk, so Arthur carried me. My toes skimmed along the ground until he changed into a woven and forced me onto his back. Everything went numb and I couldn't see straight. The city blurred as colors melded together, creating the faces of the old woman and child in my head, the girl's screams for help bleeding into my ears. I'd sacrificed their lives to save others, and yet it didn't feel noble. It made me feel just as evil as Gabby. I slid off Arthur's back when we came to the university gates, and he changed. The campus was deserted. All the other students were inside their dorms, and the teachers had retreated back into the palace, probably to restore order. The only person that still stood outside looking for people was Lord Lucian. I've removed my mask in front of him. I didn't care. I didn't care that he'd seen me in my white rose costume, or that he knew who I was. At this point, I was just so happy to see him. The illusion fell away, but as my hair and eye color changed back to normal, Lucian bore no indication of surprise. If anything, he looked pissed. What were you all doing out there? Lucian barked at Arthur and I, before his eyes flashed to the rest of the group. Emma, I just saw you and your friends come through a few hours ago. What possessed you to sneak out and return to those dire streets? An involuntary sob rose from my throat. I flung myself onto Lucian and held him tightly. He balked for a second before his arms folded around me. He returned the embrace, clutching me as if I was precious for a few brief moments. Lucian finally pulled away and squeezed my shoulders. You cannot possibly imagine how worried I was. I'm sorry, I wept. I just wanted to help. It's done now. It's over. Lucian wiped a few of my tears away before he took in the sight of Delmare, Odette, and Kiara, still in their vigilante costumes. Give me those masks and those cloaks, Lucian said gruffly to us girls. I'll get rid of them. You can't be seen wearing those around campus. We had our day clothes on underneath, so we did as Lucian asked. I felt no regret as I handed Lucian my white rose mask. I just wanted to be rid of it. He gathered the cloaks and masks into a ball in his arms and said, Into the castle, quickly. Go to the dormitories and do not come out. Nobody argued. We remained silent as we trekked into the castle. I gave Arthur a tight hug before he slipped into Vara's room to be with her. There were no words we could say that would suffice. We were twins, and through that secret bond, I knew both of us were simply glad the other had made it through tonight. The girls followed me into my dorm. Tigris zoomed toward me. The little fey tiger rubbed against my cheek and purred. I'm okay, I told him, and I patted him lightly. Delmer turned on the TV. We all sat on my four-poster bed and watched the news, which flickered back and forth from footage of the war-torn streets to images of Gabby's spell. The video had whipped the newscasters into a frenzy, and it was difficult to hear them argue either for or against her defense. Some broadcasters thought the video was a fake. Others thought it could be true. It didn't matter to me. The video had served one purpose, and it had done the job. After a while, we turned the news off. I just couldn't stand looking at all the carnage or listening to the newscasters arguing about what Gabby's video meant. The silence and waiting was worse than the actual fighting. We sat there uselessly as minutes ticked by, hoping for word from the boys. Odette eventually broke. I want Theo, she sobbed. She put her hand to Kiara's chest and cried, 
while Kiara rubbed her back. I know, but they're coming back, Kiara insisted. Though her tone was sure, her eyes still shone with worry for Alexei. Delmer's phone went off. All of us jumped, she checked it, and her shoulders slumped in relief. I just got a text from Stefan, Delmer said. He and the rest of the guys are safe. All the monsters are gone, but a lot of people are hurt. They're going to stay out all night, make sure they can help who they can. He said they'll get rid of the costumes before the sun rises, so they don't get caught. I nearly cried with happiness at the mention that Ethan was alive. It was accompanied by the disappointment that he was still out there, walking through Dolinska's grisly streets. It would only be for a few hours. Vigilantes needed the night to stay hidden, but I wished Ethan would come home sooner. Yet I had to make that sacrifice. Ethan was a hero. It was his job to save people. We should go to bed, Delmer suggested. It's been a long day. That was putting it lightly. It'd been traumatizing. But staying up until sunrise wouldn't help any of us feel better, or the night pass quicker. I wanted to slip into oblivion for these next few hours, so I could hurry to be at Ethan's side again. Us four girls spread out across my four-poster bed and slipped into sleep. Tigris nestled into my hair and snoozed, but try as I may, I just couldn't shut my eyes. The faces of the young girl and the old woman looked back at me every time I tried. I thought of the citizens of Dolinska. For all my efforts tonight, it felt like I had failed them. I woke up after everyone else did the next morning. The sun was shining, and the other girls were dressed in clean clothes. I sat up, feeling sore and half-sick. You need to get ready, Kiara said as she pressed a fresh pair of jeans and a shirt into my hands. Everyone in the city is being asked to appear before the royal palace. It's mandatory. Probably due to the video. Gabby was giving some explanation, I bet. Is Ethan around? I asked. I was hoping he was in the hall, waiting for me. The guys are already there, Delmere said. We should go to them. It was only the thought of seeing my mate that pushed me on. I got dressed in the bathroom. I threw up twice. Delmere put a water bottle into my hands the moment I came out and made me drink it. I took short sips, hands shaking as we made our way to the royal palace. Delinska was still in shambles, but at least the bodies had been removed, including those of the monsters. A light coating of snow covered the rubble, and disguised the blood that still stained the cobblestone. When we came to the square that was before the royal palace, I froze. There were so many people here. Too many. My sight searched the crowd for my beloved's face, but I didn't see him anywhere. I didn't want to be here, packed in again amongst thousands. It felt far too much like last night. I was terrified something awful might happen again. My body shook, wanting to cut and run, but Odette threaded her fingers through mine and held tight. I stayed put. There was the sound of trumpets, those terrible trumpets, and Gabby appeared on the balcony of the royal palace, flanked by the circle. They were clearly still supporting her. She wore a ball gown of red, the royal crown atop her head as she approached a microphone stand. She hardly seemed bothered by last night's scandal. The crowd began to boo, but it wasn't everyone, not even half. Gabby raised a gloved hand, and the crowd fell silent. People of Melovia, Gabby spoke. Last night was a terrible tragedy. King Elijah and I, as well as our armies, did what we could to save the city, but we could not save all. The bodies have been counted, and we have found three thousand fey have died at the hands of the Black Claw's efforts. Two thousand of them children. Therefore, the king and I have deemed to call such a catastrophe the slaughter of the innocents. Such a great cry of grief welled up amongst the crowd that I'd never forget it. Two thousand children gone, just like that. And for what were they sacrificed? But this didn't seem enough to placate the crowd. Tell us about the video, a man cried, and the crowd roared in agreement. We deserve an explanation, another woman shouted. Gabby stepped aside, and Steward Solomon walked forward. 
We have examined the video of our queen supposedly performing unseelie magic and have found it to be a fraud, Solomon began. After careful inquiry, the circle is certain that this video was carefully released the same night of the slaughter of innocents in order to provide even more chaos. Therefore, we must regard it as nothing more than a cruel trick. Just like that? Kiara yelped, but I'd expected as much. I knew Gabby and the circle would deny it was real. The timing of our release had been at the worst possible moment, but what could we do? The crowd murmured, and as far as I could tell, most bought her argument. It was hard to convict the queen of unseelie magic when, by all appearances, she'd once again been the savior of the people last night by chasing the monsters out of the city with her army. Steward Solomon backed away, and Gabby spoke again. She came forward with more explanations. Her voice was like static. I didn't comprehend her words, but I knew they were all lies to manipulate the people. Didn't matter. It was over now. Hey, I heard Stefan say. Delmere sighed as he took her against him, and he said, Glad to see you all safe. There were similar notes of relief from the other girls. My body tensed, expecting to feel my mate's broad arms around me, but my body was barren. I circled in place, seeing Theo, Alexei, Stefan, but not my mate. Ethan wasn't here. Where's Ethan? I asked. My tone was high and on edge. Stefan's brow wrinkled. What do you mean? He left early last night to be with you. We haven't seen Ethan all day, Delmere said. We thought he was back at the university, Stefan said voice beginning to show panic. All at once, every face among my friends went pale. I began to hyperventilate. Ethan! I cried out, wanting him to be here, needing him at my side. A couple of people glared at me, but I ignored them. Alexei reached out. He pinned me against his body, and I tried to fight back. His emotion magic attempted to calm me, but I didn't allow it. I couldn't feel an inch of peace when I was this hysterical. The voice of Stuart Solomon broke through my insanity as Alexei refused to let me go. We have determined, Stuart Solomon continued, that the video was the work of none other than the city's menace, the Phantom. I realized Odette's first vision had been true, but not in the way we were expecting. We'd interpreted her prophecy wrong. We had the alicorn stone in our grasp, but Ethan wasn't with us. Odette's foresight had been a warning from the gods that we'd lose my mate after we acquired the Alicorn Stone, and now that horrible future was coming true. Ethan wasn't here. There was only one place he could be. I clawed at Alexei's arms, and my eyes went upward to the balcony. Chapter 25 Ethan I cringed as the dungeon door opened. My hands were chained behind my back, and every bit of me ached. The darkness swelled so there was no bit of light, save for the burning torch on the wall. The two soldiers around me moved forward again, but Elijah's voice rang out. Stop! That's enough. The soldiers retreated, and I curled into a ball. My body hurt. I was bleeding from multiple places. The noxite cuffs on my wrists did not allow me to shift, nor allow me to fight back. The soldiers had been beating me since I was caught, kicking and punching at every opportune whim. They had left my face unmarred. They wanted to be sure I was recognizable. Elijah's shoes appeared before my face. Had enough? I spat on his boots. Elijah stepped back. I'm quite sure he sneered. You're relentlessly stubborn. What means do I have to resort to? You'll have to kill me. Elijah let out an annoyed sound. Must you be so dramatic, dear cousin? I didn't answer. My clothes were sticky with my own blood. Elijah prowled around the room. You have a choice. Give me the crystals. Otherwise, your life is forfeit. This is petty behavior, something I'd expect from you, I growled. Elijah snapped his fingers, 
and the guards began another assault. It was getting to the point I was numb now. Every punch and kick bounced off my bruised body with no effect. My cousin would have to do better than that. The soldiers retreated, and Elijah's look was cold. I'm tired of this, Stephen. Do you think I want to do this to you? We're family. You care not for me. You only care for yourself. Give me the crystals. No. Elijah's eyebrow twitched. You leave me no choice. You want a stage for your theatrics? Fine. I'll give you the grandest stage of all. He took a prisoner's hood and fitted over my head before he summoned the guards to pick me up. They each took an arm, and my toes dragged behind me on the floor. I was carried upward, through many flights of stairs, and out of the belly of the castle. As we ascended to the top level, I commented, You're getting a real kick out of this, aren't you? Elijah's voice was cruel. We warned you what would happen if your mate revealed that video. You've dug your grave. Now you can lie in it. I heard the roar of the crowd, and the doors to the great balcony opened. I felt the winter wind bluster against me, stinging my cuts as I was dragged before the people. Steward Solomon's words rang in my ears. We have determined that the video was the work of none other than the city's menace, the Phantom. The guards forced me to stand. Elijah's voice boomed outward for all to hear. People of Malovia, I promise you that our nation shall receive justice, for we have found the perpetrator of these horrid crimes. Elijah yanked the hood off my face. I flinched at the sunlight that shone harshly into my eyes, and the people gasped. It was a tumultuous, wrenching sound that stuttered my heart and made my gut cave in. I saw the expressions of shock, the self-righteous anger, the uncanny fear, and knew I had played my own part in this. The game was over. I had finally, unequivocally, met my end. Elijah's voice was triumphant as he proclaimed, Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the true identity of the Phantom, my own dear cousin, Prince Ethan Noick of the Arcania. The trial begins in the Griffin Knight Hidden Legends University of Sorcery, Book 4, The End. This has been The Alicorn Court, written by Megan Linsky, narrated by Max Pinkins and Liana Walsh. Copyright 2020 by Megan Linsky. Audio copyright 2021 by Megan Linsky.